Chapter 25 Master Quintrell, we've caught a spy. Vigus Quintrell glanced up as a guard came to the doorway of the study at Torsford. Carenza and Gurren, who were conferring with Quintrell, turned to see the newcomer. Where did you find this spy? Quintrell asked. Prowling the edge of the camp. Do you want us to interrogate him or just kill him? With a sigh, Quintrell stood. He set his drink aside and cast a lingering glance toward the fire before turning toward the guard. Bring him to me. I'll decide. A few moments later, two guards returned, dragging their unconscious prisoner. A tall young man with muddy brown hair slumped between the guards, bound at the wrists and ankles. From the blood on his shirt and the dirt on his trousers, Carenza guessed that he did not go down easily. One of the guards reached down to grab the prisoner's hair and pull back his head so Quintrell could see him. An unexpected resemblance made Quintrell hesitate. Carenza caught her breath, trying to muffle a gasp of recognition. Esben, he said, calling to a second in command. Does he remind you of anyone? Esben studied the prisoner's features. If I didn't know better, I'd guess he might be related to Blaine McFadden. Quintrell turned to Carenza. You knew the McFaddens well. Do you recognize him? Carenza fought down panic, hoping she could keep her voice even. I don't know, Vigus. It's been so long. People change, and he's young. I can't say for certain. Quintrell's look told her that he was sure she was holding back. Let's play this a little differently, shall we? Quintrell mused aloud. Take him up to the guest rooms, one with bars on the windows. I'll have a servant bring up wash water and a fresh change of clothing. Cut him loose, but keep a guard on the door. When he comes around, tell him to clean up and get dressed. He'll be my guest at dinner tonight. He turned and leveled a gaze at both Carenza and Gurren. And so will you. A puzzled look passed between the guards, but they did as they were told. The prisoner hung limply in their grasp, but Carenza could not tell whether the young man was play-acting or was still unconscious. The door closed behind the guards, and Quintrell turned to Carenza and Gurren. I want your help interrogating the prisoner, he said offhandedly. He may be no one of importance, in which case, executing him won't matter to anyone. But he might be valuable to us, either for what he knows or who he is. And I'm going to find that out. We can help, Gurren said smoothly. Carenza nodded, avoiding meeting Quintrell's gaze directly. But perhaps we should go back to the workroom with the information we were discussing before the interruption. Let us get cleaned up before dinner. Quintrell gave a curt nod. Go on, I'll send someone for you. Carenza realized she was holding her breath when they reached the hallway, but she said nothing, trying to force herself to remain calm as she and Gurren made their way back to the workroom. I'm not feeling well, she said, knowing Gurren could see her distress. I need to lie down before dinner. I'll convey Vigus's instructions to the majors and stop by with some tea, he replied, with a knowing look that let her know he recognized her distress. Carenza made her way through the hallways with her head down, not wanting to attract attention. She let herself into her room and collapsed against the door. Tears started, and a sob welled up in her throat. Oh, Carr she murmured. What have you gotten yourself into? Several candle marks later, Quintrell waited in the parlor along with Carenza and Curran. A private dinner had been set for four on a small table. Guards waited in the shadows. Quintrell wore one of his scholar's robes, embroidered with runes and inlaid with velvet and silk to show his rank. 
Carenza and Gurin had worn clean but unpretentious work robes. Two guards escorted the prisoner to the parlour. He looked to be in his late teens, but hard work and battle had put muscles on his long limbs. Carenza wondered if Quintrell could even question his decided resemblance to Ian McFadden. Won't you join us for dinner? Quintrell invited, gesturing to the table. Rostovan's steward had set out a meal of venison, roasted beets and turnips, bread pudding with dried fruit, and a carafe of brandy. It was a rare feast these days, and hunger was clear in the prisoner's eyes. Warily, Carr made his way to the table. His gaze flickered to the guards, who stood silently in the darkened corners of the room, and he did not miss the click of the lock as his escort locked the door behind them. Then he saw Carenza, and he froze, though she kept her face impassive. Don't say anything, she thought. It will be worse for both of us if you do. Sit, please. Quintrell seated himself and gestured for the others to do the same. With a flourish, Quintrell placed a napkin on his lap. A steward appeared to fill their plates from the serving platters. The steward poured them each a goblet of brandy before retreating from sight. I don't believe you came to pay a social call, Quintrell said. His voice was cordial, but there was threat beneath the civility. The manner is quite nice, Carr replied with a half-smile that said he knew they were playing a game. But I don't believe you're the original owner. You're correct. This was better suited to our needs, Quintrell replied. He cut a piece of meat and ate it. Please, eat. If I intend to poison you, I wouldn't have wasted good venison on it. Perhaps Carr figured that he was unlikely to leave alive, no matter which scenario played out, or maybe he was just hungry. He made short work of the food on his plate and allowed the steward to fill it a second time, though he merely sipped his brandy. Does he figure this for a last meal? Carenza wondered. If so... He's quite cool about it. I want to know who you are, Quintrell said. Carr sipped his drink. No one important. Quintrell's smile was taut. Let me be the judge of that. Quintrell barely moved his hand, but Carr froze in his seat, eyes panicked. Another moment, and Carr's hands went to his temples. Get out of my head, Carr managed, though his words ended in a gasp of pain. Carenza's hands gripped her chair, and she bit her lip until it bled. I can't challenge Vigus, not directly, and if he believes I favor Carr, I'll have no chance to help Carr. Or Blaine. Gods above, I hate this. Carr McFadden. Quintrell said, leaning back with a look of satisfaction. The divvy orb glowed brightly on its strap around Quintrell's neck. Carenza did not doubt that the divvy had enjoyed the pain Quintrell had caused. Carr shook his head, pale and angry. Did your brother send you? No. I came on my own, Carr replied. His voice was insolent. I could have warned you that showing up unexpected might lead to a less than friendly reception. Carr must not have gone down without a fight, Carenza thought. One eye was darkening to purple, looking swollen and sore. His lip was split, and his knuckles were scratched and red. From the stiff way he had walked to his chair, she guessed that he had taken a thorough pummeling, perhaps even some bruised or broken ribs. Still, he was handling the situation like a seasoned courtier, or an utter madman. Knowing his father, either was possible. Carenza, can you confirm what I've read from him? Is this really Carr McFadden? Carenza met Carr's eyes, wishing that her gift were telepathy, willing him not to speak out of turn. 
I told you, Ficus. It's been years. Maybe. I don't know. Quintrell's expression suggested that he was reserving judgment. Why did you come here? He asked Carr. I'm sure you know your brother and I aren't on friendly terms. Just curious, I guess, Carr replied evenly. Did it occur to you that our archers might have shot you on sight, or that the guards might have hanged you as a spy without asking questions? Quintrell pressed. For the first time, Carr met his level gaze. I have stared down the maw of grips and looked into the mouth of Raka when the great fire fell. Pardon my saying so, but not much scares me after that. What would Ian's madness coupled with Blaine's courage produce? Carenza wondered. Meeting Carr's gaze, she thought she might have the answer. There's not much left for you at Glenreath, is there? Quintrell said offhandedly. I mean, things started to fall apart when Blaine was exiled, and it's never really recovered. At least you had the title. I don't see that titles mean much since the Great Fire, Carr replied. What matters is whether or not you can hold on to what's yours and protect your own. And so far, Glenreath has done that, even against you. Quintrell allowed himself the ghost of a smile. I can offer you something better, he said. A commission with Lord Rostovan, for one thing. You've seen enough battle to be an officer. Carr took a sip of his brandy. Officers are just big targets with their armor and war horses. I like it on the ground, where I can run or hide. Quintrell chuckled. It takes a man who's seen real combat to understand that. He took another sip of his brandy. I don't really care why you came here, Quintrell said, but now that you're here, you've got a decision to make. You know things that could help me defeat Blaine and stop the fighting. Help me, and you'll have a place in the new order that I bring to Dondoroth. Carr met Quintrell's gaze. We make those same kinds of promises to the spies we catch back at camp, but no one's going to trust a turncoat, so I suspect you've just wasted an excellent venison dinner. Quintrell raised his glass in salute. Well said, and true enough. But there remains the matter of your life and freedom. You can offer what you know willingly, and extend your life in some comfort as my guest. He met Carr's gaze. Or we can use magic to take whatever you don't give freely. He paused. We even have a Talishte or two around who can read memories from your blood. Everything you know will be mine, one way or another. You decide how painful the process becomes. Betray my brother and his allies, and you'll put off my execution for a bit? Is that the offer? Carr's voice stopped short of baiting Quintrell, but it was clear that he harbored no illusions. What do you care? By all accounts, there's no love lost there. A shadow crossed Carr's face, there and gone before Carenza could quite decipher it. What's between Blaine and me is personal. Betraying him and my commander to the enemy is something else entirely, Carr replied. Your presence here betrays him, Quintrell said smoothly, finishing his glass of brandy. He threw away his lands, title, and betrothal to save your sister. Why wouldn't he throw down his sword for you? The divvy orb pulsed with a dim glow. Carenza wondered if Carr could see it. The light had grown stronger throughout the conversation, as if the spirit inside the orb was excitedly waiting for something. Carr looked away. If you have to ask, you don't know us very well. Trust me on this. Blaine won't die for me. Not now. There was a certainty and sadness in his voice that gave Carenza to know that Carr was not bluffing. I have some questions for you, 
Quintrell said to Carr, and there was a hint of steel in his voice. Answer them, and you can remain here indefinitely as an honored guest. You've got nothing waiting for you at Glenreath. Ally with us, and everything you lost will be regained. Carr met Quintrell's gaze. No. Quintrell made a motion with his hand, and Carr's chair pivoted away from the table. Carr moved to rise and found that he could not. He struggled against the invisible bonds that held him, and a satisfied smile touched Quintrell's lips. Now, about those questions, he said quietly. How many soldiers are sworn to Blaine McFadden? I never counted them. Quintrell's fingers twitched, the divvy orb flared, and Carr screamed as three ragged gashes ripped down through his shirt and the flesh of his chest, staining the torn cloth red with blood. Carenza started from her chair, but Gurren grabbed her wrist, silencing her with a warning glance. Quintrell's expression was far away, and Carenza guessed that he was rummaging through Carr's memories for the answer. Carr screamed again, hands struggling, as if he were trying to fight off the intrusion. Carr writhed, fighting the power that held him, but Quintrell's hold remained firm. Quintrell brightened. At least a division's worth. That's valuable. Carr slumped in his chair, glaring at Quintrell. Quintrell regarded him with curiosity. Let's see what you know about your allies. Quintrell motioned, and Carr went rigid with pain, pale and wide-eyed. Another set of bloody claw marks raked down his right arm. Carenza could tell Carr was trying not to scream, trying to avoid giving Quintrell the satisfaction. But in the end, Quintrell's will won out. This time, Carr screamed until he was hoarse, as the divvy orb flared brightly throbbing like a heartbeat. Carenza gripped both arms of her chair, feeling as if she might pass out. The guards in the room assured that neither she nor Gurund could physically overpower Quintrell. She knew her magic was no match for Quintrell's. Gurund might be strong enough, perhaps, but what then? She thought frantically. We can't cross Quintrell unless we're willing to kill him, and if we do, his loyalists will carry on without him. The more complex the information, the more digging it takes to rip it out of your mind, Quintrell said with the tone of a bored lecturer. Thank you for confirming that Tormad Solvik is a necromancer. That's helpful to know, although his tricks won't be as useful against Rostovan's troops. Useful also to know that Werner's forces have been essentially wiped out. Very useful. Carr's breath was ragged, his hands balled into fists. Blood streamed from the gashes the divvy had torn. Quintrell paused, as if he were listening to something the rest of them could not hear. Carenza wondered if the divvy was feeding him suggestions. Let's find out more about Macfadden himself. Quintrell stood in front of Carr, hands on hips. What effect has anchoring the magic had on Macfadden? Carr gave Quintrell a baleful look, his body tensed, and it looked to Carenza as if Carr was determined to fight Quintrell's intrusion. Quintrell's hand moved. The divvy light was blindingly bright, and this time it played across Carr's features as if it sensed his determination to balk. Three new bloody gashes slashed across Carr's face. A second swipe opened new slashes on his chest. Carr's whole body trembled with his struggle to block Quintrell, a fight he could not hope to win without magic. His screams echoed in the small room, and even Gurren blanched. Carenza wavered in her chair, dizzy from holding her breath, trembling with rage. Quintrell tilted his head as he received his answer, a surprised and pleased expression on his face. He's dying, Quintrell said, as a triumphant smile touched his lips. That's what you've been trying to hide. Anchoring the magic is killing him. 
strong magic nearby wounds him. He chuckled. It doesn't matter what his troop strength is. If magic is his bane, we can use that against him. Carr hung limply against the invisible bonds that held him. His hair covered his face, and Carenza could not tell whether he was conscious. Only his shuddering breaths reassured her that Carr still lived. Vigus, please, give him time to reconsider, Carenza said. You've made your point. He could still be a valuable ally, but he's worth nothing if you kill him. Quintrell gave Carenza an evaluating gaze, and for a moment she wondered if his divvy would rip into her mind, rest her secrets, and see how much she hated him. She hoped her expression was hopeful and guileless, but she doubted she was that good a liar. For your sake, Carenza, I will offer him mercy. Quinchell said finally, as the divvy orb dimmed. He strode over to where Carr slumped in his chair and pushed his head up. I'll give you two candle marks to think over my offer. Cooperate, and your stay here can be comfortable and long. Fight me, and I will rip every secret from your mind, and the Taliste will feast on your memories. Quintrell signaled the guards, who walked toward Carr. He made a gesture, and Carr's bonds vanished. He tumbled to the floor. Guard his door. No one gets in. No one. He repeated, looking directly at Carenza. The two guards grabbed Carr by the arms and dragged him out of the room. The door closed behind Carr, and Quintrell began to pace. What's the real reason Carr McFadden's here? Quintrell wondered aloud, frowning. Do you really think McFadden would risk his brother as a spy? From what he said, there's bad blood between them, Gurren noted. Carenza was grateful that Gurren responded. She did not think she could speak without her voice giving her away. Her throat ached from choking back tears, and her nails raised bloody half-moons in her palms. Interesting, Quintrell replied. Do you know why? Garin shook his head. No, but if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say that Macfadden left the rest of the family in the lurch when he killed his father and got sent off to the end of the world. I imagine the young man's prospects dimmed dramatically at that point, along with the family fortune. Quintrell looked to Carenza. You knew the whole Macfadden family. What do you make of it? Carenza had steadied herself enough to appear disinterested. Carr was a lot younger, always getting in the way, she said with a shrug. There were too many years between Blaine and Carr for them to be close. She paused. Things were hard on the family after Blaine's exile. Gurren's right. The scandal hurt Carr's prospects and banished the family from court. So why assume Carr McFadden is a spy? Gurren said. His brother mucks things up, destroys the family reputation, gets exiled as a murderer, and then comes back six years later and expects a hero's welcome and reclaims the title. Perhaps Carr was less than pleased to see him. Quintrell reached for his glass and took a long sip of brandy. I had been thinking along the same lines. He could be valuable. Certainly he has information about McFadden's plans and troops, Maybe about the magic as well. If we can gain his trust, stoke his anger, perhaps he'll tell us what he knows. Gurren shrugged. And if he won't, you'll get your answers the hard way. He paused. Do you think he's much use as a bargaining chip? Would Macfadden care that we have his brother, if it's true the two didn't like each other? Obviously, blood only counts for so much with Macfadden, since he was willing to kill his own father, Quintrell replied. If you mean, would Macfadden trade himself for his brother, I doubt it. Which brings us back to wondering about Carr's reasons. 
Gurren replied. Maybe he's figured out that there's no place for him in the new lord's plans. Corinson knew what Gurren was doing, and she appreciated it. By making Quintrell question Carr's motives, Gurren hoped to make Carr more valuable alive than dead, buying time. And by keeping Quintrell engaged in conversation, Gurren helped Carenza avoid answering any questions that might increase Carr's danger. Younger sons shouldn't be shocked by that. It's possible he began to count on keeping the title once Macfadden was exiled, Quintrell remarked, for all the good it would have done him. Quintrell knocked back the rest of his liquor. Wounded pride has cost many a king his crown, he observed. He looked to Carenza. What else can you tell me about Carr? Carenza shrugged. I really never paid him much attention at all, she lied. But he was always reckless. Then again, he was Ian's son. That's in the blood. Quintrell seemed to debate the matter for a moment in his mind, and then he let out a breath and gestured for them to move on. Any other news? he asked. Garin nodded and set his empty glass aside. One of our Taliste spies just got back from the north, said that Lysander went up against the Solviks and got pushed back. On the bright side, Werner is no longer a problem. Our majors, with Lysander, got in a direct hit. Macfadden and Thielsen showed up and turned the battle. Carenza repressed a smile at Gurren's skill. He was feeding Quintrell enough information to cover them, but framing it in a way that strengthened Blaine's position. Quintrell frowned. For a man who was supposed to be dead, Macfadden causes a lot of trouble. He leaned against the mantel and toyed with his empty glass. Our forces, combined with Lysander's, should outnumber Macfadden's army. We will need to ensure future attacks are more coordinated. If you want to be rid of Macfadden, why not just wear him down with magic? Gurren asked. He's the sole anchor. Strong magic drains him. Send enough of it against him, you could bleed him dry, so to speak, without needing to lay a hand on him. Quintrell swore under his breath. Too costly. Too uncertain. We would badly drain ourselves in the process, leaving us vulnerable should one of Macfadden's allies attack. He shook his head. Assassination is easier to arrange and much less expensive. When you're counting battle forces, have you figured in Voss's soldiers? Gurren asked, expertly pivoting the conversation now that he had gotten the information he wanted. At Valshoa, Treya Voss's army made quite a showing. Voss, Quintrell spat. He's a problem. Still, he's not a mage. Don't discount the Taliste helping Macfadden. You'll have to factor them into your plan, Gurren said. Penhallo, the Wraith Lord, the Knights of Estrain. Quintrell made a dismissive gesture. A ah, small number to worry about. I don't think we dare ignore them, Vigus, Gurren replied. They can do damage out of proportion to their numbers. Quintrell stroked the divi orb, and it seemed to purr under his attention. What he heard from the divi, Carenza did not know or want to know, but Quintrell seemed satisfied with the answers only he could hear. There are ways for the magic to remove that threat, he replied. I'm not worried about Taliste. What about Pollard? Fostering an alliance there could increase our troops as well, Gurren said. Our Taliste say Reese has been imprisoned by his own. Reese wanted to stop the magic from coming back. It's back. Pollard is tricky enough to change his plans when the winds shift. Carenza only half listened to their discussion, trying to figure out a pretense to get in to see Carr. Quintrell nodded. I've directed Rostovan to ally with both Lysander and Pollard. It suits our purposes. Pollard's always hated the Macfaddens. Quintrell added. Even if magic wasn't at stake, 
I suspect Pollard would be trying to expand his lands at their expense. He has reason to side against McFadden, Gurren pointed out. Pollard's troops took a beating at Valshoa. He went off to lick his wounds. Without Rees, he'll have no control over the Taliste. He's in need of allies. Vedran Pollard and Ian McFadden were cut from the same cloth, Carenza said. Don't turn your back on him. Quintrell chuckled. I won't need to worry about that, he replied, fingering the strap that held the divvy's orb. What new plans do you have for Lysander? Garin asked. Quintrell gave the matter some thought while he finished his drink. I have a few options in mind. Let's see what I can learn from McFadden's brother. There might be something that chooses our course for us. We'd best get back to our work, Garin said, especially with more fighting sure to be happening soon. Quintrell nodded. Yes, of course. But I want both of you with me when I call for the prisoner. I want to know what you make of what he tells us. You're certain he'll cooperate? Garin asked. I'll have a Talista with me, Quintrell replied. He'll cooperate. One way or another. Carenza was grateful that they passed few people in the corridors. She hung on to her composure with sheer willpower, and her control was slipping quickly. Garin opened the door to one of the workrooms and glanced around to assure that it was empty. He muttered words of power and warded the door for silence. Carenza collapsed into a chair, weeping. Garin knelt beside her, can't keep the warding up long. Vigus will sense it, if he doesn't already. What he did, the divvy. Gurren nodded and let her cry into his shoulder. I know, I saw. I've known Vigus for decades. He has an ego, he can be thoughtless, but it's new for him to use magic to torture someone. He shook his head. I don't think that's all Vigus is doing. He's been corrupted by the Divi. Maybe, Carenza allowed, drying her tears on the back of her hand and daubing her face with her sleeve. But Vigus opened himself to the Divi to get what he wanted. He didn't worry about who got hurt. I can't forgive him for that. She drew a ragged breath. I can't forgive him for what he did to Carr. God's above, Gurren. Carr's just a boy. Gurren took both her hands in his. He's a soldier, Carenza. You heard him, and he chose to come here as a spy. He knew the risks. He didn't know Vigus could rip his thoughts from his mind, she argued. Maybe, but he has to know that Talista can read a person's blood, Gurren replied, or that he could be hanged, or worse, if he got caught. We've got to do something, Carenza said miserably. Vigus won't leave him sane. Gurren met her gaze. You've got a choice to make, Carenza. Save Carr, defy Vigus now, and it's over. You won't be able to help Blaine. Vigus will cast you out, or lock you up, and you'll have no way to stop what he's planning when he's at the forefront of a massive army trampling his way across Dondereth. How can we stop that? I don't know yet, Gurren admitted. But I do know that you've got to make a choice. Save Carr or save Blaine. You can't save both of them. He gave her a warning shake of his head and dispelled the warding. I like the progress you've made on the translation, he said, rising. Keep at it, you're almost done. Carinza nodded miserably. I will, she said, her voice choked. Thank you. Gurren shut the workshop door behind him. Carenza slumped across the table, her head on her arms. The tears were gone, leaving behind cold rage and the closest thing she had ever felt to pure hatred. Gurren's right, she thought, even though I don't want to admit it. 
I can't take the risk of saving Carr and losing the opportunity to strike at Vegas when the chance appears to turn the tide of battle. I may not be able to save Carr, but by all the gods, large and small, I will avenge him. The candle marks passed too quickly, and Quintrell sent for Gurren and Carenza to meet him at the room where Carr was imprisoned. With Quintrell was Stanton, a dark-haired Taliste, Carenza recognized but did not know. She memorized his face, for later, for the reckoning. Two guards stood in front of the door to Carr's room, and when Quintrell nodded, one of them turned the key in the lock. Then they entered. Carr was nowhere to be seen. Where is he? Quintrell demanded of the guards, who stared at the empty room, wide-eyed. Carenza felt a surge of hope. No one left the room after we locked him in, the senior guard replied. And the window hasn't been tampered with. Stanton made a careful circle of the room. I believe I found the problem. Stanton stood by the guard robe, which was hidden from view by a curtain. He threw back the cloth to reveal Carr slumped next to the stone seat, with both arms thrust into the hole. The senior guard grabbed Carr by the shoulders and pulled him back. Carr's head lolled, and his body tumbled from its perch. Carr looked unnaturally pale, even before the lantern light revealed a new set of cuts, long, straight gashes that ran from wrist to elbow on each forearm. The guard felt for a pulse in Carr's neck, then looked up. He's gone, my lord. Quintrell turned to Stanton. Can you... Stanton shook his head. No. If we had reached him at the moment of death, perhaps. But I can't read the dead, nor could I read still blood, even if it hadn't flowed down the castle wall by now. He must have had a blade hidden on him that was missed, Garin said. If so, then I suspect it's at the bottom of the chute as well. Stanton remarked. An unexpected complication, but he may still be valuable. We've lost our leverage, Quintrell snapped. I fail to see the value in that. Stanton turned to him. He can still be used to send a message? He looked back down at Carr's body. I can get him to Glenreath before daybreak, drop him off in front of the manor. I don't think it will take Macfadden long to figure it out. He has a temper. Perhaps this will goad him into something rash. And if it doesn't, Quintrell challenged. Stanton shrugged. You still have scored a blow close to home. Macfadden won't let that go. And when he strikes back, we will be ready. Chapter 26 Are you crazy? Kestel leveled an angry glare at Blaine. Have you forgotten what happened the last time you were at Myrdalor? Or at Valchur? Both times you nearly went up in flames. Blaine's small war council gathered in the parlor at Glenreath. Nicholas leaned against one of the bookshelves, arms crossed over his chest, a dour look on his face. It's doubly risky since Henock and Rostovan expanded their territories. You'll be back in the same situation you were when we first met up. A small group trying to sneak past the patrols. He glowered at Blaine. And you know how that ended. The alternative is waiting to anchor the magic until we've battled Lysander and Rostovan, and maybe Henock, to a standstill, Blaine said. I don't think Henock is cause for too much concern, Nicholas replied. The word I've gotten from Varen's spies is that Rhys is still imprisoned, and Pollard's forces have not fully recovered after the Battle of Valshoa. Hanok isn't strong enough to make much of a difference, at least not yet. 
Piran sat on one of the couches, with his feet propped up on the footstool, toying with his knife. He appeared distracted, but Blaine knew Piran was not only paying attention, he was uncertain about the chances for success. If anchoring the magic is killing Mick, I don't see how there's really a choice about what to do first. Piran drawled without looking up. Swapping one thing that's trying to kill Mick for something else that's almost certain to succeed isn't much of an improvement, Kestel snapped. Gear stood near the fire. Its glow gave a hint of color to his pale skin, though he could not draw comfort from its warmth. The fact remains, he said, that as long as Blaine is the only anchor for the magic, the magic is as vulnerable as he is. Anchoring the magic might make you less of a target for Quintrell, Nicholas offered. After all, once the magic's anchored, killing or kidnapping you doesn't gain him anything. Blaine made a dismissive gesture. Knowing Quintrell, he won't give up that easily. Are you certain the ritual can be done at Myrdalor? Piran asked. Nicholas nodded. Need Hood and Dolan investigated the citadel, and also went into the crypts beneath Quillarth Castle. He shook his head. They were lucky to get out in one piece. There are reasons why those levels beneath the castle were off limits for so long. The dead are dangerous, even to Taliste. Kestel swore under her breath. Am I the only one who thinks this is a bad idea? Myrdalor is on the edge of Henoch's territory, even if Mick survives the ritual, we could come up in the middle of a battle. And we don't dare take a full complement of troops with us, because that would call Hanok down on us for certain. Kestel was pacing at the far end of the room, and Blaine knew from her gestures that she was both angry and frightened. How do we keep a working of that level a secret? Blaine asked. Kestel's right. Moving troops to protect ourselves is essentially a declaration of war. For Quintrell, or anyone with magical abilities, what we do will be like lighting a bonfire. Even if we could slip in unannounced, after we finish, assuming it works, every mage in Dondoroth will feel it. He shook his head. That's the hard part about trying to anchor the magic before we've won the war. How do you even know this will work? Kestel challenged. I know you can't anchor the magic yourself much longer, but if you're wrong about how it's done, it could kill everyone involved. So what do you get out of this whole anchor thing, Mick? Piran asked, looking up. I mean, it makes you a target for every warlord on the continent. You've nearly gotten fried several times, with one more shot coming up, it seems. Does it make you a mage? Will you be able to fly or walk through walls? Cheat at cards without getting caught? Seriously, Mick, there ought to be something in this for you. If we can anchor it properly, I get to go on living. Blaine answered dryly. The short answer is, it doesn't do much for me, beyond having the magic working again. From everything we've found, when it's done right, the Lords of the Blood all come away with some extra abilities, things like King Merrill's truth-sensing. But it didn't make them majors before, and it probably won't make them majors now if they weren't already before the ritual. Maybe it's because the magic is still brittle, but the only difference I can see so far from anchoring the magic myself is having a few seconds of foreknowledge before someone attacks. He shrugged. And maybe that's all there will ever be. Sounds like a bad bargain, Mick, Pirin said, shaking his head. I'd never have gone for it. Kestel snickered. What? Pirin demanded. Oh, nothing, Kestel said with a wave of her hand. By all means, keep talking. Let's look over that list again, Nicholas said. Your new Lords of the Blood. Blaine let out a long breath and nodded. Start with me, and you, and with the Wraith Lord, who was a Lord of the Blood when he was mortal. 
So that really means Connor, Gastel supplied, since we need lords of the blood who actually have blood. True. Connor's done a lot to make this possible, Blaine said. He and the Wraith Lord together are valuable allies. Penhallow's a good choice, Pirin said. It can't hurt to have your strongest allies included. Good of you to think so, since you, Dor, and Varen are all on the list, Kestel said, playfully swatting at Pirin's bald head. Why aren't you? Pirin challenged. Because the real power of the Lords of the Blood lies in anchoring the magic over generations. And since I'm married to Mick, that would create only one lord in the next generation, not two. Kestel replied, rolling her eyes. As it is, House Macfadden will ultimately be represented twice, since Dawes asked Marie for a hand fasting this summer. We're sure Chaliste can be a lord of the blood? Nicholas asked. They were before, Kestel responded. Kirken Vanthold was already Teliste, but had not yet been made a wraith. We believe the bond stays with the Teliste until the ultimate death, Gear added. Did Borya or Desia decide which of them wants to be the lucky one? Perrin asked. Zaye decided it for them, said that Borya was the first twin born, so it's his job. Kestel replied with a chuckle. She didn't want to have the honor. Nicholas raised an eyebrow. Kestel shook her head. Blaine approached her first, because of the magic. Zarya declined because she hasn't decided whether or not she wants to wed. She shrugged. Dolan is a good choice to secure the allegiance of the Knights of Estrain, Gear said, as is Trea Vos, a valuable man to have on your side. Tormad Solvik makes sense, Kestel agreed. And there, the decision between Tormad and Rinka had to do with Tormad's magic. They talked about it and thought Tormad was the better choice. Too bad Werner didn't survive the last battle, Piran commented. His son did, Nicholas pointed out. Bergen was commanding part of their army elsewhere when the mage strike hit his father's troops. He's agreed to be one of the thirteen. Which leaves one more. Blaine said. We've got representatives of the Teliste, and from the Majors, plus old friends and allies. That's why I chose Folville. Quite a set of rogues, if I do say so myself, Nicholas said. And I think you've just answered our question with the names on the list. We're going to have to fight the war to a conclusion before we can anchor the magic, because we can't hope to assemble all of those people at Myrdalore until we've dealt with Lysander and Quintrell. We'd be inviting a massacre. All your allies in one place, tied up with a magic ritual that will kill them if anything goes wrong. He's right, Mick, Pirin agreed. You might as well paint a target on our backs, if we try to fix the magic before the war is decided. Not much of a choice, Kestel said, grimacing. Anchor the magic, and we probably all die. Keep on fighting, and we don't know how much of a toll the magic will take on Blaine. Dolan and Nidhud are confident that they've figured out the transfer and anchoring process once we can assemble the group, Gear said. Dolan has the presence crystals and manuscript he took from Quintrell, plus the discs, and since then he's found more information beneath Quillarth Castle and in the hidden rooms at the Citadel, details that Quintrell didn't know. Put it all together, with the Lord of the Blood in a place of great power, and they're sure it will work. And we can be pretty certain that if Quintrell had found the rest of the pieces, he would have either offered it up when Blaine did the ritual at Valshoa, or used it for himself to try to take control of the magic away from Blaine. Nicholas said. I don't think Quintrell would be resorting to allying with warlords if he could get what he wanted with magic. Pirin looked up. So, just one of the last lords of the blood was a mage, right? But all of them came out of it with some kind of extra abilities. 
So how will it change us? What about Mick? Does he get to keep his battle magic and foresight, or will that change too? Dolan's gone over the manuscripts carefully, researching that point, Gear said. From all accounts, only Kirk and Vanthold was a mage before or after the ritual at Myrdalor four hundred years ago. And remember, magic had been gone for a hundred years when they restored it, so when the small magic started to manifest, in people who had been without magic for generations, it seemed miraculous, and those who participated in the actual ritual came out with new, small magics that provided a survival advantage. Like Blaine's foresight, or King Merrill's truth-sensing, Kestel said. I'm certainly not a mage, but I've always had a small dollop of magic that made me a little faster, a little stronger in a fight. Better reflexes than when I'm not in battle, Blaine said. Since Valshoa, it's like I can see a few seconds ahead, sense an attack before I'd normally be able to know it was coming. He shrugged. It's not huge magic, but it's helped keep my head on my shoulders. When everything is said and done, I wouldn't mind keeping those abilities, or even having them expand. If I'm going to stay in the warlord business, I'm fine with an unfair advantage. You could also say that your new bond with the magic heightens your awareness of when power is being used nearby, Kestel speculated. That might be handy, if it didn't drain you so badly. Maybe when the magic's properly anchored, if you keep that ability, it can give you a warning without damaging you. She gave a wicked smile. Being able to keep tabs on who is using magic and where they are could make you a hard man to kill. That'll take some getting used to, Pirin mused. I've made it this far without any magic at all. He grinned. Maybe my new magic will make me irresistible to the ladies. Don't get your hopes up, Kestrel said. There's not enough magic in the world to make that happen. Your grin softened their long-running, friendly bickering. Gear looked up abruptly, as if summoned by a call only he could hear. Excuse me, he said, already making his way to the door. I'm needed outside. Is there anything... Nicholas began. Gear shook his head. Not yet. Stay inside. With that, he was gone. Something's gone wrong, Blaine said, crossing to the window. Remember, my bond to Penhallow includes gear. The door flew open, and Marie came running into the room, trailed by Dor. He's dead! By the gods, Blaine, Carr's dead! Blaine looked from Marie's tear-stained face to Dor's grief-stricken expression. It's true, Mick, Dor said quietly. You'd better come down. He's in the entrance hallway. Kestel touched Blaine's arm in a gesture of support. Blaine took the stairs two at a time, leaving the others behind him as they hurried to follow. He slowed as he reached Glenreath's entrance hall. Judith knelt, sobbing, beside a figure wrapped in burlap. Edward knelt next to her, one arm protectively around her shoulders. The older man was weeping. A guard stood just inside the doors. What happened? Blaine asked, stunned. At least they dropped the body in front of the gates, sir, the guard replied. Two of ours gave chase. Blaine nodded absently, although he barely heard the answer. He knelt next to Carr's body. Carr's eyes were open and staring, his skin unusually ashen, even for a corpse. Deep gouges across his face and chest were mute testimony to torture. Blaine looked up, feeling grief war with rage. They drained him. Edward folded Judith against his chest as she sobbed and shook his head. Look at his arms, Blaine, Edward said. Blaine lifted one of Carr's arms and turned it palm up, 
His hand was dark with dried blood, but not from the bite marks Blaine feared. Two raw, deep parallel gashes slashed from Carr's wrist to his elbow, slashed into the veins. I don't understand, he muttered, barely able to frame his thoughts aloud. Why would he kill himself? Kestel knelt next to him, staring at Carr's body in silent grief. Piran stood behind Blaine, on guard. Marie leaned against door, looking as if she might collapse. Nicholas was the last to join them. By Torvan's horns, Nicholas murmured, what in Raka happened? Edward gestured toward the body. Inside the burlap, he's wrapped in one of Rostovan's battle pennants. Blaine felt grief and anger roll through him like a crushing tide, robbing him of breath. How in the name of the gods did they catch him? Carr was spying, Nicholas replied, his voice rough and choked. He took off on his own. He's been missing since the last storm. He shook his head. Blaine, you have to believe me. I would never have sent him anywhere near Quintrell or Rostovan. Short of clapping him in irons or locking him in the dungeon, there was no stopping him. I ordered him to stay away from the warlords. We haven't seen him in a fortnight. The front doors slammed open. Blaine and the other fighters were on their feet, weapons at the ready, before they recognized the newcomers. Gear and two of his Talishte soldiers dropped a bound man on the entranceway floor. Here's the one who dropped off the body, Gear said, leaning down to jerk the prisoner to his knees. Tell Lord Macfadden what you know, he commanded. Ah, what? The prisoner countered. You're a hundred years too late to kill me. Gear leaned down to whisper in the man's ear. The smirk on the captor's face dimmed and vanished. And that is how Hemming Lawrence existed, in agony, for more than sixty years. Gear finished, standing. We can do the same for you. That won't be necessary, the prisoner said, his voice strained. Blaine walked over to stand in front of the captive Taliste. The prisoner had the look of a hungry stray dog with dirty brown hair that fell lank across his face, a gaunt face and a body too thin for its height. What happened to my brother? Blaine demanded. The prisoner licked his lips. They caught him spying outside Torsford and took him to Vargas Quintrell. Quintrell figured out he was your brother and offered him a deal. He refused. How did he die? Blaine asked in a dangerously quiet voice. The Taliste licked his lips, a gesture from his mortal days. Quintrell wanted information. The spy wouldn't give it to him, so Quintrell used magic to take what he wanted. Quintrell gave him time to reconsider and tell him everything, or a Taliste would read the rest from his blood. Carr knew what would happen if a Taliste read his blood. Nicholas said, he'd seen it happen to the spies we caught. And if he was able to withhold anything of value from Quintrell's magic, all his secrets would be in the blood. So he made that impossible. What do you want us to do with the prisoner? Gear asked. Blaine drew a ragged breath. He could think of a long list of things that he wanted to do to avenge Carr, but none of them would change anything. The room was silent, awaiting his decision. Can you read another Taliste? If so, read him, then execute him. If not, go ahead and kill him, Blaine said tonelessly. Just get him out of my sight. Gear nodded, then pulled the prisoner to his feet, and the soldiers escorted them out. Blaine swallowed hard, trying to pull himself together. Kestel moved beside him. 
It means that, in the end, he didn't betray you, she said. He chose his fate so he couldn't be turned by one of Quintrell's Taliste, or used as a bargaining chip. Judith dried her tears on her sleeve and stood once more calm and controlled. We'll take care of him, she said with a catch in her voice. Marie left Dor's side and slipped up to take Judith's hand. There's room out by the oak to bury him with the rest of the family, Judith added, near where your mother is buried. The ground is still frozen, Marie protested. Gear and I can take care of it, Nicholas replied. That's not a problem. Blaine nodded, not trusting himself to speak. So many emotions warred inside him. Grief for what was lost. Anger at Carr's headstrong recklessness. Rage over Quintrell's cruelty. He settled on rage, since it was the most productive. Quintrell brought him here to goad us into war, Blaine said finally. I won't let Quintrell push us into fighting before we're ready, but when the time comes. He did not have to finish his sentence. He saw the same hunger for vengeance in their eyes that he knew they saw in his. When the time comes, he repeated quietly, Quintrell belongs to me. After sunset the next day, Blaine led a solemn procession to the burying ground by the large oak. Ian McFadden's grave was on the far side, set apart. Judith had seen to Ian's burial after Blaine's imprisonment, and the distance between the elder McFadden's grave and those of the rest of the family was a measure of her scorn. The new grave was on the left, near the lonely stone that marked Blaine's mother's grave. Blaine's grandparents were buried here, and his ancestors long passed, back to the first Macfaddens who built Glenreath. Behind the Macfadden graves were the modest resting places of the servants, some of whose families had served Glenreath for generations. Gear and Nicholas had made good on their word. Despite the frozen soil, they had dug a proper grave. Judith and Marie had bathed Carr's body, dressed him, and wrapped him in a shroud. Edward and Dor saw to a coffin, a rough pine box. Blaine, Nicholas, Pirin, Dor, Gear, and Edward shouldered the coffin. Kestel, Judith, and Marie followed them, then Rickard and Leave, and most of Glenreath's servants, along with a contingent of guards for protection. Judith took the role of wise woman, the elder who spoke the final blessing over the dead and consigned the body to rest in the Sea of Souls. Blaine watched the simple ceremony, numb with shock and loss. Even rage seemed insufficient. As much as he desired Quintrell's death, Blaine knew from experience that it would not make anything right. He took his turn with the other pallbearers, shoveling dirt into the grave, listening to the sound of the clod striking the wooden box, the most final sound in the world. When the grave was filled, Blaine and the men hefted stones to make a cairn. Judith, Kestel, and Marie set out candles, food, and wine as an offering to Estrain and Torven, the gods who controlled the Sea of Souls and the Unseen Realm. Blaine paused for a moment as the others headed back to the manor, watching the candles flicker in the wind. Kestel slipped her arm through his. Come back to the house, she urged. There's nothing more you can do here. Blaine nodded. I know. Kestel looked up at him earnestly. Mick, this is not your fault. Blaine sighed. Sometimes I think that when I killed father, it was like I pushed a big boulder off the top of a mountain, and it tumbles faster and faster, destroying everything in its path. 
Kestel gave him a level look. You didn't start the war with Merivan. You didn't cause the great fire or the cataclysm. And if you hadn't been exiled, you'd have died with the others. And there's no telling when, or if, the magic could have been restored. Blaine shook his head. No, I'll grant you that. But it's caused no end of misery for my family, when all I wanted was to stop their pain. He gestured toward Carr's grave. I thought I was saving Carr and Marie. I didn't. Kestel pulled him around to face her. For God's sake, Mick, Marie's done well for herself. She has a fine son, and she's made a good match with Dahl. Carr chose his path, and for all we know, perhaps he took more after your father's temperament than you or Judith want to admit. I don't know whether he was taking crazy chances to prove himself, or whether he was looking to get killed, but in the end he didn't betray you. He made his choice. He did exactly what you did when you killed Eon, except you got lucky, and he didn't. Let him rest, Mick. There's work to do. Blaine stared at the cairn for a moment longer, then nodded and turned, taking Kestel's hand for the walk back to the manor. He noticed that two of Nicholas's guards waited a discreet distance away and trailed them as they headed down the path. They found Verin, Boria, and Desia waiting in the great room, along with the other members of their minstrel spy team. We just got in, Mick, Varen said, his face still ruddy from the cold. Daw told us what happened. I'm so sorry. Blaine nodded curtly. Thank you. He frowned and glanced at the group. You're back sooner than you expected. Problems? By his count, no one was missing. Kestel hugged Varen in greeting. Have you eaten? Everyone's been rather distracted. Let me go see what I can find. She bustled off to rouse the servants. Varen returned his attention to Blaine. Forces are moving. Everything we've seen says both Lysander and Rostovan have their armies headed north. Blaine nodded. Zaye predicted the same. Nicholas is rallying the troops, and Voss has men on the way. Gear sent to least messengers to the Solvigs and Werner's son. Good, Varen nodded, because all the conversation we've heard says this is the deciding battle. Folville sent a runner last night, Nicholas said, walking up behind them. With all that was going on, I didn't say anything. There have been Tinger attacks in the city, but Folville's men and our guards have handled it. Then, all of a sudden, about three days ago, the Tinger disappeared. Folville thinks Lysander plans to use them in a battle elsewhere. Blaine swore. Lovely. But at least we know in advance. It gets worse, Boria added. We've heard tell that the Tinger have found a way to use magic to bind the magic monsters to their bidding. They capture the beasts and keep them contained, then loose them on their enemies. Boria had lost a cousin to the powerful talons of a grip, a leather-winged predator spawned by one of the wild magic storms. Just what we need, Nicholas muttered. There have been more Tinger problems in the countryside, Varen said. It's gotten pretty bloody. Some of the villagers have run them out of town, and there's been talk that the Tinger hanged some villagers in revenge. We made sure to spread the word that the Tinger support Lysander. That might explain why we've had a large number of new recruits in the last few weeks, Nicholas said. I blamed it on hungry bellies. It was the point in the spring when the food put by for the winter was growing scarce, and new crops were long in the future. But maybe the Tinger annoyed enough folks they decided to join up with us. Right about now, I'll take good news wherever I can find it, Blaine said. He looked to Varen as Kestel beckoned from the hallway for the newcomers to come and eat. 
Go get some food. We'll find places for everyone to stay. Enjoy it while it lasts. We'll be heading out to battle in a couple of days. Later that evening, Rickard approached Blaine, Kestel, and Nicholas in the parlor. We believe we've worked out a solution to your magic problem, Rickard said. Well, not a full solution. That won't happen until you can alter the anchoring. But a way to help you make it through the next battle without the magic taking as much of a toll. And this time, there's no one working against us. Kestel gave him a narrowed glance. How sure are you? Rickard chuckled, expecting her reaction. Leave? Zarye? Name us and I? Of all attempted use of the item, with no ill effects. And after what happened the last time, I have the pendant in my pocket. I'm not going to let it out of my sight. Blaine and Nicholas exchanged a look, and then Blaine rose. All right. Show me. Those artifacts Penhello secured in the crypts under the castle have proven their worth, Rickard said as Blaine and the others followed him to the Major's workroom. It just took a little digging. Zarye and Liev were waiting for them. Namus stayed behind in the workroom. Arton had died of his injuries, and with Lowry's treachery, only the four were left. Zarye looked at Blaine with concern as he entered. The magic makes your dreams restless, she said, scanning him with her gift. Blaine hesitated, then nodded. It's getting worse. One more way it drains you, Zarya agreed. Your tether to the magic never sleeps. At first, your mind could hide that from you, but as time goes on, it wears you down. She gave a sad smile. Like a cistern with a leak. Only a little water leaves at a time, but soon enough, the whole well empties. Show us what you've found, Kestel said. The sooner we can decide the battle, the sooner Mick can go to Merdalor and stop the leak. We can't use a traditional null charm for Lord Macfadden because of the effect it might have on anchoring the magic, and on his battle magic, Rickard said. Unfortunately, Lowry destroyed the only dampening charm we'd found when he corrupted it, he added with a grimace. We went through the bags of artifacts that were brought up from the crypt. Dagger left most of them here, since he only wanted the ones that might affect making a new anchor. He gave a crafty smile. And we got lucky. Rickard held up a round agate circle on a braided leather and twine cord. I know it doesn't look like much. Magically, it doesn't feel like much either, until you realize that the magic sort of slides off the charm, like rain on slate. We thought it deflected magic, Leave said with more enthusiasm than Blaine had seen the quiet maid show over anything. But that's not the only thing it does. Watch. Rickard slipped the amulet's cord over his own head and gave Leave a nod. Leave stood back, then raised his hands and sent a streak of light towards Rickard's chest. It flashed against the amulet and returned to Leave, stinging him in the shoulder. Leave shook his arm and rubbed his skin where the light hit. But he was grinning widely. Of course, I didn't use anything like the energy that got bounced around the last time, Leave said. Didn't want to hurt anyone. But you see what happens. Magic slides off and then bounces back to the sender. Handy, don't you think? If Blaine insists on going to the battlefield, Zarya began. I do, Blaine interrupted. Zarya nodded in acknowledgement. Then we've got to keep the magic from wearing you down, and I think this is our best bet. She gave a dangerous smile. Of course, Rickard and the rest of us will be going with you, and we'll be focused on taking out the other mages. General Thielson was good enough to spare a messenger for us to summon our fellow mages from the Citadel, Rickard said. They'll join us for the battle as well. We expect them here tomorrow, and we'll work out our strategy then. 
but our goal will be to strike hard and fast at the majors with Rostovan and Lysander, to put them out of the battle first. Which might include Carenza. Blaine thought with a pang. Sweet Estrain, I hope Quintrell's not mad enough to send her into battle. Let's try out what you've got, Blaine said. Rickard took the amulet from around his own neck and draped it over Blaine's head. Blaine settled it onto his chest so that it hung nearly at heart level. Kestel, Nicholas, and the other majors remained on the other side of the wardings. First, we'll see if the charm works the same for you as it did for the rest of us, Rickard said. He gave a nervous glance at Kestel and Nicholas. I assure you, the strike I send will sting, but do no worse damage. He gave a dry chuckle. Remember, if it bounces back, it hits me. Send it, Blaine said, taking a deep breath to steel himself. Rickard raised his hand, and a brilliant flare of light arced from his palm. It crackled toward Blaine, sliding aside at the last minute and sizzling back toward Rickard, striking him in the arm. It works, Kestel said, grinning. Zarye frowned and closed her eyes. She spread her hands, palm down, and looked as if she were listening for something she alone could hear. I sense no change in Blaine's energy levels from the strike, she said. She opened her eyes. Of course, Rickard expended very little power. Still, it bodes well. Rickard rubbed his palms together and licked his lips. Which brings me to the other thing we wanted to try, he said nervously. We thought it prudent to gauge how well Lord Macfadden reacts to powerful magic nearby, and whether the amulet blunts that impact. Kestel looked dubious, but Blaine nodded. Better we find out here than to get knocked off my horse in battle, he said. What did you have in mind? A simple trial. Rickard replied. We'll raise a warding around Blaine, so that our magic can't harm him directly. We just want to see how he reacts to being in the presence of strong power. Of course, the amulet won't raise a warding. That would be too constraining. But the amulet should be able to protect his body, and more importantly, his mind and his life energy. Kestel's glare told Blaine what she thought of the idea, and Zarye looked worried. Nicholas looked to Blaine and shrugged. Up to you. Blaine let out a long breath. I'd rather land on my ass here, where I can recuperate, than expect protection and get flattened in the thick of battle. He nodded. Let's give it a try. Kestel gave Rickard a look that made the mage pale, no doubt thinking about the fate that had befallen Lowry. I promise you, Lord Macfadden, we will minimize the impact. Blaine shook his head. Don't. We need to know what this amulet will and won't do. Better here than elsewhere. Rickard nodded nervously. As you wish, my lord, he said, though his gaze slid sideways to Kestel's glower. Rickard? Zarye and Leave took up places at an equal distance from each other along the outside of the circle. We aren't going to make a direct strike at Lord Macfadden, Rickard explained. We're just going to raise a lot of power quickly and see how it affects him while he's wearing the amulet. He met Blaine's gaze. Then we'll have him remove the amulet and see what happens when we do it again. Blaine nodded and Rickard signalled the others. Each called down power in his or her own way. Rickard chanted quietly under his breath as he raised his hands, and his entire form began to glow. Zarye closed her eyes, singing to herself, and Leave swayed back and forth, fingers working in complex motions as he gathered his magic. A milky curtain of pure power shot up to the ceiling, shimmering white, 
glowing like the spirit lights of the far north sky. Tendrils of mist-like energy wafted back and forth through the center of the circle, winding and curling around Blaine, but leaving him untouched. Blaine caught his prayer and staggered back a step, but when Rickard shot him a worried glance, Blaine shook his head, signaling them to continue. The coruscating wall of power glowed brighter, crackling with energy, glistening like the trapped power of a winter storm. Blaine paled and wavered on his feet, but did not fall. He nodded to Rickard. This time, the power rippled like a waterfall, with a rush and crash of a thundering cataract. Blaine could barely make out the worried faces on the other side. He could sense the amulet straining against the power, like listening to a rainstorm pouring down on the roof overhead. Yet every time the power closed in, Blaine felt it slide away as the amulet deflected the worst of the strike. Blaine could feel the magic shift back and forth, what the mages call fragile. The energy poured out full strength, then dropped out for an instant, back again almost too quickly to notice the gap. Gradually, the protection of the amulet wavered, and Blaine gasped, falling to his knees. Abruptly, the power vanished. The sudden disappearance of the energy gave Blaine to realize just how much he had been straining against it. When the power winked out, he fell forward, as if he had set himself against a headwind that suddenly quelled. Rickard ran towards him, waving the others back. Blaine was already on his hands and knees, shaking his head to clear it. How do you feel? Rickard asked. Blaine related what he had noticed as the power escalated and Rickard nodded. The power we raised was substantial, more than we could sustain for long under battle conditions, Rickard said. There will be more mages on the battlefield, but our side will work to blunt the enemy's strikes, so unlike this test, all that power will not come to bear on you. If we're lucky, Blaine said. Do you still want to try it without the amulet? Rickard asked. Blaine fingered the agate circle and shook his head. No, you've made your point. I could sense the power that the amulet was holding back. I know that feeling. I felt it before in the thick of things, and I know I would have collapsed a lot sooner and felt much worse without the amulet. He managed to get to his feet without help. What if I wore a null amulet? Kestel asked. It wouldn't block Blaine from using his own magic unless we were very close together. But if he has a deflecting charm, and I have a null charm, it might give us one more advantage in battle. Rickard nodded. I can arrange that. Thank you, Blaine said. Rickard gave a wan smile. The greatest thanks would be your safe return and an end to the fragile magic. I'll do my best to make that happen, Blaine said, tucking the amulet under his shirt. He was happy to accept the hot cup of fat Kestel pressed into his hands from a pot on the hearth. Blaine sank gratefully into a chair, feeling as if his legs had become jelly, trembling all over from the exertion of the test. That decides it, Kestel said. I'm riding with you. Blaine moved to protest but to his surprise, Nicholas nodded. Sorry, Blaine, I've got to agree. Kestel's got a big stake in making sure you live through this. And from what we've seen, even with the amulet, you've got a weak point the enemy can exploit. He paid no attention to Blaine's annoyance. And I'm also going to make sure you've got at least three bodyguards whose sole job is to make sure you come back alive. Blaine wanted to argue but he sighed and nodded. There's more at stake here than my pride. Nicholas is right. It's not enough to win the battle. If I die, the magic could still be lost for good. Chapter 27 These are the artifacts Pollard's troops found with the Arcalus. 
Torrenth Rostovan said, and a soldier dumped out a bag of objects onto a table in the Major's workroom. I want to know what they do and how we can use them as weapons. Carenzo looked at the motley collection of items and wondered what had given Rostovan the idea that any of them were magical. From where she stood, near the back of the room, it looked like a pile of junk. Vigus Quintrell stood near the table, and he eyed the objects, then nodded. I'll need a place we can work that won't damage the building if something goes wrong, he said. One of the outbuildings. Some place that won't matter if we blow it up, Carenza thought. I can have the men clear out one of the storage buildings, Rostovan said. What else? Where are the majors Pollard's people captured? Quintrell asked. Sedated, chained, and under watch with to leash their guards, Rostovan replied. Quintrell nodded. Bring them to me, once night falls. The guards as well. They'll help us figure out the use of these items. Rostovan raised an eyebrow. You expect them to cooperate? The smile on Quintrell's face was unpleasant. They won't have a choice. By dusk, the workspace was ready. It was a small stone-walled building with heavy wooden rafters and a slate roof, as fireproof as anything could be built. The building was windowless, and no more than thirty paces by thirty paces, meaning that any magic worked here would be close and personal. Torches hung in sconces around the walls of the room, enough to give light but not heat. Smoke collected up at the peak of the building's ceiling and hung heavy in the air below. Carenza was dressed warmly beneath her cloak, but the damp cold of the outbuildings still seemed to get into her bones. Her fingerless gloves helped, but she still shivered, both from cold and from anger. Four hapless majors sat bound, blindfolded, and gagged against the wall of the room. They were all male, and they looked as if they had fought their capture. Several of the captured majors bore bruises on their faces, split lips, or blackened eyes. Their robes were stained and dirty, bloodied in places. One of the men slumped, defeated. Two of the men seemed resigned to their fate, leaning back against the wall, waiting for whatever befell them. The other mage strained against his bonds and chewed at his gag, still fighting. Carenza could not look too long at their prisoners without feeling her anger rise at Quintrell, so she studied the Taliste guards instead. Before the cataclysm, she'd only rarely glimpsed individual Taliste at a distance, usually among the guests at a noble's party, since they had been unwelcome in King Merrill's court. Remove his blindfold, Quintrell said, pointing to the angry mage. It was like Vigus to choose the hardest one first, Carenza thought. Quintrell, or the Divi who now controlled him, would want to break the rebel as a lesson to the others. She cast a wary glance toward the specially made brass-bound chest Quintrell had personally carried into the workroom. Its top was open and the front of the chest folded down revealing the large divi orb on a velvet cushion, like a god seated on a throne. One of the Taliste guards walked over and unwrapped the rag that blindfolded the mage. Now that she could see his face, Carenza saw that he was perhaps a few years older than she was, a tall, lanky man with angular features and dark eyes. He stared at Quintrell balefully and Carenza guessed that only the magic worked in with his bonds and gag kept him from making a suicide attack on them all. She couldn't blame him. Did you make the warding full strength? Quintrell asked, with a sharp glance to Gurin. It'll hold, Gurin said. I've got no desire to go up in flames, he added. In the center of the workroom, Gurin and Gunva had drawn a warded circle with chalk and charcoal, then reinforced it with a braided mage cord. 
Candles were set at intervals around the outside of the circle, and between the candles lay bloody pieces of a freshly slaughtered rabbit, torn apart to feed the working. The divvy liked blood. Put him under compulsion, Quintrell ordered. Take away his will. The Talisto guards regarded Quintrell with a look that told Carenza they were following orders from Pollard, not responding to please Quintrell. She dared not meet their gazes, but it was clear in their expression that they did little to hide their disdain. One of the Talisto guards reached out, his hand moving faster than sight could follow, and grabbed the rebel mage by the chin, forcing the man to meet his gaze. Reflexively, the captive shut his eyes. Open your eyes, or I'll cut away your eyelids, the Talisto said quietly. The captive mage opened his eyes, and the position in which the Talisto held his head gave no choice except to meet his gaze. You will comply with what Mage Quintrell orders you to do, the Taliste said. You will follow his orders exactly. You will make no move to disobey, either by action or inaction. Do you understand? The rebel mage nodded. His body, tight with anger only moments before, had relaxed, and his face, which had been twisted with rage, was slack and vacant. You'll do as you order, the Taliste said, stepping back. Carenza could see a bruise starting where the guard had gripped the man's chin. Cut his bonds and have him walk into the center of the warding, stepping over the circle, Quintrell said to the same Taliste guard. The Taliste regarded Quintrell for a moment, as if to remind the mage that he obeyed by choice and walked over to the angry prisoner. He grabbed the man by his bound hands and jerked him to his feet, where he swayed for a moment before getting his balance. The divvy orb glowed at the neckline of Quintrell's tunic, and Carenza thought sickly that the spirit was enjoying itself at the captive's expense. The prisoner did not move as the Taliste unlocked the chains around his hands and feet. His stare was blank, and Carenza wondered if deep inside himself he knew he was being compelled, or whether all sense of self had been sublimated to the Taliste's will. She doubted the latter. It would have been too merciful. The Taliste gave the mage his orders and the man walked into the center of the warding, careful not to smudge the protective markings. Quintrell walked over to a table that had been placed near the large divvy orb, where the captured artifacts lay. He selected a steel torque. It was a flat semicircle of dull gray metal, large enough to fit around a man's neck and lie over the collarbones, half a hand's width wide. Quintrell lifted the item with wooden tongs, and in the firelight, Carenza could see etchings of runes and sigils covering its surface. Even at a distance, the collar felt wrong, tainted, and powerful. Order him to invoke it, Quintrell said. The Taliste complied. Something flickered behind the captive major's eyes, fear that was stronger than compulsion, but against his will, his body moved. The mage's lips formed words of power, and the runes on the collar glowed with an inner fire. The collar flared, and the captive mage screamed. His body began to shake, trembling from head to toe. His skin writhed as if it had a life of its own, bubbling and heaving as it wrenched itself free. Call a shape to his mind, Quintrell ordered. The Taliste closed his eyes, and his features grew taut with concentration. Once again, the tortured mage's skin heaved and quivered, and as Carenza watched in horror, flesh took new form as the bones and muscles remade themselves. Through it all, the skull remained intact, enabling the mage to shriek in agony. His cries echoed off the stone walls, deafeningly loud. Gurren blanched and Carenza thought she might pass out. 
Gunver, whose magic enhanced the power of others, slumped to the floor, unconscious. Corinza knelt beside him long enough to assure herself that he was still breathing. When she stood and looked into the circle once more, a nightmare creature hunched where the doomed mage had stood. It was the same bulk as the man had been, but the body was remade. The creature sat on thick, powerful haunches with long-fingered forefeet and hind feet that ended in black, curling claws. The overall form was shortened and thickened, as if what had been height had been forcibly remade into muscle. The skull no longer resembled that of a man. Its jaws protruded, overfilled with the sharp teeth of a predator. Yet the eyes remained the same, eyes that met Carenza's gaze and begged for death. It still possesses magic, Quintrell said. Force it to embed the collar. The Talista's expression was neutral. Perhaps, Carenza thought, his master had willed him to do worse. Once again, the Talista concentrated, and the mage in the circle screamed. Beneath the collar, the skin tore apart, until the steel rested on blood and muscle. Just as quickly, the skin reformed, sealing the collar beneath it, so that it bulged like a deformity around the creature's neck. Keep him under compulsion, and have him leave the warded space. Carefully, don't smudge the marks, Quintrell ordered. Given no choice by the Taliste that held him in thrall, the creature limped out of the warding, as if uncertain how to make its newly formed legs work. The muscles looked capable of great power, but at the moment, the beast shuffled awkwardly, trying to adapt to walking on all fours, as if the brain had not changed as fast or as radically as the rest of the body. One glimpse at the eyes had been enough to assure Carenza that despite the changes worked on the body, the unlucky rebel mage had been left sentient, aware of what he had been and of what was done to him. She shivered, holding herself tightly, willing herself to partition off a cold place in her mind for the hatred that coursed through her, the anger and disgust she felt at the sight of what Quintrell had become. She and Gurren avoided looking at each other or at their fellow mages. It could just have easily been us he decided to try out his new toys on, she thought. It might have been us if the captives hadn't been convenient. I don't think there's any sentiment left in him. Quintrell stood next to the large divi orb with its withered hand encased in the sphere of glass. In the center of the orb, Carenza caught flashes of light like flying embers, but even unwillingly, at a distance, she could feel the orb's greed for blood. At Quintrell's direction, the Taliste forced the creature to squat in front of the divi orb. The orb flared, snaring the transformed mage in a burst of green light that lit up the ruined face, snaring the mage thing's gaze. Fresh screams tore from the creature's throat, hoarse howls of pain unbearable to hear. From where Carenza stood, it looked as if the last resistance drained from the creature's body, and when the green light faded, nothing of the human it once had been remained in its gaze. The Major's consciousness and his ability to do magic have been extinguished, Quintrell said. Present your master with a beast of war, my gift to him for use as he sees fit. He bent down to pick up the chains that had bound the tall mage's wrists and loop them around the beast's neck like a leash. I'd cage it soon, if I were you, Quintrell cautioned, holding out the leash to the Taliste. Once the shock wears off, you'll find it to be as fierce as the grips and smarter than the wolves. The Taliste guard took the chain and gave it a tug, and the beast shambled forward, more agile, now that no vestige of humanity struggled with how to move its transformed body. Carenza and the rest of Quintrell's mages stared at their master 
in horror. And only now did Carenza realize that her face was stained with tears. The captive mages had been spared the sight of their comrades' transmogrification by their blindfolds, but their blindness made the horror even worse with imaginings, and they shrank back against the wall. The smell of urine and shit told Carenza that at least one of the men had soiled himself in fear. Well, Quintrell said calmly, dusting off his hands. We know what that artifact does. Carenza stole a look at Gurren. His expression was schooled to be neutral, but she glimpsed fury in his eyes as his color returned. She knelt next to Gunver and wondered if Quintrell had used the mage's power to magnify the magic of the artifact without seeking permission. Gunvar's breathing was shallow, and his skin was pale, as if he had lost blood. If you use him again like that, you'll kill him, Corinza snapped, and if he dies here, we won't have his magic to draw on in battle. She had no desire to ever go out with the army again, but she bet that Quintrell would be more likely to preserve a valuable fighting acid than to save Gunvar out of sheer compassion. As you wish. Quintrell said with a shrug. I don't think I'll require his help with the next piece. You're not going to continue, are you? Gurren said, staring at Quintrell in horror. But Quintrell was already using the wooden tongs to select a new artifact from among the pile. Of course I am, he replied, as if the question was irrelevant. Who knows what we might discover? That was entirely the point, but Carenza knew it was useless to argue, and she had no desire to draw Quintrell's ire. Sickened as she was to be a spectator, she forced herself to feel nothing, allowing cold rage to settle into her bones, closing off her heart, deadening her feelings. I must remember, she thought. I must record what happens here as a witness to these deaths so that someone knows what took place. This time, Quintrell removed a steel and silver gauntlet and vambrace from the pile. It was a fearsome piece of armor in itself, with a vambrace to encircle the forearm and hinged plates in the gauntlet that covered the individual fingers, ending in short, sharp knives. That one, Quintrell said to another of the Teliste, pointing to one of the captives who was huddled, weeping. Take him. Once again, a Talishta guard removed the blindfold of his victim, compelled him to rise against his will, and loosened his bonds. Fit this on his right arm, Quintrell directed, and the Talishta complied as the mage captive looked on in terror, but unable to resist. When the captive was again within the warded space, Quintrell nodded to the Teliste, who ordered the prisoner to speak the artifact into action. For a moment, the Major's terrified gaze locked onto Carenza, and she saw that he knew he was going to die. The Vambrace and Gauntlet took on a silver glow, and the mage stiffened, then moaned in pain. As Carenza watched in fascinated horror, the vambrace melded with the man's arm, encasing the skin in steel, molding itself to the hand, wrist, and fingers. The mage relaxed and flexed his hand, twisting his wrist and moving his forearm to see just how maneuverable the artifact was. The steel fit like skin itself, and the knife-edged fingertips had grown longer into talons. For a moment, all was well. Carenza felt the magic around them fluctuate. That was not unusual since the magic had been restored, but imperfectly. It was part of the brittleness that made the new magic so unstable and dangerous, something mages like Carenza and her fellow scholars feared. Magic interrupted, was often deadly to the mage who cast it. The Vambrace's silvery glow 
reddened. And the mage in the warded circle shouted in alarm, trying to tear the vambrace and gauntlet free. It clung to his skin, warming to a dull red, and the mage tore at it, leaving bloody tracks down his upper arm as he tried and failed to get his fingers under the armor to rip it away. Quintrell made no move to end the test. The smell of roasting flesh was unmistakable as the vambrace burned into the mage's arm and the man began to scream. Inside the warded circle, the desperate mage cast one spell after another, chanting words of power all in vain. A few moments later, the vambrace slid off, leaving behind charred bone, and the mage collapsed, sobbing and trembling. His hand and forearm were blackened like that of a corpse on a pyre, and the wound was cauterized below the elbow. Yet the gauntlet and vambrace still glowed, brighter now than before. Carenza could hear the man's sobbing pleas for death, even from inside the circle's wardings. If he wishes for death so badly, let him activate the piece once more, Quintrell said diffidently. Do it. The Teliste made a gesture, and the prisoner stared at the cursed artifact as if looking into the maw of Raka itself. Then, against his will, the mage began to call the armor to him, and in the middle of the call, Carenza sensed that the mage gave up resisting, realizing that he was about to gain the death he coveted. Carenza saw understanding dawn on the mage as he stared at the gauntlet and vambrace, realizing that it had gained power by consuming his flesh, and that he could command it, but only at the cost of his skin and sinew. Come, he ordered the cursed armor and the vambrace skittered over to him, using its metallic fingers to move it across the floor. The mage held out his blackened arm. Fit, he said, and the armor backed itself onto his arm, adjusting itself to the lack of flesh and muscle, becoming a metal hand and arm. How long can the piece remain like that? Gurren asked, curious despite his revulsion. That level of magic has to take a toll. That would be good to know, Quintrell mused, as if the question had not already occurred to him. A warrior might be willing to forfeit an arm for a better replacement, but I wonder how hard a bargain the piece drives. Within fifteen minutes, the captive had begun to go grey in the face. Another ten minutes, and his breathing became ragged. Gradually, his face grew gaunt. And as Carenza stared in sickened fascination, she realized that, little by little, the mage was growing thinner. It's consuming him, she murmured. Gurren nodded. It's meant for one-time use, I wager. A desperate weapon, when the warrior knows he'll die one way or the other, and just wants to take the enemy down with him. Can he release it? Would that change anything? Carenza asked, her voice barely above a whisper. The dying mage heard her, locked his gaze with hers, and she saw that he had no desire to release his spell when death and freedom were quite literally within his grasp. Probably not, Gurren replied, even if he wanted to. Carenza had seen bodies charred by flames after the great fire. In the tombs and caves where she and Quintrell had hidden as he took her to refuge in Valshoa, she had looked on the mummified corpses of the long dead. The mage in the warded circle reminded her of those corpses as his cheeks hollowed and his skin wrinkled over shrunken limbs. His eyes were sunken, and the flesh of his face pulled tight and thin over bone. With a final moan, the mage fell back, and the skin withered like leaves in a fire until all that remained was blackened bone, and the gauntlet and vambrace clattered to the stone, empty and sated. 
Quintrell released the warding and used the wooden tongs to remove the deadly armor. A pity, he said. The curse limits its usefulness. He set the piece to the side. I'll inform Rostovan not to waste his best men on it. At Quintrell's nod, the same Talista guard removed the major's skeleton and stepped back with the other undead soldiers. Quintrell returned to the table of artifacts and returned with an amulet of brass on a braided leather strap. He gestured toward the next mage to become a victim of the artifacts, and once again a Talista guard removed the blindfold, glamoured the mage, and released his bonds. I suspect I know what this artifact does, Quintrell said, just not its limits. He shook his head as the Taliste began to herd the captive toward the warded circle. No need for that, not this time, but I would like two of you to hold him, one on each arm, Quintrell said. He dangled the amulet in front of the lead Taliste. Take this and fasten it round his neck, he instructed. He clucked his tongue when the Taliste hung back. You're undead. This particular amulet has no power over you. The Taliste gave him a sceptical look, then took the piece by its leather straps and fastened it around the prisoner's neck. Despite the compulsion, the captive mage looked terrified, having heard, if not seen, what happened to his former companions. Hold his arms out, Quintrell ordered, and hold him tightly. The two Taliste soldiers each took a wrist and stretched the major's arms out, holding him open and vulnerable. Quintrell looked to the lead guard again. Run him through. The Taliste raised an eyebrow, then drew his sword. Carenza gasped as the soldier plunged his blade deep into the mage's belly, tearing through skin and organs, ripping through to the other side. Vigus, no! Carenza cried out despite herself as the mage sagged in the hold of his captors, blood streaming from the wound. Watch, Quintrell said. Carenza felt bile rise in her throat as she stared at the mortally wounded mage. The brass amulet glowed amber, and as Carenza watched, the flow of blood stopped, and the skin began to knit itself back together. Again, in two places this time, Quintrell ordered, and the soldier sprang forward, driving his sword through the man's navel and out through his spine, then withdrawing his bloody blade and sliding it cleanly through the ribs and heart. The major's body jerked in spasms, he screamed in pain, his legs useless beneath him, his ragged clothing sodden with blood. Once more, a heartbeat later, the amulet glowed again, stronger now, bathing the man's body in its amber light. Strength returned to his legs, and as Carenza listened with her magic, beneath the rapidly healing skin, the ravaged heart returned to its steady beat. You've proven your point, Vigus, Gurin growled. Quintrell regarded him with disappointment. It's not enough to know a weapon's strengths and capabilities, he said archly. One must also know its point of failure. Cleave him, shoulder to hip, Quintrell ordered. Carenza turned to hide her face against Gurin's chest, and Gurin wrapped his arms around her shielding her from having to watch, as the Taliste brought his sword down with undead strength and the terrified mage screamed in panic. Carenza winced as the cry was cut short, struggling not to launch herself at Quintrell in a futile gesture of fury. This time, it took the amulet longer. He's healing, Gurren murmured. It's like it never happened. Carenza drew a ragged breath and let it out again, calling on all her limited magic to sustain her and strengthen her. She gently shook off Gurin's protective embrace with a nod of thanks, 
and turned to see the captive mage begin to breathe again, regaining his footing, still held in the iron grip of the two impassive Talista guards. Interesting, Contrell mused. Take off his head. The Talista hesitated. Even we cannot withstand such a blow, he warned Quintrell. Quintrell shrugged. The dark gift is just one type of magic. Let's see what the talisman can do. As you wish. The Taliste strode forward, and the mage attempted to stand to his full height, awaiting and accepting his executioner. With one clean stroke, the Taliste swung his sword in a silver blur, and the captive's head fell backward as his body sagged forward, blood spurting from the severed archery, spraying his blood-soaked captors with gore. Quickly, Quintrell ordered, lay him down and put the head back into place. The Chaliste did as they were ordered, arranging the headless body on the floor and laying the severed skull atop the ruined neck. The amulet hung in place, blood-soaked and dull, its amber glow gone. They waited for several minutes, but the amulet appeared to be as dead as the mage himself. Well, Quintrell said with a shrug, at least we know its limits. Carenza glanced toward the table and then to the one remaining mage. As if he guessed her thoughts, Quintrell chuckled. There's no need to test the other artifacts, he said. Several of them have no magic at all now, whether or not they had power previously. The others hold a trifling amount, not worth the risk of using for what little benefit they might present. What do you mean to do with him? Gurren asked with a nod toward the last captive mage. The man had curled into a fetal position, sobbing quietly, trembling so hard Carenza could see the shaking from where she stood. Don't worry, Quintrell assured Gurren. He has a purpose. At his nod, the Taliste soldiers hauled the last mage to his feet. Bring him here, Quintrell instructed, when they had removed the blindfold and glamoured the captive. Under the Talista's compulsion, the prisoner walked on his own to where Quintrell stood, next to the large divvy orb. Kneel, Quintrell ordered, and the man fell to his knees, so that his head was on level with the sphere, with its monstrous withered hand. Open your eyes, wide, Quintrell instructed the prisoner. And behold! What are you doing, Vigus? Carenza asked, afraid of the answer. Giving him his freedom, Quintrell replied, as if the answer were obvious. The large orb flared, and so did the smaller sphere on its strap at Quintrell's throat. Carenza saw their light reflected in her master's eyes, or perhaps shining through them from inside, where the divvy's rot had taken hold. The kneeling prisoner's body went rigid, bathed in a foxfire glow, and hoarse screams tore from the man's throat. Quintrell stepped back, and Carenza saw that the light shone on the prisoner's whole form, which had begun to shimmer and waver. The screaming stopped. The captive's body grew less solid, flattening as if it were a drawing on parchment, stretching and narrowing, so that soon. It was a pulsating column of light. The divvy orb surrounding the withered hand receded, and the light streamed in, absorbed by the severed bone and withered skin, feeding the divvy with the mage's death. Satisfied, the crystal swelled to encase the hand once more in its solid orb, and the light winked out, and the captive mage was gone. Gurren took Carenza's hand, lending her his strength and support. She could feel the stiffness in his muscles and knew he reined in the same deadly anger she strained to control. Not yet, but soon. 
Carinza was not sure whether the thought was her own, or whether Garin was able to send his thoughts to her through their clasped hands. But she nodded her understanding. Once and for all, Carinza vowed, for these deaths and all the others, no matter the cost, I will find a way to stop Vigus and make him pay. Chapter 28 Damn the magic, Nicholas muttered. Midday, and the battle was taking its toll. Bodies covered the valley so that it was hard to step without putting a foot into a corpse. Blood made the ground sticky in some places and slippery in others, and the whole thing smelled like an abattoir. Bodies hung on angled pikes, a macabre forest of bitter fruit. Not a candle mark before, Nicholas had seen dozens of his men charge ahead at full speed, believing they were ambushing a feckless group of stragglers. They ran at full speed, swords raised, a victory cry on their lips. Magic hid the truth. Only when the sharp stakes ripped into their chests and savaged their bellies did the illusion waver and fail. By then, dead eyes no longer saw. Dying soldiers were past caring. Be glad magic comes with limitations, Ayers said, sounding just as weary. It didn't seem very limited when they were jigging themselves like frogs, Nicholas muttered. The battlefront was shifting. Several candle marks hard fighting drove Rostovan's soldiers back, and Nicholas's mages were making a counter-strike of their own. Rickard was able to make blazing fireballs appear out of nowhere, and he harried the enemy troops for as long as he could, scattering their formations and lighting unlucky soldiers on fire. I hate battle magic, Nicholas growled. Saw too damn much of it on the Merivan front. We all did, Eyre said, as they moved with the rest of the unit, reforming for the next strike. It's sloppy. The mages can't send a plague of boils or some such unless the two sides are separated, which means they can't do much in a pitched fight. Using magic drains mages so badly they're not good for long, and with the way the magic is now, even a strong mage can't do what he used to. Nicholas grimaced. Be thankful for that last bit. I've seen what mages can do. He was thinking of the green ribbon of flame that descended the night of the great fire, magic that worked too well for the battle mages on both sides, and left a shattered, cindered continent in its wake. Nicholas heard the thud of distant catapults. Incoming! A voice shouted. Dozens of white, stone-like, lumpy balls rained down on them from the enemy catapults. What in Raqqa? Nicholas muttered. The stones unfurled crab-like legs tipped in lethal claws, moving with infernal speed. Nicholas and Ayers slashed with their swords, finding the beast's carapaces as hard as any cuirass. Where in the Sea of Souls did the Rannin come from? Ayers yelped. Nowhere good, Nicholas said grimly, swinging two-handed at the creatures. They're fast sons of bitches. The Rannin scuttled towards him, waving its dangerous, sharp claws. Nicholas jumped out of the way, but a claw tore at his pant leg, and he did not want to think what it would have done to soft flesh. I can't even find the eyes on those damn things, Eyr said, slashing with his full might as two of the beasts came at him at once. Nicholas was holding three at bay. Down the line, dozens of the miserable creatures had popped through, sent by Rostovan's mages. What in Raqqa are our mages doing? Nicholas demanded. That, I think... Ayers nodded in to his left, since he dared not stop fighting. Dead men jerked down from the pikes that killed them, 
staggering like drunkards, a line of corpses shambled their way toward their last mortal task. Eyes unseeing, stumbling on their own entrails, the fallen soldiers slashed their swords at anything that moved in front of them. We don't have a necromancer, Nicholas said, wide-eyed. Ayers shook his head. Don't need one. Didn't bring the dead back to life, just moved their bodies. He gave a jaded chuckle. Puts on a good show, doesn't it? Enough of the goddamned show right here. Nicholas muttered, bringing his sword down hard to snap the leg from one of the crab creatures. The ranin reared up on its other legs, slashing with a long foreleg, and gave an ear-splitting shriek. All around Nicholas, soldiers battled the shelled monsters with any weapon available. Nicholas and Ayers kept hacking away with their broadswords, crippling the beasts to slow them down, then smashing their hard bodies with rocks. The crab things burst apart, spraying a sticky eye core that burns like lye and stank like shit. Nicholas swore as the foul liquid sprayed him, giving the dead Rannan a kick for good measure. We're in for some weather, Eyre said with a warning glance at the sky. Figures, Nicholas said darkly. And just then, snow began to fall. Behind them, rank upon rank of soldiers fought down the last of the crab things, or dispatched the dying enemy soldiers with a mercy strike. Reform! Nicholas bellowed, trying to shout above the wind. Ready! Voices carried his commands down the line, and footsteps pounded as soldiers got into position. Charge! Nicholas and Ayers led the way flanked by a sea of soldiers. Rostovan's troops, gathering their nerve after the assault by the dead, closed ranks, angry and ready for vengeance. More catapult thuds echoed, and rocks pelted Nicholas's soldiers like rain. Tiny pebbles and stones the size of a man's fist fell out of the sky. Men fell in their tracks, struck in the head, and did not rise. Nicholas winced as a rock clipped him on the shoulder, hard enough he was certain he would bruise. Dodging the falling stones slowed their advance, buying Rostovan's forces a few precious minutes. Nicholas looked up to see one of Rostovan's commanders blocking his way. Ayers skidded to a halt, facing a challenger of his own. Cut off the head and the beast dies, Nicholas's opponent said with a nasty smile. What becomes of your army if I cut off your head? Too bad you won't find out, Nicholas muttered, lunging at the man before the other could strike. The exchange of a few sword blows made it clear the two were evenly matched in strength and skill. Nicholas blocked a series of savage strikes meant to maim, shouting his anger and cursing the wind. Nicholas gave as good as he got, taking cold satisfaction in the blood his sword raised on his attacker's arm. The enemy commander returned the favor, coming at him fast, with hard strikes that nearly knocked Nicholas's sword out of his hand. A few paces away, Ayers was holding his own with difficulty, struggling against an opponent who seemed to be enjoying every bone-jarring swing. Murderous focus glinted in his enemy's eyes as Nicholas dodged and parried, trying to get inside the man's guard. An instant too late, he moved to block a swing and took a deep gash on his upper arm, sending a rush of blood down to soak his hand. Nicholas drew back a step, ready to make a run at the officer, when his opponent froze, eyes glazed. As Nicholas and Ayers watched in consternation, their attackers suddenly turned on each other with lethal frenzy, oblivious to the two men they had just been about to kill. They swung at each other like madmen as blood sprayed into the air, carried on the merciless wind, tinging the snow crimson. The man Nicholas had been fighting gave a roar and brought the blade down so hard he cut through the other soldier's shoulder, sending the severed arm flying into the fouled snow. The maimed man scythed low, his blade connecting so hard with the officer's thigh he hit bone. 
The same thing happened all around Nicholas and Ayres. Enemy soldiers on the edge of victory suddenly attacked soldiers on their own side with mad dog ferocity. Nicholas had no magic of his own, but he had soldiered long enough to know it when he saw it. He and Ayres backed away from the fight. Somewhere in the distance, Nicholas heard Rostovan's commanders shouting for order, screaming at their soldiers to stop killing each other. Heedless, the soldiers fought with deranged fury, their bloodlust not satisfied until their opponents had been chopped to bits. As suddenly as it had began, the fog lifted from the crazed soldiers' eyes, and they looked about themselves in utter confusion and horror finding themselves maimed, bleeding, and soaked with the blood of their slaughtered comrades. Now, Nicholas shouted, descending on the enemy in their moment of disorientation, finishing the job their madness had begun. Nicholas waded into the fray with the grim determination of a butcher culling the herd. His sword swung like a reaper, splashing him with gore. He paused, only long enough to wipe the blood from his eyes. The bewitched soldiers gave little resistance as the realization of their treason sank in. Cursing and wailing like damned men, most of the soldiers either rushed unarmed at Nicholas's soldiers or fell on their own swords. Poor sorry bastards, Ayres muttered. Pity them as much as you want, as long as they're dead, Nicholas replied. A space had cleared in the fighting as Rostovan's troops fell back, desperate to avoid whatever had entranced their fighters. Snow fell thick and fast, whipped by wind that had grown bitingly sharp. Nicholas yelped in alarm. He'd been shivering with cold a moment before. Suddenly his skin was as hot as if he had been in the summer sun, blistering with fever. Ayres felt it too, and a sheen of sweat broke out on his forehead. Nicholas was panting, eyeing the falling snow longingly, wishing he could breathe it all into him to slake the raging fever. He stumbled, vision blurring, his tongue swelling in his dry mouth. Sovan, take my soul, he murmured, sure that he would burst into flames. This is how we die, he thought, broiled in our own juices when our blood boils. Damn the mages. From what Nicholas could make out, the entire front line staggered with fever. Nicholas fell to his knees, expecting at any moment to hear the swish of a sword's blade angled at his neck. A frigid wind swept across the bloody field, swift enough to nearly take men off their feet. Shapes rode the wind, and in his fevered haze, Nicholas thought perhaps the spirits of his family had come to gather him to the Sea of Souls. The figures grew closer, and Nicholas gasped. These revenants had not come to collect the dead. They came to reap the living. Their forms grew more distinct, and Nicholas realized that they wore the battle armor of the recent and long-gone past. Some of the ghosts bore their death wounds, others were ragged skeletons with sundered armor. Rage animated all of them. Primal instinct made Nicholas duck as the spirits swept past, but they did not come for him. The ghost horde rushed toward Rostovan's men like a flood, clawed hands grasping, teeth chattering, hungry for vengeance. They can't hurt us! They're just ghosts! One of Rostovan's men shouted. He turned to face the spirits, squaring his shoulders and planting his feet, sword held in front of him. Come and get me, he challenged. They came. The grey ghosts swept over the soldier, shrouding him in their mist. The fighter began to scream, terrified shrieks that continued as his skin lost its color, fading to the grey of the dead. His screams filled the air until the breath was gone from his lungs, and the spirits dropped him behind them as they passed.
Another soldier fell. And another. The grey tide grew dark like the storm clouds overhead, and as it darkened, the ghosts became more solid, as did the weapons they carried. Beyond harm, beyond pain, the spirits advanced. The pounding of marching feet filled the air. Nicholas struggled to his feet and shouted for his men to fall back, giving the ghosts room to attack. A few of his soldiers, pale with fear, ran for their lives. Most retreated warily, watching the ghosts with suspicion. The spirits of the dead marched forward, ignoring Nicholas's soldiers altogether. Nicholas saw the sentries represented in the different styles of their armor. Some looked to be the recent dead. Others wore the armor of a generation or two past. Many were outfitted in clothing from centuries before, and a few might have been barbarian fighters from a time before Dondoroth was civilized enough for such things as uniforms. On and on and on the dead came. No battle cries rose from the revenant soldiers, just an uncanny silence, remorseless in its purpose. The living screamed and cursed, powerless against the onslaught. Odd that when the ghosts passed me, I felt no tingle of magic in the air, Nicholas thought, yet now the air feels charged with power. Maybe the ghosts don't need magic, he mused. Maybe that's Rostovan's side, trying to muster up enough magic to lay the ghosts to rest. The wind had grown vicious, whipping the snow that was falling and the snow already on the ground. Against that background, the grey ghosts seemed even more fantastical. Nicholas was tempted to dismiss them as yet another illusion, but the screams of dying men men whose very solid, bleeding bodies fell at his feet, persuaded him of the spirit's reality. Rostovan was in full retreat, yet the ghosts pursued him, moving as fast as a swift courser, easily overrunning men on foot. Snow masked the distance, but screams carried on the cold air. Hearing the massacre, when he could not see it, made the slaughter more terrifying. Nicholas was surprised that anything could terrorize him any more. The carnage mortal soldiers had worked upon each other no longer distressed him, although it haunted his dreams. The charge of the dead soldiers almost made him feel sorry for the enemy. Almost. Fall back, Nicholas ordered. Until the storm cleared, fighting would be folly, at least for mortals. The ghost soldiers had Rostovan's troops in retreat, and evening would soon fall. Though it was technically spring, the days were still short, and the weather wintry. Do you think the storm is made, Sent? Eyre said, struggling out of the winds to appear near Nicholas. Nicholas shrugged. If we believe the majors, they say no one can do much to affect the weather now between how the magic doesn't work right yet, and the reaction from what was done before. The storm clouds made it difficult to gauge time, since the sky seemed dark enough for sunset. Nicholas guessed that it was late afternoon, still too early to count on Talishte help. Ayers nodded. Just wondering, that's all. Can't imagine we'll see more fighting tonight, between the ghosts driving Rostovan's men off and it soon being time for the Talishte to rise. That's my thought, Nicholas agreed. We'll fall back to camp and prepare for tomorrow, with double guards on duty, in case the snow stops and Rostovan plans a midnight raid. Already working on it, Eyre said with a grin. And tonight, a hot cup of fat will taste mighty good. Damn, even cooked stew will taste good, as long as it's hot. I rather fancied whiskey myself, Nicholas said. His arm ached where he had taken the injury, and the rest of his body let him know it had been hard used. Real luxury would be a steaming hot bath, but there would be nothing like that unless he survived and returned to Glenreath. 
The thought of it made him smile. Majors have already asked to meet with us once camp is set, Ayers reported. Nicholas nodded. Very good. Saves me having to round them up. What else? Trying to figure out how many we lost today, Ayers replied. A lot, but not as bad as it could be. We'll regroup with the Majors and the Taliste when they rise and figure out tomorrow's strategy. I'll send Taliste messengers to Blaine with an update and see if that changes his orders for us. Nicholas gave a feral grin. Maybe the Taliste can even pay a nighttime visit to Rostovan's folks, following up on the ghosts. Ayers chuckled. I like the way you think. Camp was hurriedly pitched, just enough to hold the line and protect soldiers from the elements. The real camp was several miles away, back where they had begun. Nicholas was not about to give up the land they had fought to take, inch by bloody inch. And he was certain that, despite the storm and the ghosts, Rostovan had withdrawn only as far as he had to, with the intent to regain ground lost as soon as possible. Nicholas's tent, when they were in the field, was the same size as those of his soldiers. His only luxury was that, unlike his men, Nicholas had the tent to himself. A bedroll, a small brazier, and a trunk were all the goods he allowed himself for the forward camp. Less to strike when circumstances required hasty action. Unlike his campaign tent, there was no table, no folding chairs, so his guests had to sit on the ground. There was, however, a bottle of whiskey. Nicholas passed it around for his guests to pour a finger or two into their tankards to warm the blood on such a cold night. What in Raqqa happened today? Nicholas asked. What was magic and what was dumb luck? His three senior majors, Rickard, Leif and Sarye, sat facing him. Namus remained outside, watching the magic for any sign of an attack. Ayers was to his right, and Gear had arrived after nightfall with updates from Myrdalor and from the other front, where Blaine and his allies battled Lysander and the Tinger. Rickard and one of our younger mages can move objects from a distance, Leif said. So they threw some fireballs and rocks, anything to cause a problem and spook the horses. We had some large rocks thrown at us, Nicholas said, frowning. Rickard raised his hands, palms out, to forestall blame. Not us, although Quintrell's majors may have copied, or had the same idea themselves. We made sure to work our mayhem a distance from our troops. You can thank Sarye for that, Leif said. She's got an amazing gift for farsight. He was a bookish fellow, more suited to copying manuscripts than serving on the front lines of a war, yet he had volunteered to accompany the troops without hesitation. He looked simultaneously frightened and amazed to be there. Straight, dark hair stuck out at angles beneath the hood of his robe, and his slightly crooked nose gave him a winsome appearance. Did one of you call the ghosts? Nicholas asked. The three majors shook their heads. No, but we knew they were coming. Explain, Nicholas asked. He was tired and sore and cold, and his patience was at an end. Zarye frowned, pausing as she searched for words. The dead are aware of the living, she replied. Not all spirits pass over to the Sea of Souls or wander the unseen realm. Many remain here for a variety of reasons. Some places are more haunted than others. This land, she said, gesturing palm up to indicate the valley, has seen warfare since men first came to the continent. Zarye's expression was sad. The ghosts watch and listen. Magic affects them. I can't dismiss the possibility that the Wraith Lord may also have influence. Whatever the reason, they chose sides. They drove Rostovan back, Eyre said. 
and they killed quite a few of his men. Can they do it again? Zarye looked as if she were listening to something the rest of them could not hear. Then she shook her head. No, at least not on the same scale. They expended nearly all of their power today. It will take them quite a while to build it back up again. It helped that one of the artifacts is a ghost portal, Rickard said. A what? Nicholas snapped. Rickard nodded patiently. They aren't common. I'd heard of them, but never seen one. It's a rather plain-looking piece, like a lady's hand mirror, only with the right magic it can open a door to the other side and make it easier for spirits to pass from that side into our side. Nicholas felt a chill down his spine. Is it secured? he asked. There may be less friendly things waiting to get through. We thought of that, Leave said, and we have it sealed and guarded. That's one of the reasons Namus isn't with us. He's on watch. Nicholas nodded. Very well, go on. The ghosts aren't pleased with Quintrell, Zarye said. She held up a hand to forestall protests. I'm not a necromancer, and I can't easily communicate with spirits. It's more like I listen in to conversations I can't help hearing. Why? Ayers asked. What's Quintrell done? Zarye shrugged. I'm not entirely certain, because the ghosts had no need to explain it to each other. But I gather that he has sacrificed men for magic, sent them to their deaths needlessly. Those spirits are restless and angry. The dead talk among themselves. We may find them to be valuable allies if the opportunity arises. What of the Chaliste? Nicholas asked, looking at Gear. Gear gave a quick recount of how the battle had fared for Blaine, the Solvigs, and Verna, and caught them up on the progress at Myrdalor. So the chamber is ready, as soon as Blaine is able to bring his new lords of the blood, he finished. Not Olin and the others, sure it's safe. Gear gave a short, harsh laugh. Safe? No working of this kind is safe. But everything the mages can find leads us to believe that if Blaine brings his twelve new lords to the chamber, magic can be solidly anchored once more. Nicholas sighed. Sad when that's the best we can get, but I imagine we'll need to settle for it. There's a bit more news to tell, Rickard said. We've stumbled on some things you'll want to hear. Oh, Nicholas asked. The day had gone hard on him, and though the healers bound up his wounds and a good dinner, along with a belt of whiskey, took the edge off, he was exhausted. Leave is a telepath, Rickard said, and Leave nodded in agreement. It's not a flamboyant magic or one that's easy to use in the press of battle, but important nonetheless. Nicholas turned to Leave, who seemed to shrink under scrutiny. What did you learn? I can't throw fire or rocks, Leave began nervously, but I can throw thoughts. That's what I do. I can rummage about in other people's heads, plant ideas, that sort of thing. So I spent most of today trying to find and attack Rostovan and his generals, the maid said. Nicholas smiled. I like what I'm hearing. Go on, he encouraged. It's difficult to pick the right people in such a crowd, Leave said apologetically, but I made enough contact to do a bit of damage. I planted the idea with some of Rostovan's ranking men that you had dangerously powerful mages who could kill with their minds. Leave's cheeks colored. A bit of an exaggeration, that, but I didn't figure it would hurt to inspire a little fear, he chuckled. I touched their minds later, and everything that went wrong for them, they figured we had hocused for them, whether we did or not. Ayers gave a sharp laugh. I like the sound of that. Reeve nodded, gaining confidence. Rostovan himself was difficult. He moved around a lot, and he's got unusually high shields, which makes him hard to read. 
but I picked up something that I think is important. He licked his lips. Quintrell is controlling him with magic. Dark magic. Nicholas leaned forward, fully attentive. Oh? Quintrell has somehow bound a divvy, Gear answered. Everyone swiveled to look at him. Dolan told us this when he returned from Valshoa. He paused. It's an ancient spirit that never should have been summoned, he added. Quintrell thinks he's controlling it, but odds are the Divi is riding Quintrell. What does that have to do with Rostovan? Nicholas asked, confused. Rostovan doesn't know he's been controlled, Leif put in. Quintrell's given him something that lets the Divi manage Rostovan's thoughts and actions. He met Nicholas's gaze. That means that Quintrell is the power to be reckoned with, not Rostovan, he said. And from the glimmers I've picked up from Quintrell, you can count on him being insane. Nicholas exchanged a glance with Ayers. Well now, he said, that's interesting. We're working on how to break the Divi's hold on Rostovan, Rickard said. It's possible that Quintrell has also used some of the Divi's power to put Lysander in thrall. He shrugged. We've heard rumors of late that conversations were had. He shrugged. It's logical. Can you do it? Ayers asked, eyes bright with interest. Can you disrupt whatever this Divi thing is doing? Rickard grimaced. That's the hard part. We're working on it. Divis are old and powerful. They're known for being slippery. We don't have our manuscripts out here in the field, but we're doing what we can. Nicholas nodded. Make it happen. If Rostovan finds out he's been enthralled to Quintrell, we just might see them turn on each other. And wouldn't that be a pretty picture? There's one more thing you need to know, Zarye said. Something in her voice gave Nicholas pause. He looked toward her and met her gaze. What? I touched the minds of Rostovan's mages, Leif said. Just briefly. He met Nicholas's gaze. I picked up fear, distaste, and betrayal. Betrayal? Nicholas asked, raising an eyebrow. Leif nodded. If I'm right, and I only touched their minds for a moment, Rostovan's mages are plotting against him, perhaps even against Quintrell. Are you sure? Nicholas asked. Again, Leif nodded. Yes, I saw a conspiracy. Rostovan is being undermined. We need to be ready to seize the moment when it happens. And hope that whoever's behind the plot doesn't have something worse in mind, Nicholas added. Chapter 29 Watch yourself. More grips are coming, Blaine shouted a warning to Pirin and his men as the leather-winged predators circled their soldiers. The grips shrieked, calling and answering to each other, skirling on the air currents as they sized up their prey. With wings that were easily as far across, tip to tip, as a tall man, sharp talons and a beak meant for rending meat, the grips were nightmare creatures, left over from the wild magic storms. Blaine vowed that once he and his men had eliminated the grips, he would happily slaughter the tinger without a bit of remorse, just for having driven the vicious creatures at him and his troops. He and Nicholas had agreed before the battle that Nicholas would lead one half of the army against Rostovan and Quintrell, trying to shield Blaine from the worst of the effects of magic. Treya Voss's soldiers added much-needed reinforcements. Blaine led the other half of his army, backed up by the armies of the Solviks and Bergen Werner. So here they were, arrayed on a wide open plain, halfway between Glenreath and the Solvik's holdings, facing down the largest army since King Merrill's soldiers went to Merivan. Watch out for the claws! They're poisoned! Pirin called out to the soldiers around them. Behind the front line, archers were readying their arrows. Thanks to Varen's spying, 
Blaine had known in advance that the Tinga had managed to collect and use the creatures in their attacks. And because of Blaine's previous run-ins with the beasts from the magic storms, he and his troops knew how to fight the things. True to her word, Kestel rode with them. Since she was wearing the same dun-colored tunic and trues as the other soldiers, with her red hair bound up beneath a helm, and her figure flattened by a hard leather cuirass, no one would be likely to give her a second look among the thousands of soldiers. That would be a mistake. Two bandoliers crossed her chest, each arrayed with dozens of dirks, throwing knives, and wicked circular blades. She wore two swords, and both a staff and a bow were lashed to her saddle, along with a quiver filled with arrows and a covered bucket filled with pitch. We need those flaming arrows now, Blaine shouted, fighting back the assault. Blaine could only guess how the Tinger managed to trap the grips or tie heavy stone weights to the talent feet, but he figured magic played a role. The weights were light enough that the grips could still fly, and heavy enough to keep them near the ground, where they could be herded toward an enemy. From the bright glow coming from the Tingo line, Blaine bet the beasts had been prodded toward their objective with fire. Well then, we're about to start prodding back, he muttered. One of the grips dove at Blaine, grabbing for his shoulder with its sharp talons. He barely evaded a nasty slice, and slashed with his sword, scoring a deep cut on the leathery talons. Foul-smelling ichor dripped from the wound. Steel glinted in the air, and one of Kestel's knives buried itself hilt-deep in the grip's side, forcing the creature to draw back and limiting the use of one wing. Blaine and Perrin each carried lances with torch-like tips soaked in resin and burning brightly. They spurred their frightened horses onward, charging at the grips with their flaming pikes. Normally, the grips would have arced high into the sky to evade them, but slowed and anchored by the heavy stone weights, the winged predators had limited mobility. I guess the Tinga found a disposable front line of their own, Pirin muttered. Hobbled as the grips were by the weights, killing them was easier than in the wild, though hardly without danger. But Pirin was right. The only purpose for using the magic beasts in battle was to wear down the enemy before the Tinger advanced, just as Lysander used the Tinger to protect his real soldiers. Blaine stabbed at the grip with his lance, taking grim satisfaction at the way the beast screeched at the flames. The grip flapped its wings madly. One of the foot soldiers dove for the heavy stone, anchoring the grip further with his own weight. Get him, sir! I'll hold him! The soldier shouted, ducking to avoid the thing's talons. Lance in his left hand, anchored against his body, Blaine charged again, sword ready. Unable to fly, terrorized by the flames, the grip tried and failed to snatch at the lance. Kestel sank two blades deep into the grip's body, one at the joint of its left wing, and another in its belly. Blaine stabbed the lance deep into the grip's gut, following through with a sword strike that tore its wing from top to bottom like a rune sail. Pushed backward by the momentum of Blaine's horse, the grip flailed, and the soldier beneath it threw the rope-wrapped stone, managing to tangle the grip's talons in its own ballast. The creature fell heavily to the ground as the lance's fire burned it inside. The thing gave one last, ear-splitting shriek and collapsed. Blaine made sure of its death by bringing his horse's hooves down on its body, crunching bone. One down, he muttered, though at least a half dozen more still filled the sky. A foot soldier to the left of Blaine screamed as a grip raked him with its talons, opening bloody gashes from shoulder to thigh. Another of the soldiers battled back one grip, only to have a second snatch him up with its razor-sharp claws, tearing him with its beak. Down the line, grips flew at the soldiers with talons out and beaks jabbing. 
The heavy stone weights added to the grip's deadly arsenal, since the panicked beasts gyred and swooped awkwardly, trailing the swinging stones as they went. The weight stones toppled two hapless soldiers, who could not scramble out of the way quickly enough, sending them sprawling in a spray of blood as the heavy stones connected with skull and bone. We're losing men, and the real fighting hasn't even started yet. Blaine grumbled. I think that's the point. Piran responded. Three flaming arrows soared into the air over the injured soldier's head. Two of the arrows ripped through the skin of the grip's wings, but the beast managed to twist enough to evade the third arrow. Volley after volley of flaming arrows filled the sky as the grips beat their wings furiously to get away. Crowing a victory cry, Piran copied what Blaine had done, charging at the grip with his lance while a soldier secured the anchor. The battle cry echoed down the line as horsemen leveled their flaming lances and rode for the grips as foot soldiers in twos and threes ran to tackle the stone weights. The grips shrieked and screamed, beating the air with their wings. But between the fiery pikes and the flaming arrows, the battle had turned. Blaine shook the ichor and soot from his vambraces and turned to survey the fighting. Kestel had slipped down from her horse and was calmly retrieving as many of her blades from the fallen grips as she could find, cleaning off the ichor on the dry grass. What's in the name of Torven are those things? A soldier near Blaine shouted in alarm. Beetle-like creatures the size of wild pigs skittered across the dry grass. Some of the beasts stopped long enough to rip flesh from the dying grips, but the others, alerted to the presence of fresh prey by the soldiers' movements, swarmed toward the advancing line. There were too many to count, but Blaine guessed that there had to be at least fifty of the things, and untrammeled by stone weights, the creatures moved much faster than the grips had done. They're mastids, Blaine shouted, and they hate fire as much as the grips. We've got more coming, Piran yelled, pointing to the strip of land between their forces and the Tinger. And there's something else. Are those Rannin? That's sure what they look like, Blaine said, refreshing the pitch and batting on his torch and lighting it afire. Kestel had swung up onto her horse once more and was readying her bow with pitch-tipped arrows. Pale, crab-like creatures scuttled among the mestids. If the mestids were the size of wild hogs, then the rannan were mastiff-sized, with oval bodies and bone-like carapaces. Six-jointed legs clicked with every movement, tipped in sharp claws that looked as lethal as the grip's talons. The rannan clattered their way toward the soldiers nearly as fast as the trotting horse, slashing at the slower mestids with their jointed legs. There are too many of them, coming too fast, one of the soldiers near Blaine shouted. Blaine looked down the line at the soldiers, grimly braced for the onslaught, and a desperate idea formed. Light the grass, Blaine shouted. We want a line of fire, do it! Blaine used his flaming lance to catch the dry grass of the battlefield on fire. Then he braced his lance like a pike behind the flames. Smoke rose in the cold air as the burning line spread down the front lines, and the archers shot one volley after another to rain fire down on the beasts. The clicking of the rannan's carapaces and the clatter of the mestard's snapping claws and jointed legs filled the air. The winter grasses caught quickly, and the fire spread rapidly. Confronted with a wall of flame, the mestids and rannan clattered to a halt, squawking and hissing. A gust of wind angled the flames toward them, and the creatures retreated, only to come into better range of the archers. Piran sheathed his sword and grabbed the crossbow from his saddle. Down the line, Blaine spotted Borja and Desia doing the same, standing in their stirrups, taking aim. The crossbow thudded, and a burning quarrel streaked through the air, catching one of the mestids at the jointed place where its front leg met its body. The arrow went deep, engulfing the mestid in fire. The insect-like creature screeched and scuttled backward, causing the other mestids and rannan to draw back from the flames. 
Already its body was beginning to split with the heat, and an awful smell filled the air as the mastid exploded. Another quarrel struck a ranin. The razor-sharp tip split the carapace and embedded itself deeply. Six legs flailed in vain as flames hissed, engulfing it in fire. Crossbows were able to pierce the heavy exoskeletons, and for every mestid or ranin that was felled by the quarrels, two or three abandoned their attack to gorge themselves on the smoking remains of the creatures as soon as the flames were extinguished. Scrambling up the dead bodies of its comrades, one of the ranin launched itself at Blaine, managing to get its body briefly airborne to avoid the flames. Kestel lobbed one of her circular knives, a blade with sharp teeth like a saw blade, and it ripped easily through the ranin's shell, spraying the ground with ichor as the beast fell, its legs clawing and spasming. The bowman quickly realized that regular arrows could not penetrate the beast's natural armor, so they shot wave after wave of flaming arrows into the dry grass among the attackers, until the swath of land was engulfed in fire and the bitter, acrid smell of their burning flesh and shells filled the air with a choking haze of smoke. Halted by the fire, panicked by the stench, the mestids and ranin ran. Flaming arrows pursued them until they were beyond archer's range, sending the creatures back in a deadly wave toward the tinger who had loosened them. Blaine took grim satisfaction in hearing the screams and shouts of the tinger as the tide of enraged creatures swarmed toward them. To the left, Blaine could see that the Solvig army had begun to hem in the tinger, while Vernon's forces flanked them on the other side. As the fire burned out near Blaine's front line, his troops advanced, and his archers continued shooting their fire-tipped arrows just behind the mestids and Rannan, forcing them to overrun the tinger. With nowhere to run, the Tinga had no choice except to battle their own monsters, aware that once the beasts had taken their toll, soldiers awaited to finish the job. Unprepared, without ready access to fiery arrows or flaming pikes, the panic-stricken beasts caught up with the front line of Tinga as the rest fled for their lives. Lysander's biding his time, Blaine said, as Pirin rode up beside him. Perrin's clothing was torn and soot-streaked, and Blaine guessed he looked much the same. Perrin nodded. This was just the warm-up. Too bad we can't use the same tactic and have the Tinga turn on Lysander's troops. Something's happened. Look, Blaine said and pointed. Pursued by the stampeding creatures, the Tinga fled toward Lysander's main army line. Yet even from here... Blaine could see that if the Tinger expected protection, their hopes were in vain. Lysander's soldiers blocked the Tinger's escape at Sword's Point, giving them the choice between fighting the creatures and being cut down by their own side. I guess Lysander doesn't want to dirty his hands dealing with the beasts, Blaine said, glad that the Tinger's folly gave his own side a chance to catch their breath. Blackened grass and charred carapaces of dead monsters covered the open stretch between the opposing armies. A glance down his own line assured Blaine that, although his vanguard had taken some damage in the fight, few of his soldiers had been seriously injured or killed. Hang on, Blaine said. Here it comes. Bellowing a war cry, Lysander's main forces charged toward the defender's line. Horsemen led the way, with infantry not far behind. They rode through the battle between the Tinger and the beasts, trampling those who got in their way. With an answering shout of their own, Blaine led their charge. The Solvigs and Verna followed a moment later. Lysander's army bore no resemblance to the motley Tinger. Well-armed and well-armored, the attacking army moved with the skill of practiced fighters, and unlike the hapless Tinger, who had been carried into battle on raw emotion, it was obvious from the first sword strike that Lysander's soldiers had a plan. War horses thundered down the plain, 
foot soldiers ran between the big horses, swords at the ready to engage. On horseback, Blaine had the advantage, and he used it to cut his way through the onslaught. Four men fell in quick succession, spattering Blaine's legs and his horse with blood. Faces blurred as they rushed past him, but Blaine realized that many of Lysander's soldiers did not have the look of Donderan men. With a jolt, he realized that the warlord's army included recruits, or mercenaries, from the enemy kingdom whose mages had brought down the great fire and the cataclysm on them all. Piran came to the same conclusion, and rage colored his features. Bloody Merovan mercs, Piran shouted, following up with a string of obscenities. Piran was fighting a large man who was armed with a war axe, and it was taking all of Piran's skills to stay out of the way of the heavy axe long enough to get in a few strikes of his own. Blaine faced down his own opponent, a seasoned warrior on a massive war horse, whose barrage of sword blows gave Blaine little time to worry about Piran. Blaine fended off the strikes, but he could feel the fatigue from the fight with the magicked beasts already taking its toll. He was mindful of the agate amulet at his throat, a talisman that deflected and minimized the drain of magic, but did not remove it altogether. Remembering Carr's savaged features and tortured body ignited Blaine's anger, dispelling any tiredness, and he let that rage warm his body and drive him onward. Strike, parry, strike, block. Blaine and his opponent circled each other warily, each sizing up the other's strength, speed, and skill. Blaine saw cunning and dead-cold ruthlessness in the soldier's eyes, and he wondered what the other man made of him. Out of the corner of his eye, Blaine could see two other soldiers heading for him, but he dared not take his attention away from the man he battled. His opponent landed a strike that got inside Blaine's guard, slashing down on his vambrace. But it was blocked by the heavy leather before it could damage skin and bone. Blaine swung, slicing into his attacker's arm, deep enough that the man drew back, but not far enough. Blaine dug his heels into his horse's sides, and his mount jolted forward. Blaine angled his sword, and the horse's motion drove it into the gap above his attacker's cuirass, deep into the man's throat. Blood bubbled and gurgled as the soldier shuddered, alive enough to know he was dying quickly. The soldier's horse panicked and bolted, nearly tearing Blaine's sword from his hand. His opponent clung to the saddle for a few strides, then toppled from his mount as the terrified horse galloped away. Kestel had loosed her horse, and on foot she was deadly with her throwing knives, moving nimbly enough to evade the horses and ducking in and out of the action. Down the line, Blaine could spot Borea and Desia standing in their saddles, firing their bows with lethal aim. The twins galloped towards the enemy in a two-man offensive that took Lysander's soldiers completely by surprise for its boldness. Too late, as the astonished soldiers began to drop to the ground, arrows in their chests, did their companions realize that the twins posed a true threat. Some of Piran's cursing was in Merovinian, the native tongue of the Mercs, which seemed to rattle his opponent. To Blaine's knowledge, Piran's fluency was limited to obscenities, but he could hold his own in at least half a dozen dialects. He switched between languages, keeping up a steady stream of curses. It's not enough for your mages to burn down the continent, Piran shouted as he landed a crazed series of sword strikes. Now you've got to sell your swords to muck up what's left. The speed of his blows, coupled with the unpredictability of his strikes, as rage fueled his fighting, managed to get Piran inside his enemy's guard, and with a triumphant slash, he opened the soldier's belly. Take your guts and your stinking Merovan shit back across the border, Piran screamed. By now, the forefront of the battle had passed them by, and both Blaine and Piran slipped from their mounts, preferring the maneuverability of being on foot. 
they sent their horses running for the rear lines. Kestel joined them, and Blaine looked across the battlefield, taking advantage of a momentary lull. Far to one side, he glimpsed the Solvig's forces, which appeared to be holding their own. To the other side, where Werner's son, Bergen, led his father's troops, it was harder to tell which side was currently winning. One thing Blaine was sure of was that the wind had picked up. Temperature's dropping, Pirin noted. Sky isn't looking good, Kestel added with a glance upward. Dark grey clouds had massed, promising snow. Zaye said there would be storms. One more thing that anchoring the magic might fix, Blaine thought. I could do without this, Pirin grumbled. It's not like I was homesick for Edgeland. Blaine heartily agreed, eyeing the storm clouds warily. The battle was far from over, and an incoming storm would make it all the more miserable and unpredictable. Trouble, Kestel said, and Blaine turned to see three of Lysander's soldiers running toward them. The battle had shifted once more, coming back over the same few feet of ground it had just yielded, and Blaine knew they could take and lose the same thin stretch many more times before the day was over, at the cost of many lives. In the distance, Blaine could hear his captains shouting orders, and saw the units respond as he and Nicholas had trained them. We're holding our own, he thought. Let's see if it lasts. His hand went to finger the magic-deflecting amulet at his throat. True to Rickard's word, the amulet had pushed aside the worst of the magic they had faced. All morning, Blaine had been alert for signs of magic, though he hoped that the mages had stayed with Rostovan and Quintrell. Lysander was known to be sceptical, even hostile toward magic, and Blaine wholeheartedly hoped that rumour was true. So far, no major magic had been worked nearby, but surely that was unlikely to last the entire battle, and Blaine lacked assurance that the amulet could completely avert magic's effects or protect him from its drain. Blaine's attacker came at him with a morning star, swinging the spiked iron ball from its chain with one hand, while he jabbed and thrust with a sword in the other. Blaine backed up a step and nearly fell over a corpse, but he glimpsed a metal shield in the dead man's hand, and snatched it up in time to block the deadly morning star's strike. The ball hit the shield with a loud clang, leaving a dent Blaine was thankful was not in his helm or skull. Piran took the offensive, charging his opponent before the fighter expected it. With his bald head, loud voice, and wild-eyed grimace, Piran looked like a maniac, and his penchant for risky moves made him unpredictable. Swearing in several different languages, with curses that would have shamed the most hardened brigands, Pirin came at his attacker with a berserker's frenzy. He landed three blows before the astonished soldier got his guard up, scoring a deep cut in his opponent's shoulder, a gash to the man's thigh, and a slice across his chest. Kestel and the third man stalked each other warily. The attacker, eager for a fight, fainted to draw Kestel's strike, but she read the attempt for what it was and went in the other direction, moving inside the man's guard to score a deep puncture in his left shoulder. Enraged, the enemy soldier came after her with several pounding blows. Kestel parried the first blow, then leapt backward over a fallen corpse to get beyond the man's reach as his swing went wild. Even angrier now, the soldier stepped over the dead man and raised his sword for the kill. The movement left his chest open, and Kestel dodged out of reach of his sword. With a flick of her wrist, one dagger caught the soldier in his sword arm, while the second dagger buried itself deep in his chest. He fell across the corpse, and Kestel kicked his sword out of reach, then retrieved her blades, stopping to slit his throat before she cleaned the weapons on the dead man's cloak. Blaine parried his attacker's sword, feeling the force of the blow reverberate up his arm. The morning star swung again, and once more Blaine deflected it with the shield, 
but the sharp points dug deep into the metal, and when the fighter yanked back his weapon, it jerked the shield from Blaine's hand, nearly breaking his fingers. His opponent chuckled, thrusting with his sword and almost getting inside Blaine's guard. The soldier's hands drew back, readying to let the morning star fly once more. Blaine grabbed a broken pike from a dead soldier's hand and blocked the deadly blow, tangling the chain and jerking the weapon out of his attacker's hand. Blaine thrust forward, and his sword caught the soldier in the middle of the chest, dragging the blade down through his belly. The soldier gave one more savage swing with his sword, opening a deep cut on Blaine's shoulder before Blaine knocked it away with the broken pike and slammed the wooden pole against the attacker's head, dropping him to the ground. Piran was making short work of his own opponent. The soldier tried to parry, but Piran's wild attack had rattled him badly. Cursing creatively, Piran scored a two-handed hit that cleaved the man from shoulder to chest. And your mother was a poxy whore, Piran finished as he stepped back from the dead man, breathing hard. Bad form to keep insulting them after they're dead, Piran, Kestel said. That's the problem, Kestel. You've already heard all my good insults, Piran replied. I've got to try them out on someone. Snow was falling, a few flakes at first, and then rapidly growing into a steady, heavy downfall. Coupled with the wind, it limited visibility, making it difficult to see where the next attack might come from. Something's happening, Blaine said, pointing. Lysander's troops were falling back, though the battle was far from decided. Not far enough for a retreat, but enough to put a few clear feet of space between themselves and Blaine's troops. Nice of them to give us a rest, Perrin quipped suspiciously. A sudden pounding in Blaine's head nearly made him cry out. Watch yourselves, Blaine warned as one hand went to the pendant. Kestel stepped closer and grabbed his arm, and immediately the effect lessened, a benefit of the null talisman she wore. Now would you look at that, Piran said in a wondering voice. Blaine and Kestel turned, and Blaine lost contact with Kestel's grip. Piran was staring at the snow, and he reached a hand toward the snow as if to grab something that only he could see. Blaine frowned, then caught a glimpse of something in the curtain of shimmering snow. Shadows became faces, and Blaine gasped in recognition. His mother, Carenza, servants long dead, whom he had known since childhood. His hated father, Carr. Carr's image triggered a jolt of rage, and Blaine blinked rapidly, struggling against the vision. He gripped the pendant tightly, and the vision blurred, sliding away from him as if the magic-dampening amulet had broken the spell. Kestel's touch on his arm cleared his head, and when he looked once more, the images were gone. Kestel grabbed Piran's arm, and he shook free of the illusion. They're regrouping, and they're going to attack while our men are wool-gathering, Blaine said, glancing around wildly. Noise! We've got to make noise! Blaine grabbed his dented shield and the broken pike and began to hammer on the metal, shouting at the top of his lungs, Wake up! They're coming! Piran snatched up three or four tin cups that had littered the battlefield, dropped or knocked from their owner's belts. Holding them overhead, he slammed them together over and over again as his rough voice carried over the wind. Kestel ripped the dented helm from one of the dead men and began to beat on it with the wooden handle of a fallen war hammer. Danger, she shouted. Move! Blaine and Kestel ran along the line in one direction while Perrin ran in the other, setting up as loud a clamor as they could muster. Blaine's head felt as if it would explode, both from the magic and from the cacophony. All around them, men roused from their vision, and the illusion faded. Lysander's troops, cheated of their easy victory, readied for the charge, but this time 
Blaine and his men beat them to it. Perhaps the illusion reminded the men too well of what they had lost, or who was left behind. Or maybe, tired, cold, and injured, they were ready for a fair fight without tricks. Whatever the reason, Blaine and Pirin led the advance, rallying their spent troops behind them, swords in hand. Kestel snared the reins from a riderless horse and swung up to the saddle. Bordia and Desir rallied the soldiers, much like they had long ago herded errant livestock on the flatlands of their boyhood. Buoyed by rage, Blaine's troops closed the distance between themselves and Lysander's soldiers, fighting all out and ready for vengeance. Snow fell harder than before, and the wind sent icy gusts, reducing visibility a few inches. It was unlikely either side could prevail in these conditions. Blaine heard Lysander's commanders call retreat. Hold your ground, Blaine ordered, and the command echoed down the line. Hold steady! It was a fool's bargain to keep on fighting in this storm, and both Blaine and Lysander knew it. They would each lose as many men to exposure as to battle, and with no ability to see farther than the hand on one's arm, no strategy could suffice. Blaine had no doubt that Lysander and his men would return just as soon as the weather cleared. Are we certain majors can't affect the weather? Kestel asked, riding up to join him. Blaine shrugged. So we've been told. If the storms really are a reaction to the old magic, then let's hope no one's foolish enough to add to the problem. I doubt this storm at least was sent by either side, Pirin agreed. After all, who benefited? Not Lysander. He was forced to retreat. Not us. We might have won the day if it hadn't started storming. He shook his head. All the same, the sooner you get the magic straightened out, the happier we'll all be, and the longer we're likely to live. Chapter 30 how will you know when it's done? Connor looked around the ritual chamber at Myrdalor and shook his head. No one would mistake the large underground chamber for anything but a mage's lair. Torches in the sconces along the walls lit the huge windowless room. In the center of the open space, an elaborate labyrinth had been set into the rock, a twisting pathway that took up most of the area leaving a narrow path along the outside. The labyrinth had wider areas at intervals along its route, thirteen of them, Connor counted. The spaces would be just wide enough for a man to stand and a candle to burn. Along the walls of the chamber, sigils were marked into the stone, and Connor was certain that each marking had a match with one of the thirteen obsidian discs held by the Lords of the Blood. We can't be completely certain until Macfadden walks the path and attempts to call down the magic onto his chosen lords of the blood, Dolan replied. But the magic is no longer wild, like what Macfadden countered on his first unfortunate attempt. Connor had heard the details of that attempt and knew how close Blaine and the others had come to dying. Whoever created the Myrdalore ritual chamber did not want interlopers. What is it you want of us? Connor's voice asked the question, but Dolan recognized the Wraith Lord's presence. You are one of the thirteen lords, Dolan answered, meaning Kirken Vanthold, the man who became the Wraith Lord. With Connor's help, you will participate again. You're the only one who has walked this labyrinth as a lord of the blood, other than Macfadden, and the only survivor of the old ritual. He paused. I would ask you to walk to your place in the path. Just walk, and tell me what you feel. The Wraith Lord chuckled. Anxious to rid yourself of me, Dolan. Dolan looked aghast. No, my lord, and for safety's sake, you'll carry neither presence crystal nor your disc. 
Our mages have walked the path and felt very little stirring of power. We fear we will only get one opportunity, and we have a minimum of information on which to draw. Are you willing? The Wraith Lord asked in Connor's mind, since I require your body to comply with the request. So long as we don't get burned to a cinder or blown apart, I'm willing, Connor replied. I didn't come this far to let Blaine fail. Connor had recovered from his battle wounds. As the Wraith Lord and Penhallow had promised him, his recovery was much faster than before Penhallow strengthened the Kruf Galdor. Then again, the injuries were that much worse because I was able to withstand them, Connor thought. Prudently, the Wraith Lord did not comment. What precautions have you taken? Penhallow asked. He gave Connor a cautionary glance. When Connor had staggered back after the battle, more dead than alive, Penhallow had just been rising from his crypt. He had looked on worriedly as the healers labored, but Connor had declined more of Penhallow's blood since the wounds were serious but not mortal. Connor was still trying to decide whether when the day eventually came that his injuries were beyond healing, he would accept Penhallow's offer of immortality. So far, he had thought no, but he was well aware the decision might look different when the moment was finally upon him. We've worked with extreme caution, Dolan assured him. Mortal Antaliste mages have warded the chamber inside and the structure outside. We have validated the translations of the manuscripts we seized from Quintrell, as well as those we took from the crypts beneath Quilloth Castle and the Citadel. Penhallow nodded. Very well. What of the presence crystals? We believe Quintrell has been affected by a corrupted artifact. Are you sure, Dolan, that none of the taint affects the crystals? He looked toward the crystals which lay in a row on a narrow work table in the rear of the chamber. Even from this distance, Connor could see a faint, pulsing glow. Dolan hesitated. We've tested to the best of our ability, he said, but it's worrisome that Quintrell acquired a divvy just at the time the crystals came to light. What's a divvy? Connor asked, pushing himself to the forefront of his consciousness for a moment. Penhallow frowned. Taliste are not the only immortals, nor are we the most dangerous, no matter what you may think. Divvies are old spirits, perhaps old enough to have walked this world when it was formless and barren. He seemed to carefully weigh his words before continuing. They're not evil, not the way you would mean the word. They just don't care about anything that gets in their way. Power is what they crave. Valuing the lives of mortals and even those of Taliste doesn't factor into their thinking. He met Connor's gaze. When you go for a walk, do you intend to step on small insects, crush the life out of plants? Does that give you joy? He asked. Of course not, Connor retorted. Penhallow nodded. Now imagine being the insect. Your intent, the fact that you didn't leave home looking forward to killing the insect and that you weren't going to enjoy it, wouldn't matter, would it? Connor took a moment to think about it, then shook his head. No, I suppose not. To the divvies, we are the insects, the beetle accidentally trodden underfoot, on the way to achieving control. No harm meant does not mean no harm done, Penhallow replied. Is Quintrell strong enough to bind such a spirit? Connor asked, eyes widening. Penhallow gave a shrug, and even the Wraith Lord did not seem to know. Doubtful, Penhallow said. More likely the Divi has bound Quintrell without him knowing it. I would not be surprised that the old Valshoans had knowledge of many things lost to us now. They did, Dolan said, 
breaking his silence. And they dabbled in things mortals, and perhaps immortals, ought not to touch. I thought that my knights had destroyed or hidden those things. He grimaced. Obviously, we did not succeed. Penhallow shook his head. Don't blame yourself. When a spirit such as a divvy wishes to be found, it will arrange for it to happen. Divvies are conscious and sentient, and the effects of their actions on weaker creatures do not concern them. Connor shuddered. The thought that the divvies were powerful enough to group Talishte and mortals together in their view of weak was something he did not want to dwell on. Could a divvy mislead a mage of Dolan's strength? Connor asked. Dolan gave a shrug. It's possible. It would be quite presumptuous to declare myself too experienced to be fooled. It's certain that a divvy misled Quintrell, because I doubt even he would give himself over to such a spirit if he knew the true cost. Connor felt a chill go down his back. Which is? he asked. Dolan met his gaze. Divvies feed on the energy of a soul. The parasites. Quintrell is being consumed little by little. No bargain is worth that. Connor agreed, but he wondered if Quintrell himself would consider any cost too high. What does Quintrell get out of the deal? He asked. Dolan grimaced. When we left Valashoa, Quintrell plans to have his majors put a gash on Rostovan to assure that he would do Quintrell's bidding. Which would give Quintrell his own army, Penhallow replied, and it appears to have worked. The Wraith Lord directed Connor's attention to the presence crystals. Quintrell declared the crystals to be the solution to anchoring the magic, he said. But how? The crystals are the connection, so to speak, between the power that flows through the nodes and meridians in the ground and the instructions to bind the power that's contained in the disks. Dolan replied, gesturing toward the crystals. We believe that each time the power has been bound, other objects have formed that connection. Perhaps the ritual destroys the connecting objects, we don't know what was used before. Carved stone wands, the Wraith Lord replied. That's what we carried four centuries ago when the working was done. I did not make the association with the crystals until now. The Wraith Lord directed Connor to point toward the labyrinth. We each had a thick agate wand with runes carved into it he recalled. They cracked top to bottom when the magic was bound, and since they were no use after that, I assume they were discarded. Dolan nodded. Thank you. That confirms what I suspected. Are you ready? The Wraith Lord asked Connor, who nodded. Let's take that walk into the labyrinth now, he said to Dolan. Since only Macfadden and I are tied by bloodline to the prior workings, what say I return to the spot I filled the last time? For your safety, let me remain in control. The Wraith Lord warned Connor. I don't trust Quintrell. Neither do I. The Wraith Lord chuckled. Then we are agreed. The Wraith Lord walked to the opening of the labyrinth and paused. He took a deep breath, letting it steady Connor's nerves. While the Wraith Lord might not have needed the breath, Connor certainly did. Carefully, the Wraith Lord entered the labyrinth, watching his steps so that he did not tread outside of the pathway. I feel magic building, Connor thought. Just a fraction of what will happen when the ritual is worked, the Wraith Lord replied but dangerous nonetheless. He paused each time the path widened, and in those spots 
Connor could see sigils etched into the rock. They matched the marking on the wall behind that spot, and he was certain there would be corresponding marks on each lord's obsidian disc. With every step that took them deeper into the labyrinth, Connor felt magic like a heavy blanket around him. No chanting or drumming sounded. No candles burned along the pathway. No ritual was enacted. And yet, power was undeniable. Connor was relieved when they halted halfway into the labyrinth. This is the spot, the Wraith Lord said. Can you feel power rising? Dolan asked. Nidhud and Dagger had joined Dolan. Yes, don't let more mages enter. I fear it would feed the energy. The Wraith Lord cautioned. Dolan turned toward the door and shook his head. Connor guessed that the other mages had gathered, hoping to see what transpired. Can you sense anything about the power? Dolan questioned. You're the only eyewitness we've got. It was a long time ago, the Wraith Lord replied. Dolan nodded. Yes, but please think. Does the power feel right to you? The Wraith Lord held Connor completely still. Every mortal sense on alert, as well as the Wraith Lord's heightened Teliste senses. Connor could hear his heart beating, and his breath seemed to echo in the stone chamber. Yet, as he listened to the power, as he focused his attention on it, he realized something was off. No, the Wraith Lord said, it doesn't. I'm getting Connor out of here right now. Even from a distance, Connor could see that one of the crystals pulsed more quickly than the others as it lay on the work table. Twelve of the crystals glowed a muted golden. One throbbed a crimson color that began the shade of fresh blood and was growing deeper by the instant. Can't we turn back? Connor asked, doing his best to remain calm. That's not how the labyrinth works, the Wraith Lord replied. Moving inward winds the power up, moving outward releases the power. Even though this isn't the real working, power has been called, and power must be dispelled. Otherwise... The Wraith Lord did not finish his sentence, but he didn't have to. Connor understood that the outcome would not be to his liking. On the way into the labyrinth, the path had not seemed narrow. Now that the Wraith Lord was trying to navigate it quickly and without error, Connor felt as if it had become almost heel to toe, though the stone had not changed. Connor gave himself over to the Talishta reflexes and dexterity of the Wraith Lord. Even so, he moved with caution, faster than a mortal, but hardly at full Talishta speed. Connor felt magic tingle on his skin, raising the hair on his arms and prickling on the back of his neck. Even with the Wraith Lord's presence, the farther into the labyrinth they went, the harder it was to walk, like trudging through hip-deep water. Connor labored to breathe, and his heart thudded in his throat. The temperature in the chamber plummeted until Connor's nose and fingertips were numb. Hurry, he urged the Wraith Lord. I am endeavoring to do so. The area outside the labyrinth had become blurred, as if Connor were looking through fogged glass. Still, he could tell that Dolan and the other mages huddled around the presence crystals. One of the crystals has been corrupted, the Wraith Lord said. Can a divvy's power extend this far? We're nowhere close to Quintrell. The divvy only need to be present once to do the damage, the Wraith Lord replied. Plane will need the crystals to anchor the magic. If even one is corrupted, it will not be our problem if we don't escape the maze. The Wraith Lord's voice was clipped, and Connor fell silent. Voices hummed all around them. At first, Connor took it for the worried conversation of Dagger, Nidhud, and Dolan. 
bending over the tainted crystal. Then he realized there were too many voices to belong to the mages. The voices echoed from all over the chamber, growing in number until the whispers and chants clamored in his head. Can you hear them? Only through your gift, the Wraith Lord said. Listen to them, Connor. They may be our salvation. What do they want? Connor strained to hear the murmurs clearly. Some spoke in accents strange to him, choosing words Connor had seen only in old manuscripts. Ghosts, he thought. It's not enough to be possessed by one spirit. Now the dead are coming out of the rocks to have a go at it. Yet as Connor listened, the voices grew distinct, clearer. He did not fear them trying to seize his body. With the Wraith Lord in possession, that was not likely. The ghosts were calling to him, urging him on, leading him out of the labyrinth. As he reached the center and began the return leg of the maze, the voices grew stronger, and their forms began to take shape all along the outside of the labyrinth. Power crackled in the air. Even with the Wraith Lord's control, he nearly stumbled, feeling as if the maze pulled life and breath from him. Live mages had joined their ghostly counterparts, and Connor realized that they were fighting to dispel the miasma projected by the tainted crystal. Only a bit more, the Wraith Lord said, and Connor could hear the strain in Van Holt's voice. If this had occurred to someone not possessed by a spirit of your strength, Connor began, that person would be dead, the Wraith Lord finished. Connor knew that the Wraith Lord's strength was sustaining him. Breath burned in his lungs from cold and exertion. His legs cramped from the straining against the invisible force that did not want them to escape the maze. Blood welled beneath his fingertips as he dug his nails into his palms, willing himself to move. Yet, with every step that wound them out of the labyrinth, Connor could breathe a little easier. Halfway out, and the air had grown a bit warmer, though it was still frigid even for a subterranean chamber. The voices of the ghosts were clearer and louder now, and the chants of the living majors seemed to cut a path for him through the force that wanted to trap him within the maze. Step by labored step, they struggled to reach the end of the labyrinth. Just an arm's length to go, and the vortex of power around the maze made one final surge to keep him captive. It took all of the Wraith Lord's strength to hurl Connor across the threshold. Behind them, the ghosts closed ranks, sealing off the labyrinth's exit. For a moment, Connor lay panting on the cold stone. Then he realized that, although he was out of the labyrinth, the power had not abated, nor had the freezing cold air warmed. An answer impressed itself on him, spoken by ghostly whispers. Connor knew what he had to do. Let the mages handle this, the Wraith Lord urged. If they could, it would be handled by now. Connor snapped, unwilling to hesitate lest he lose his nerve. You don't know this will work. You can't say it won't. Connor challenged. Dagger, Dolan, and Nidhud looked at Connor with alarm as he approached the table where the presence crystals lay. One of them flared red, and the other's glow intensified so that the twelve pulsed together in a different rhythm from that of the crimson crystal. The ghosts have a plan, Connor said, pushing past the mages. We've tried to counter it with all the different skills of magic we have among us, Dagger replied. Let an immortal handle this, Connor, Dolan said, trying to block Connor's path. Connor moved around him. I have the Wraith Lord with me, and the ghosts. They're all immortal. Dolan grimaced. You can still die. So can Blaine, and that's what will happen if we can't cleanse the thirteenth crystal, Connor said. Now, move out of my way. To a surprise, Dolan yielded stepping back from the table. 
The mages drew away as the ghosts rushed forward. Dozens had become hundreds, though where they came from or how they knew to gather, Connor had no idea. Penhallow stepped up behind him. I will do what I can to help, Penhallow said. Let's hope your ghosts are strong enough. If the crystal is controlled by one spirit, let's see whether a hundred ghosts can crowd it out, Connor thought grimly. Afraid that the Divi's power would try to push him back as it had hampered him in the labyrinth, Connor made a dive for the red crystal. As his hands closed around its cool surface, he opened his mind to the ghosts. Fill me, he said. Seize the stone. Spirits too numerous to count washed over him, entering his consciousness, streaming past the Wraith Lord and through Connor's skin into the pulsing crystal. Never had he felt so much power flood his senses. Lifetimes blurred as the dead passed through his thoughts too quickly to grasp, leaving a shadow of themselves behind. At the core of his being, Connor's essence clung to the spirit of the Wraith Lord like a man awash in a flood tide. The Divi was not fully present in the crystal, yet the shred of itself tainting the stone was more than mere memory or the remnant of a spell. Souls poured through Connor's veins, seeped through his skin channeled by bone and sinew, through his hands into the glowing crystal. The Divi howled in rage and for a moment Connor feared it would swell to its full power and retake the presence crystal. Ghost after ghost crowded the stone, forcing out the divvy's power, and breath by breath the crimson glare began to fade. The rush of spirits pulled at Connor's soul, and had the Wraith Lord not managed to anchor him, Connor was afraid he might have been hollowed, his essence drawn out from him, leaving his body an empty husk. Kirken van Hult held on to him like a man caught in the storm surge, clinging to Connor even when the pain grew unbearable and Connor begged for death. Teeth pierced Connor's arm, and as blood flowed, the Kruvgaldor pushed to the forefront, binding Connor to his body and to his master. Joined by blood, Penhallo lent his strong, old spirit to the effort. The Divi shrieked in rage and pain one last time, and then was gone. Connor opened his eyes. Clutched in his hands so tightly he was not sure he could release his grip, the presence crystal glowed with golden light. All around him, the ghosts poured from the crystal, relinquishing it now that their task was finished. Connor felt the Kruvgaldor bond recede, though Penhallow remained as vivid a presence in his mind as the Wraith Lord. Strong arms encircled Connor from behind as gentle hands pried his fingers away from the cleansed crystal. Let go, Bevan. You did well. It's over. You won. Let go, Penhallow murmured over his shoulder. Dolan worked to loosen Connor's grip, and even his Talishte strength was tested by the hold Connor had on the stone. I don't want to break any fingers, Dolan said. It's safe now. The divvy's gone, and from the look of it, the ghosts intend to stand watch. Let me take the crystal. You need to rest. Slowly, Connor willed himself to let go. Although his fingers were cramped into claws and the muscles in his hands and arms ached when they released, he felt as if he had clung by his fingertips to a mountaintop in a raging storm. Dolan took the crystal from him and replaced it with the others. Only then did Connor feel the toll the night's work had taken. Even the Wraith Lord seemed spent, and Connor would have collapsed had Penhallow not caught him. Dolan looked up as one of Voss's guards came to the chamber entrance. Sorry to interrupt, but we've got trouble, the soldier said. Henock's back, and he's bringing an army. It will arrive after daybreak. Chapter 
Chapter 31 Vedran Pollard had grown to hate Myrdalur. A year ago, I could barely find the godforsaken place on a map. Now it haunts me at every turn. His mood was sour as he rode to the attack. The sky had grown dark, and another nasty storm was certain. Lysander had accepted his offer of an alliance, then promptly relegated Pollard and Henock to the backwater, attacking Myrdalore and its handful of soldiers, while Lysander and Rostovan took on Macfadden and the other warlords. The worst part of the slight was that Lysander's judgment was sound. Pollard hated to admit it, but his troops were too battered, too worn down by a string of defeats to go against a strong, well-armed force. He knew it, and he hated it, just like he hated Myrdalor. Treya Voss's mercenaries tried to be inconspicuous. Pollard snorted quietly, amused at the thought. Voss's pack of smash-nosed bruisers could no more be inconspicuous than a bull could fly. Certainly the guards took pains to hide themselves, trying to make the runes appear deserted. Yet anyone who glimpsed Voss's soldiers would have suspected that something was afoot, something that required the service of large, dangerous men with big, deadly swords. And then there were the mages. If it had been up to Pollard, magic would have died with the great fire, and Blaine Macfadden along with it. That magic and Macfadden survived were two more pieces of evidence that he had not found the favor of the gods. Still, saddled with the reality that magic had returned, Pollard had done his best to acquire a cadre of mages, even if that meant having his Taliste associates ambush some of those mages and turn them against their will. Today, the human mages made their first move. Pollard kept his troops out of range, while the miasma of magic descended on the outbuildings around Myrdalore's ruined tower, it was two hours after dawn, when any Talishte should be bound to their crypt. Pollard had no desire to test his mages or his fighters against the knights of Esthrain. He did not doubt that the knights fully deserved their reputation, yet the Talishte mages had to sleep, and when they did, they were vulnerable. Pollard watched with grim satisfaction as the mages sent their illusion against the mercenaries. The fear and distraction spell should have sent Voss's mercs running in circles, shitting their pants and screaming like children. What in Raka is wrong with the spell? Pollard demanded, watching from a nearby hillock. He hoped to see carnage, soldiers turning on one another in confusion and panic, an easy opening for him to lead the charge. Instead... Pollard saw Voss's mercenaries assembling with top speed from their hiding places, seemingly unaffected by the magic. It's either a powerful defensive warding, or they're all wearing some kind of null magic charm, the flummoxed mage reported. I suspect the warding, he added. Such charms are difficult to come by. Magic that suits my purposes is difficult to come by, Pollard roared. He had hoped to sweep in and seize the ruined manor with little opposition. Now, having lost the element of surprise, the assault would be that much more difficult. Pollard's vexation found release in his sword. The soldiers who swarmed from cover to repulse Hanok's attack looked too seasoned and too scarred to belong to Macfadden. He guessed that they were Voss's troops, mercenaries Penhallow had somehow convinced to ally with his cause. Mercs bleed like everyone else, Pollard muttered under his breath as he brought his sword down in a crushing blow. The sound of snapping bone and the feel of a blade sinking deep into flesh assuaged Pollard's anger. Barely. It would take more deaths, many more, to spend his fury. But as the soldier fell away, bleeding out onto the hard-packed ground, Pollard was one death closer, he thought grimly. 
that he and Henock were personally present for this strike was galling. It should have been the kind of maneuver delegated to an underling, to a captain, or even a lieutenant. Yet rumors persisted that something was happening at the abandoned old manor, and that meant too much was at stake if Pollard and his allies wished to halt Macfadden in his tracks. If I'd known Macfadden would be this much trouble, I'd have killed him years ago, Pollard growled, though no one could hear him. Voicing his thoughts gave vent to some of the pain from his proxy wounds, which rubbed raw and sore beneath his armor. His injuries put him at a disadvantage, and he knew that willpower alone might not be enough to compensate for them. Voss's soldiers, well-trained and seemingly indifferent to death, posed a challenge. He seemed to recruit only those who were the size of a bull and nearly as strong. Yet Pollard was certain that a vicious mood could outfight experience and training every time, and he was doing well at proving his theory to be true. This time, Henock brought close to one hundred men with him. Surely enough, Pollard thought, to crush a garrison. His majors and the fighters had instructions to pin down the Talishte. The living he could deal with. What Macfadden wanted with Myrdalore, Pollard could only guess, but his guesses were troublesome enough. It was enough that Macfadden was interested in Myrdalore, for that alone. Pollard was determined to deny it to him. A smash-faced soldier ran at Pollard with a guttural cry. Pollard met his charge head-on, blocking his swing and answering with a series of blows that took the fighter back a pace. All the while, a corner of Pollard's mind remained unperturbed, assessing the mercenary's fighting style. Only a few strikes had been traded when Pollard saw the weak point, a tendency to reach a little too far with the swing. Pollard intentionally took a step back as the mercenary swung again. Then he thrust forward, scoring a fatal strike. He jerked the blade upward, suspending the soldier there for an instant, satisfied at the astonishment on the dying man's face. Then Pollard lowered his blade, letting the body slide down the length of his sword, stepping over the corpse to engage the next mercenary, who ran from cover. The effort made Pollard stumble, and the new opponent saw weakness, scything his sword so close that it took a slice from Pollard's ear and grazed his hair. One of Henock's soldiers interposed himself, taking the brunt of the attack, as Pollard teamed up for the fight. It galled Pollard to have to require anyone's assistance, yet the debilitating wounds acquired since Reese's capture meant that Pollard had neither the strength nor the stamina he possessed before. In the distance, Pollard could see Henock setting about himself with a two-handed sword. He was a useful barbarian, Pollard thought, but a savage nonetheless. Henock would never be more than a wealthy man's attack dog. Lysander, on the other hand, was canny enough to be dangerous. He would bear watching when Reese returned. If Reese returned. Some fun, Nilo shouted, holding his own against a fighter who was a head taller and a stone heavier. Never better, Pollard muttered, taking the chance to bring his sword up sharply, biting into his opponent's sword arm and severing the bone midway between wrist and elbow. On the return blow, he cut clean through the soldier's neck, grimacing as blood spattered his cloak and drenched his arms. What anyone wants with this pile of shit is beyond me. Pollard grumbled. Myrdalore had been a ruin for generations. Long before the great fire leveled Dondoroth's grand manors and the cataclysm laid waste to the kingdom, Myrdalore had crumbled in silence, overrun by weeds, retaken by the birds and foxes. Once it had been a place for kings. Pollard knew the legends. Four centuries ago, King Merrill's ancestor and his chosen nobleman bound the wild magic to their command in a secret chamber at Myrdalore. That story had drawn Blaine Macfadden when he returned from exile 
and Pollard nearly had him within his grasp, only to lose his prize to an unexpected interloper. That loss still stung, and Pollard was determined not to have it repeated. Hinnock's troops fought well. Voss's mercenaries battled with a ferocity Pollard had only seen in mad dogs. Already the courtyard was strewn with corpses, the ruined fountain in its center polluted with blood. Off with ya! roared a mercenary who seemed as wide as a wagon and as muscled as an ox. Despite the freezing cold, he wore only a leather cuirass over his tunic. Black hair formed a wild cloud around his blunt-nosed face, and his bare arms were covered with runes and drawings of the gods inked into the skin. The battle axe in his hands scythed dangerously from side to side, already bloody to its hilt. Pollard took two steps back. If he could not fight strong, he would fight dirty. A throwing knife from a hidden sheath slipped into his hand. As the lumbering giant raised his axe to attack, Pollard sent the blade flying. It sank to the hilt in the big man's groin, felling him with a howl of agony. He kicked the axe away and stood just out of reach of the fighter's grasping hands as the mercenary writhed in pain. Then, with a sure, clean strike, he sent the man's head rolling. The mages concentrated their initial attack on a large cistern to one side of the courtyard. Pollard had given orders for them to begin their assault there, believing that the stone shaft hid access to Mirdalore's underground levels. Fire scoured the walls of the well, searing the dark tunnel with concentrated heat so that flames erupted from the mouth of the well, shooting up into the sky and illuminating the courtyard like a massive torch. Other mages sent tremors deep beneath the surface in hopes of causing underground rooms and corridors to collapse. The soldiers cried out in alarm and cursed in anger as the ground rumbled and trembled beneath their feet. A nasty grin spread across Pollard's face as he pictured the quakes burying the sleeping Taliste. Focusing on his anger, helped him deal with the pain from the raw sore in the center of his chest and the ceaseless itching from the rest of his skin made worse by armor and violent movement. One of Voss's men came at Pollard, and he waded into the fray, feeling his rage find its way into his sword, his anger spending with every swing and slash. Battle cleansed him, purging the dark thoughts, at least for a while, and reminding him with every spray of blood what it meant to be alive. Battle made him feel vital, yet the wounds he bore for his master took their toll. Nilo ran to join the fight, and Pollard knew that his second-in-command would not have done so had Pollard been at his former strength. The majors had expanded their fiery attack scouring every one of the stone buildings above ground with flame. Voss's men, pushed from their hiding places by the mage sent fires, took on Henock's troops with an edge that smacked of personal vendetta. This was the kind of fight Pollard relished, when combatants had a stake in the action, fighting not for gold or promotion, but for the chance to thrash someone who had done them wrong. Go tell your biter masters that your little game is over. Pollard grated as he swung, parrying a blow hard enough to make his teeth rattle. He spun, blocking another strike, unsure just how long he could hold both men at bay, and committed himself to finding out. That's rich coming from you with a biter master of your own, one of the men growled. He made no pretense of technique expecting sheer power to win the day, driving Pollard back several steps with a series of hard, fast strikes that tested Pollard's reactions. Pollard struck high with the sword in his right hand, intending to thrust with the large knife in his left. The mercenary blocked the high strike, but before Pollard could score a fatal blow, the fighter swung his sword in an arc, striking the knife with such power that it numbed Pollard's hand and sent the blade flying. 
Pollard and the mercenary circled each other warily, looking for weakness. The mercenary, with his broad shoulders and thickly muscled arms, likely outweighed Pollard by a good bit. Pollard was strong, muscular for a man his age, but not as massive as his opponent, who was likely half his age. Tired, old man, the fighter taunted. Scared, young pup, Pollard rejoined. Pollard had regained feeling in his left hand, and he drew a shiv out of the folds of his clothing, letting it fall into his grip out of sight. He lunged toward the fighter, ignoring his pain, and mounting an attack with his full strength and fury. Skill, training, and long practice fighting while wounded drove Pollard's movements, giving him a moment's grace to keep up the attack with his sword, while awaiting the moment for the death strike. The mercenary's attention was fully invested in tracking Pollard's sword. He never spotted the flick of the wrist that sent the shiv speeding toward him, or Nilo coming up from behind to stab him through the back. The fighter looked with astonishment at the hilt's deep knife protruding from his chest, staining his filthy shirt crimson. Cursing Pollard and consigning him to the depths of Raqqa, the mercenary stumbled, swinging wildly with his sword, before collapsing to his knees and falling face down in the dirt. Only then did Pollard realize that another, more dangerous enemy had arisen. Heavy fog rolled in fast, blanketing the courtyard so thickly that Pollard could not see his boots. The day's weather had been cold, threatening snow, with no swing in temperature to cause the mist. The fog felt sticky, yet cold enough that Pollard wondered how it had not frozen. There was no wind, yet the fog moved swiftly, as if driven by a gale. The air took on an oppressive weight, and the cold went straight to the bone. Pollard fought off a shiver, aware that fear more than frost had set his teeth to chattering. Figures were rising out of the center of the fog. Pollard could not be certain, as the mist billowed and roiled, whether it was one face eyeing them maliciously, or many. At first, the fog was like a sheet of muslin, stretched tight over a corpse's face, rendering features hidden and distorted. Then the fog folded in on itself, and it seemed to Pollard that ranks of shadowed figures walked just hidden within the fog, blurred and insubstantial, but no less real. The fog was rising. It was up to the soldiers' chests like a swelling tide, and Pollard heard muttering and curses among his men. Voss's fighters had withdrawn for the moment, making Pollard even more suspicious. Majors, we need light, Pollard shouted, readying his sword should an enemy charge from the mist. Obligingly, a glare of blindingly white light bathed the courtyard, and, for a moment, Pollard and the others could see the shapes more clearly despite the fog, like figures backlit behind a scrim. Whatever walked toward them out of the mist was not human, or at least was human no longer. Elongated arms with claw-like fingers hung at their sides, and their loose-limbed legs sauntered with the feral assurance of a big cat stalking its prey. Something about the heads was wrong, misshapen, with lantern jaws that could hold long, sharp teeth. Worse, in the glimpse they got of the fog figures, they looked distressingly solid, more so with every step they took, though it seemed to take them a while to emerge. As if they're coming from a long way, Pollard thought, as if they've walked here from the unseen realm itself. Something deep in Pollard's bones screamed for him to run. He started into the fog, terrified and curious, wondering whether the mage warrior knights of Estrain had woken from their daytime slumber to somehow raise the dead. A disquieting thought occurred to him. The Wraith Lord was cursed to walk the unseen realm. If he could cross that void, 
Perhaps he could open the door for others to follow him. Retreat! Hanok's voice carried through the fog. Fall back! Pollard felt a guilty rush of shame in the relief that flooded him, just for an instant, as he echoed the call. The things in the fog slowed their advance, as if giving the attackers one last chance at self-preservation. Voss's soldiers had no such reserve. Roaring like wild beasts, wide-eyed as berserkers, Voss's mercenaries came out screaming from the edges of the fog. Even they were careful not to slip among the shadow beings in the mist. Whether these were fresh soldiers, or whether they had just taken new courage in the pause, Paula did not know. But the mercenaries swept forward with savage purpose, battle axes and war hammers replacing their swords. Pollard's soldiers fled, with Henoch's men hard on their heels. Voss's soldiers ran fast enough to cut down stragglers from the rear lines, harrying them well past the boundaries of the Myrdalore walls. Those whose mounts awaited them nearly flew into their saddles before setting their heels to the horses' sides while the foot soldiers ran for their lives. Voss's men left off their pursuit at the edge of the forest, sending them on their way with catcalls and jeers, infuriating laughter and insults. The fog did not rest. Tendrils of heavy fog slunk around the horse's hooves and wound in and out of the trees. Shadows moved in the fog, allowing disquieting glimpses from time to time, as if the ghosts of Myrdalore had taken it upon themselves to form an ethereal escort to assure that none of the soldiers would double back to resume the fight. There was little chance of that, Pollard thought bitterly. Their fleeing soldiers nearly outpaced the horses, which were unusually jittery and ill-tempered. The retreating army soon learned to keep to the center of the forest road after wisps of the fog spooked their horses. The horses bucked and sent their riders flying, landing in the hedgerow with broken bones and snapped necks. Maybe the wraith lord means to hunt us down a few at a time, Pollard thought aware that he gripped his reins white-knuckled. Inside, he was torn between shame at having run and resignation, aware that a seasoned soldier knows when to retreat to fight another day. Fog made the forest miserably cold and damp, and it seemed to Pollard that the shadows were unnaturally dark for midday. It was as if the sunlight could not penetrate the branches, though Pollard had ridden this way many times in daylight and found nothing strange. The road broadened when they emerged from the forest, and the fog hung back, its duty completed. Henock's men put on a burst of speed when the bright daylight came into view, riding at a gallop or running full out to get out of the shadows and into the cold, clear light of day. Pollard turned as he reached the crest of a small rise, and looked back at the forest. The fog lingered, stretching along the edge of the forest and filling the road as if to block it. No natural fog moved like that, confirming the certainty of every primal sense. Paula did not know whether the fog could project emotions, whether it tinkered with their minds. But when he spurred his mount and rode down the other side of the rise, Losing the forest to view, he felt a weight lift from his shoulders, and the light somehow seemed brighter. For a long time, the army rode in silence. None of the soldiers seemed disposed to the usual banter or bawdy comments, their way to celebrate a victory or take the sting from a defeat. The retreat hung heavily on all of them. Pollard brooded steeping in self-recrimination and loathing as he rode. His wounds made it agonizing to ride or move, and he bit his lip to keep from crying out. Blood tinged the hem of the shirt he wore under his cuirass, not from battle damage, but from the sore, and from where his skin was rubbed raw with the lesions. Cursing under his breath, he gritted his teeth 
and spurred his horse to catch up to Henock, who was near the front of the group. What now? Henock asked, not making eye contact as Pollard joined him. We regroup, Pollard replied, having already replayed this conversation a dozen times in his mind before he rode forward. Against that? Henock asked in disbelief. I can lead an army against men. I can rally troops against Taliste, though it's a suicide cause. But something powerful called those spirits, and it was too damn much for us to handle. Pollard could hear the fear in Hanok's voice and recognized it as his own. Yet it would not do to allow his liegemen to see that. There's always a way, Pollard said, voice rough with courage he did not feel. Taliste aren't invincible, and neither are majors. They don't have to be invincible, Hanok replied. They only have to be stronger than we are. It was evening by the time they reached Solsidon, weary and defeated. Paula did not look forward to recounting the day's misadventure to Lysander, and his temper flared at the expected humiliation of having been assigned an objective and failing to achieve it. Pollard felt his spirits lift just a bit as they rode up to the front of the manor house. Despite everything else, he was home. His clothes were bloody from the fight and dirty from the road. Muscles and joints ached from the pounding of battle and the interminable ride, sorer than they should be from the fight alone. His proxy wounds were taking a steep toll, and it would likely be some time before he recovered enough to fight again. Worse, his battle wounds were serious enough to require the attention of a healer, and he loathed revealing his weakness. Most of all, Pollard wanted to pour himself some brandy and nurse his grievances in solitude. Henock and his troops veered off before they neared the manor, returning to their camp. The majors went with them. Nilo accompanied Pollard to Solsidon, along with his personal guard. Was it the Wraith Lord, do you think, who summoned the fog spirits? Nilo asked, now that they had some privacy for the first time since the battle. Pollard shrugged ill-temperedly. Perhaps. Who knows? I never heard of that any of the Knights of Estrain were necromancers, but then again, they've hardly trumpeted their abilities for all to know. What will you do about Lysander? Nilo asked, undeterred by Pollard's foul mood. He had weathered many of Pollard's rages, and he met them all with an unflappable equanimity that got under Pollard's skin all the more for its affability. Pollard let out a string of curses until his temper was spent, then sighed and shrugged. Damned if I know, Nilo. Things went wrong today. Perhaps majors can't be conscripted, even if they're bound by the Kruvgaldo to Ateliste. Could they have done more to push back against those... things? He shrugged once more. Could they? Who knows? Perhaps. Then again, if it really was the Wraith Lord who pried the gates of the unseen realm ajar, could anyone have stood against it? Nilo countered. Humph. Pollard said, unconvinced. Nilo raised an eyebrow. Look at it this way. There's no glory in leading an army into slaughter for ego's sake. Pollard glowered at him. Perhaps not, he admitted grudgingly. Nilo let that go, perhaps realizing there was no good reply. But after a silence, Nilo slid a glance toward Pollard. What of the wounds? he asked. Pollard took his meaning immediately. Nilo was not inquiring about the damage Pollard had taken in the battle. A few gashes and bruises that would heal. Pollard knew that Nilo meant the wounds he endured from Rhesus' captivity, which had grown steadily worse. Not good, he admitted. The wounds that mimicked his Taliste master's torture wore at his body and soul. 
It was impossible to move, to think, to sleep without them at the forefront of his mind. The skin lesions rubbed so against his tunic that without an undershirt of fine silk, his skin was covered in a bloody sheen from even mild exertion. He was certain his shirt would be stuck to the blood when he retired for bed, after the action of the fight. Worst of all was the sore on his chest. It ached to the bone with every breath. Pollard was certain that he would succumb to Reese's wounds long before the fifty-year imprisonment was over, even if his master did not. I just want sufficient brandy for the pain and a night's rest, Pollard said, certain Nilo could hear the weariness in his voice. They rounded the bend and found Salcidon bright with lights. Pollard felt his temper flare. Who would dare? He started. But before he could finish his sentence, he knew. Taliste, he thought. For some reason, the Taliste have come. I would know if Reese ceased to exist, so the alternative. What do you want me to do? Nilo asked quietly. He had intended to stay the night at the manor. Kerr would have been expecting both of them after the battle, and made ready with dinner and whatever healing supplies were necessary. These new, unwelcome Taliste intruders called for a change of plans. And until he knew what they wanted, Pollard decided to keep Nilo clear of his new guests. Go back to camp, Pollard said, as they slowed their horses to a halt just beyond the manor wall. I'll send for you in the morning, once I know what's going on. Nilo nodded. Very well, he said, turning his horse in the direction from which they had just come. Good night. Pollard gave a curt nod in reply, but he was certain his night would be anything but good. Wearily, Pollard rode the rest of the way in silence, accompanied by his guards. At the front of the manor, he saw no horses tethered, yet footprints marked the light dusting of snow that had fallen in the last candle mark. A groom ran out to grab the reins to his horse as Pollard swung down from his saddle. An effort of will was required not to wince at the strain the movement put on his wounds. My lord, the groom said, rushing to his side. Are you injured? Not remarkably, Pollard replied, doing his best to mask the limp from a wound to his leg. He was quite aware that he looked like he had come from battle, and under other circumstances that might have made for a triumphant entrance. Tonight he wanted to wash away the taint of failure and the smell of blood before having to face an audience. Realizing how unlikely he was to get his wish, Pollard squared his shoulders and handed off the reins without a backward glance, striding toward the house on sheer strength of will. Kerr awaited him at the door, looking worried. My lord, he said, taking in Pollard's appearance. Do you require a healer? Later, he replied. Who's here? Kerr looked abashed. Taliste, sir, Lord Rhesus people, and they insisted that they be permitted to wait for your return. His expression showed his disapproval. I tried to convince them to delay until you had the opportunity to have a proper return from battle, but they can be quite obstinate. We can be very obstinate when we wish it. Pollard recognized the voice. Vasily Aslanov stood in the doorway to the parlor, looking as if he owned the place. Tall and slender, with a mane of blonde hair that fell to his shoulders, and sharp, rat-like features with cold, dark eyes, Aslanov was trouble. Pollard had heard Reese speak of him on several occasions with grudging admiration, a powerful Taliste, not of Reese's get, and quite possibly one of the elders. Pollard knew that, while Aslanov and Reese had sometimes, over the centuries, been rivals, of late they had brokered a truce that occasionally found common rewards. 
Why are you here? Pollard asked with as much cold disdain as he could muster. He knew that Aslanov could smell the blood from the battle, and that his Taliste senses easily read Pollard's injuries and weariness. Yet it galled Pollard that Aslanov stood between him and his brandy, and he was too tired and miserable to have any fear left. Aslanov looked amused at Pollard's bravado. We've come to discuss your long overdue master, he said. Join us. Warily, Pollard followed Aslanov into the parlor. He bristled when Aslanov gestured for him to have a seat, and instead strode over to his brandy and poured himself a stiff drink. Only then did he sit down, and in his own favored chair, not the one Aslanov offered. I've just come from battle, and I'm not in the mood for company, so let's get down to business. Pollard snapped. After the cold day of battle and traveling, he took comfort in the fire that blazed in the fireplace, though its warmth meant nothing to the Tlishte. Aslanov was one of the five Tlishte who stood or sat in the parlor, likely the oldest of the group. Even older than Reese, Pollard recalled. Another man, whom Pollard knew only as Kirill, leaned against the wall with his arms crossed over his chest. A woman he did not recognize sat in one of the chairs near the fire, watching them all with a bored expression. She had dark hair, swept up in a knot and a thin, finely featured face, and Pollard wondered if she had been noble before she was turned. Perched on the corner of Pollard's desk was another stranger, a dark-haired man whose face was darkened with a hint of stubble, in his early thirties, when he was turned, with the streetwise look of a pickpocket. The fifth man Pollard recognized. Merit Garin was one of Reese's most loyal followers, and possibly one of the first Reese had turned. Garin's forehead was a bit too high, his eyes slightly too close together to look of Dondoran blood. Garin often proved his loyalty to Reese by executing those who displeased Reese, whether mortal or Taliste. We're going to get Lord Reese, Arsenoff said as matter-of-factly as if he had proposed a trip to Castle Reach. Pollard sipped his brandy, enjoying the feeling of it burning down his throat. Are you now, he said. How's that? We believe we've found a weakness in the manor where he's being held. Garin replied, one we can exploit. Pollard did not look up. He regarded the amber liquor and gave it a swirl, watching it catch the light. Why come here? Why tell me? Since West Bain has been seized by the enemy, and our resources are few, it makes sense to bring him here, now that Sorsidon has been fortified. Arslanov replied. So bring him, Pollard said with a shrug. Aslanov regarded Pollard for a moment, as if weighing how to reply. Reese relied greatly on you, he said. There is assistance and protection you can offer, being mortal, which we cannot. We wish you to prepare. In case you hadn't noticed, we're in the middle of a war, Pollard replied, taking another slug of brandy against people Lord Rees regarded as his enemies. I can't guarantee his safety or my own if you bring him here. We will guard him, Arslanov said. As for your war, I've already called more of his brood to join the fight. It's nearing its conclusion. I believe that with our help, your master's enemies will be defeated. Why rescue him now, before the battle's won? Pollard challenged. Why not wait until the fighting's done so he can return with greater safety? Aslanov favored him with a thin-lipped smile. Rhys does not desire safety, he said reprovingly. He intends to claim the spoils. Chapter 32
I want to make a sweep of it, Vargas Quintrell said, eyeing his battle majors. After this campaign, Rostevan will control a crescent from the Riven Mountains down to the sea, he said. His face was alight with excitement as he gestured at the maps he had tacked up on the wall. Carenza could see the clearly marked sections that showed the bounds of each of the warlord's territories. To the northeast of Castle Reach, Roadstead House, West Bane, and Lundmeyer anchored the land protected by Lanyon Penhallow, Treovos, and Kirken Vandhold. Stretching north from there, anchored by Solsidon, were the lands of Pentreath Rees and Vedran Pollard, protected by Lasker Hannock's troops. Lysander's territory lay between the areas claimed by Rostovan, Verna, and the Solvigs, including the lands that had once belonged to the Arkalas, though the ambitious warlord clearly had plans to expand that. Rostovan's lands were in the far north, up against the foothills of the Riven Mountains, but Quintrell's plans, if they succeeded, would give him a sickle shaped swath that took the Solvigs' territory in the northwest down through Verner's holdings and Blaine Macfadden's lands, seizing Glenreath, Quillarth Castle, and the seaport of Castle Reach. The plan was audacious. It was also, in Carenza's opinion, suicidal. Yesterday decided nothing, yet a lot of men died, Gurren pointed out. There's little to be done until the storms lift. Quintrell glowered, Displeased with Gurren's observation. Nothing, he challenged. We probed the enemy's weaknesses. We learned what their mages were able or willing to do. Those dead men are that many fewer we have to kill to gain our objective. I would hardly call that nothing. Gurren inclined his head to show deference. I misspoke, he said, hastily retreating. Carenza knew that Gurren's opinion had not changed a whit, yet they gained nothing by antagonizing Quintrell, especially when he was already manic. Rostovan performed well yesterday, Quintrell said, beginning to pace. Yet he lacks will. Several times he would have drawn back had we not controlled him and pushed him to press on. Rostovan is a seasoned commander, Carenza thought. If he wanted to pull back, there was good reason. Vigus doesn't care how many men die, so long as he gets what he wants. He's planning to make this battle his last stand. What of Lysander? Gurren asked. His troops engaged Macfadden's and the Solvigs directly. Quintrell's eyes were alight with the excitement of the fight. Lysander has proven more malleable than I thought, he replied. We're very happy with him. The divvy orb pulsed beneath Quintrell's shirt. Carenza was grateful that her magic did not resonate with the divvy. Something about its appearance reminded her of a large feline predator, content to wait for the right moment to kill. Lysander's tinger proved useful, Quintrell said. They and their beasts exacted quite a price from Macfadden's forces. A shame they're used up now. Used up, Carenza thought with disgust. Not dead, just used up like a tool. Expendable, like all of us. What next? Gurren asked. Quintrell had summoned his senior majors to regroup over dinner. Esben had gone to make sure that the other majors were at work on their tasks. Half of the majors who had left Valshoa still lived. Several of those who had died were among the most senior practitioners, pushed to the limits of their ability by Quintrell. The rest of the majors were in their tents, preparing for the next day's battle. That left Carenza and Gurren alone with Quintrell. The divvy was riding Quintrell hard, Carenza thought. Since the majors left Valshoa, Quintrell had grown thin and haggard. His skin now had a sallow cast, and his eyes shone with madness. Quintrell was fading, but the divvy's pulse grew stronger. Yet Quintrell did not seem to notice. With Macfadden tied up here, 
It's safe to say he's had no chance to use the crystals, Quintrell said. And if he dies here, our problem has been solved. You sent Pollard to Myrdalore, Gurren said. Do you really think he can wrest the crystals back from the Knights of Estrain and Voss's troops? Quintrell shrugged. If not, and he dies, it's a rival eliminated. Without Reese, Pollard and Henoch have only a fraction of their former power. If he succeeds, and we successfully eliminate Macfadden, we are free to anchor the power as we will. Carenza repressed a shiver. She had a growing sense that when Quintrell said, we, he did not mean the majors. She could not avoid a glance at the contentedly pulsing divvy orb. She knew who we really meant. If Pollard should by chance succeed, you'd gain both the crystals and Myrdalore's ritual chamber, Gurren noted. What then? Quintrell's expression was ecstatic. Then we remake the continent to our liking, he said, excitement clear in his voice. If Dolan's gone to prepare the chamber, he won't last long. The taint in the presence crystal will only activate the presence of strong magic, so any attempt to work the anchoring ritual should trigger it. When the crystal activates, everyone nearby dies. You expected Dolan to steal the crystals? Gurren asked skeptically. Foresight warned me of betrayal, Quintrell replied. I took precautions. The Divi could lift the taint for those we choose to work the ritual without harm. He shrugged. It would have also been easy to offer the crystals to Macfadden and watch him take the bait. Without Macfadden, either as a willing partner or as a prisoner, how do you expect to make the anchoring work? Gurren probed. They had asked Quintrell the same questions directly and indirectly several times, and each time Quintrell sidestepped the answer. We have everything we need, Quintrell replied, with a smile that gave Carenza no reassurance. Have you chosen your twelve? Carenza asked. Your new Lords of the Blood? That was the missing piece. The thought had occurred to her in the middle of the previous night, when she lay awake, listening to the sounds of the army camp, wondering how she had ever landed in the midst of such insanity. Quintrell's answer would make all the difference, because it augured the direction of Dondereth's future. I've had a change in my thinking about that, Quintrell said. Anchor the magic to thirteen fragile mortals, and the cycle of destruction and chaos is set in motion all over again. Anchor magic to immortal spirits, and we never need endure anything like the Great Fire again. What do you mean, immortal spirits? Gurren probed. Ghosts? Souls? Quintrell shook his head impatiently. My guide, he said, reaching up to stroke the divvy crystal. As many brothers, twelve more spirits await my call. Their magic, combined with ours, properly anchored, would make us invincible. Carenza frowned. But what of the blood? She asked, fearing the answer even as she framed the question. The ritual is bound to the bloodline of those who work the magic. As are the spirits, Quintrell replied his face glowing with excitement. The spirits join with their mortal hosts. Our blood is the catalyst. Their magic binds the power. Thirteen mortals who are no longer exactly mortal. Gurren repeated carefully, as if he struggled to make certain he had heard correctly. And the magic controlled by the spirits would pass from generation to generation. Quintrell nodded enthusiastically. Yes, the spirit would pass from father to firstborn son when the father dies. Over time, the spirit would become one with its host. Carenza struggled to hide her horror. 
The mental image of a divvy abandoning the cooling corpse of its prior host and claiming an endless series of victims gave her chills. That's what's happened with Vigus, she thought, eyeing Quintrell and noting the changes in his appearance. If that's how it would go for all the hosts, I don't imagine their lives will be long. Carenza had searched the manuscripts for any reference to the divvy. Most of the citations were oblique, vague references that seemed to expect the reader to already know something about the spirits, details that went unsaid, but that she suspected were essential. Finally, she had found one old manuscript whose writer spoke plainly. He had written of the genitors, the first ones, monsters made not by the gods nor by magic, beings from the chaos that birthed the world. Those genitors, the divi, had eventually been rooted out at the cost of immense slaughter. The uprising against the spirits had cost the lives of thousands of mortals and hundreds of mages. And when the divi were bound, more lives were lost to work the type of forbidden spells necessary to send the divi to oblivion in the unseen realm. Parasites, she thought. That's what the divi were. And if the older manuscript is right, there won't just be thirteen of them. Once they control the magic, they'll bring their friends to feast on us. There had been another reason Carenza had laid awake the night before, and many other nights. Quintrell's lack of concern for life the lives of his followers, the majors, and the soldiers, deepened her conviction that somehow he needed to be brought to heel. She and Gurren, speaking briefly and always in code, had agreed on as much. Every night, Carenza tried to imagine a way even a small number of majors might be able to act against Quintrell, and every night she fell asleep without finding an answer. She had realized months before that Quintrell was a danger, even prior to discovering that the Divi controlled his thoughts. A mad mage was worrisome enough, but the danger grew when Quintrell bent Lysander and Rostovan to his will. Through Lysander, Quintrell had a hold over Pollard and Henock, and all of the mages not allied with Macfadden, now that the Arcala twins were dead. Those forces were arrayed for this battle on the northern plains. Werner's army had already been badly damaged. If the others fell, there would be nothing in the way to keep Quintrell from carrying out his version of the ritual to bind the magic, and the Divi spirits would return from their exile and find a world of potential hosts to be drained. Something had to be done. Somehow, it had to be stopped. Carenza struggled to control her expression, as inside she felt utterly at a loss. Lysander's mercenaries are a problem, Quintrell said, bringing Carenza's attention back to the conversation. Damned border men. His messenger arrived at Candlemark ago, and I can barely understand the man with his backwoods talk. Carenza can be of help for that, Gurren said, and as Carenza startled, she saw him meet her gaze. She can make sure your orders are translated correctly, so there's no misunderstanding. Carenza felt the missing piece slip into place at Gurren's look, needing no telepathy or code to make his message clear. There was one way to damage Quintrell, one way to stop his vision. If he could be defeated in battle, despite the odds he had stacked in his favor. The Divis would remain bound, and Dondereth would not face the caprice of an insane mage. But the price would be steep. How can I help? she asked, managing a smile. She was grateful that Quintrell was not a telepath. I'll have a messenger bring you the orders I drop for Lysander in a candle mark once I finish. You'll translate them to that damned nonsense the border men speak, so there's no misunderstanding, Quintrell said. What's the plan? Gurren asked. Quintrell smiled. 
with his gaunt face and his hollow eyes. The expression was far more skull-like than Carenza remembered it being only a few months before. Werner's troops continue to be the weak point in McFadden's front line. The beasts and Tinger hurt McFadden's troops, but the Solviks are still quite strong. I'll keep Rostovan focused on Thielsen and Voss. I think our mages can break theirs with a little effort, he said, his grin becoming a smirk. Lysander needs to smash the Solvig line. I believe that once the Solvigs fold, McFadden and Werner won't be able to withstand us on their own, he added. And every day the magic remains unstable, it drains McFadden, perhaps to the breaking point. McFadden's a fighter and Tormad Solvig's power is still an unknown, Guerin said. Are we certain there's no weakness of Lysander's that they might exploit? Quintrell seemed pleased by Guerin's concern. Carenza read a darker meaning, that Guerin was intentionally feeding her information. The battle was likely to be decided in the next day. What Carenza told the messenger could easily determine who won and who lost. Lysander spent his tinger and their beasts, which will annoy him, because he doesn't like to use his soldiers until he's softened up the enemy, Quintrell remarked. And it struck Carenza that his talk of spending lives made it seem like nothing more than coins. He'll have to throw his best troops in up front, so I hope they haven't gotten soft having the tinger to lead the charge for them. What are his majors? Guerin asked. Can they stand up to Tormad Solvig? Quintrell chuckled. Oh, I think so. I've got a surprise planned for Solvig. Lysander's majors will lose a bit of the divi when Tormad Solvig uses his necromancy. Divis walk the unseen realm like the restless dead, he said, warming to his subject. When Solvig opens himself to his magic, the Divi will seize him, using the dead to drag his soul into the realm. Without Solvig, I don't think the others can last the rest of the day. They're counting on him to turn the tide. Quintrell looked quite pleased with himself. He paused. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to finish writing the plan for Lysander, then meet with Rostovan. Watch for my messenger. He'll bring the plan to your tent, he said to Carenza. Gurren and Carenza walked together through the army camp in silence. There were too many people nearby who would hear anything they might have said, Carenza thought. And as she pondered her next move, she was not yet ready to talk, or perhaps afraid to say aloud of the plans forming in her mind. Gurren stopped at the entrance to Carenza's tent. For a moment she thought he might come in and set a warding to allow them to speak freely, but he did not. No, she thought. It wouldn't do for us to make any move that might make Vigas suspicious. Not now. Too much at stake. Instead, Gurren managed to smile and met Carenza's gaze. You've got important work to do, he said. That message will determine the outcome of the battle, so you'll want to get it exactly right. You mustn't think about who will die. What matters is that the right outcome, the best outcome, is achieved. He nodded, but his smile did not quite reach his eyes. I know that you'll do this brilliantly, and we'll all sit back and watch it happen together. Carenza realized. She was barely breathing. She felt cold in her marrow, something that had no connection to the temperature outside. Her heart was beating so hard she thought it might tear through her chest, and her mouth was dry. He knows, she thought, and he's letting me know that the sacrifice is worth the outcome. Carenza reached out to squeeze Gurin's hand. Thanks she said in a strangled voice. I want to stand with you to watch it all play out. You will, Gurren promised. We're the guard of last resort. It's up to us 
to set it straight. He paused. We'll be helping Vigus stay focused so he's not distracted, he added with a meaningful glance. Carenza took his meaning immediately, that Gurren and their other allies would try to divert Vigus's attention from whatever she did for as long as possible. Sweet Estrain, Carenza thought. It's come down to this, the outcome of the war in our hands. There were a million things she wanted to say, but instead she swallowed hard and nodded. I'll wait for the messenger then, she said, and I'll stand with you in the morning. She ducked into her tent, and only then did she realize just how hard she was shaking. Carenza paced her tent, thinking about her options. Every choice carried risks and consequences, and she knew there was only one chance. We're plotting treason, or, at the least, massive betrayal, she thought. But when he accepted the divi, when he promised to give the magic over to those spirits, Vigus betrayed us. Vigus, as the power behind the throne, was bad enough. This, this would be intolerable. She had steeled herself to action when the messenger came to the door. To her relief, Vigus was not with him. Come in, she said to the messenger. This is going to take a little while. Master Quintrell says speed, the messenger said in broken Donderin. It must also be correct, Carenza said, summoning all her nerve to speak with authority. Now, for me to put this into your language, I must hear you speak. Talk to me, and I will learn your words. The messenger looked at her skeptically, but at her prompting, he told her of his journey from the front lines to Quintrell's position, of what he had seen and heard, and of his travels through the storm. Carenza listened intently, focusing her magic. She responded to his comments, at first a word or two, then short sentences, and finally asking questions as naturally as if she had been speaking the messenger's border dialect all her life. The man looked at her in wary amazement. You talk like someone from my village, he said, a mixture of interest and fear clear in his eyes. Yet before... It's my magic, she said matter-of-factly, taking the folded parchment from him and sitting down at her portable writing desk. Now I'll translate what Master Quintrell wrote so that your captains can understand. If the messenger noticed her hand shaking as she took up the quill to write, Carenza hoped he would blame the cold. Carenza withdrew a clean piece of parchment and carefully smoothed it, stirred the ink, and set out the sand to blot. She forced herself to breathe, recognizing that if she succeeded, this paper would become her death warrant and the order of execution for Gurren and her allies, as well as Quintrell and his divi. With the messenger's dialect still clear in her mind, Carenza forced down thoughts of anything except the translation. She could not afford to dwell on the outcome, the loss, or her own willful betrayal. What mattered was the document, that it be clear and carry the force of legitimacy, and that it run completely counter to Quintrell's real orders. Carenza looked up at the messenger, who stood a respectful distance from her writing table. Did Master Quintrell review the plan with you? she asked. The messenger shook his head. No, milady, it was sealed when I received it, and he said only that I must bring it directly to you for translation. Carenza nodded and looked down, fearing her relief might show in her face. She broke the wax seal on Quintrell's document. Very well, she said. It was unlikely that the messenger could read his own dialect, let alone standard Donderin, but Carenza positioned the parchment so that Quintrell's plan was not visible to the man. 
Quintrell's plan called for the mercenaries to make a lightning-fast charge against the centre of the Solvig's line, while Lysander pounded away at Blaine's troops and Rostovan hammered Nicholas and Voss. It was intended to force Tormad Solvig's hand, pushing him into expending his magic. Carenza understood what Quintrell intended. Just as Lysander used the Tinger as expendable troops to wear down an enemy, Quintrell saw the mercenaries as equally disposable. Though Quintrell's plan did not say so, she knew that once Tormad Solvig had spent his most dangerous magic killing the mercenaries, Quintrell would use the mages to release the Divi and kill the weakened necromancer. I'm betraying Quintrell, Carenza thought, but perhaps the mercenary should thank me. I'm likely saving his life and the lives of his companions. She wrote swiftly, afraid she might lose her nerve if she hesitated long enough to think. Magic supplied the translation and the words for Carenza to create false orders that would send the mercenaries in the opposite direction Quintrell intended. Once the troops were in action, there would be little Quintrell could do to stop them, short of loosing his own magic against his allies' soldiers. If he did that, Carenza had no doubt that Lysander's commanders, who were not under the control of the Divi, would think it an enemy trick and fight to protect their warlord. Quintrell ordered a rapid advance. Carenza's translation demanded a retreat. Quintrell intended to send the mercenaries like an arrow to the heart of the Solvik defences. Carenza sent them against Rostovan's own rear flank. In the chaos, Rostovan's soldiers would defend themselves against what appeared to be Lysander's betrayal, diverting a goodly portion of Rostovan's army to fend off the attack. The fighting was likely to push the front half of the troops into the forefront of the battle and deliver them into the sights of Tormad and Rinka Solvig and their army. Tormad Solvig, who had not yet loosed his full power in battle, Carenza suspected, would find a perfect target in Quintrell and her fellow mages. Once the mercenaries were deployed, Garan and their few allies would throw in their lot, doing whatever they could to undermine Rostovan and Quintrell until they were captured and killed. She could only hope Tormad would be able to withstand Quintrell's use of the divi. We'll make our stand, Carenza thought, as she blotted the ink with the sand and then carefully folded the parchment melting wax to seal the document and pressing her ring into the wax to certify it. And if we succeed, we'll die. Chapter 33 Blaine McFadden reeled, nearly losing his footing. His attacker's sword grazed Blaine's ear, landing a deep slice in his left shoulder. You look tired, the Lysander soldier mocked. Stand still, and I'll send you to your rest. Blaine muttered a curse and brought his sword up sharply, knocking aside the soldier's blade and taking the man by surprise. He half lunged, half staggered forward, to sink his second sword into the man's abdomen, nearly falling with the effort. The next fight will be kill you, the soldier predicted as he fell, and Blaine feared he might be right. Two days of battle against the combined forces of Lysander and Rostovan, and as yet there was no victor. Blaine's army defeated the Tinger advance force with their magic-born monsters, but Lysander's army was well-trained and seemingly endless. Even with the Solvigs and Verna bringing their armies to bear, no one had yet punched a hole in the Lysander line. Nightly runners brought updates from Nicholas and the Second Front. Nicholas's half of the army and Treovos's mercenaries battled Rostovan, backed by Vigus Quintrell's majors. What Rostovan might have lacked in sheer numbers, he more than made up for in magic and the last communique gave Blaine to understand Nicholas was also at a stalemate. You need to tie up that gash, Kestrel said, 
looking him over with a practiced eye. Piran and I will cover you. Blaine sank down to one knee, ripping a strip of fabric from his shirt to bind up the deep cut in his left arm. He felt lightheaded, but he knew the injuries he had taken in battle caused only a portion of his problem. The magic was killing him. Even though Nicholas had volunteered to lead the assault against Rostovan, and therefore Quintrell, to shield Blaine from the worst of the magic, nothing could protect him from it entirely, not even the magic-deflecting amulet Rickard had supplied. If it weren't for the amulet, I'd probably be flat on my back, or worse, by now, Blaine thought. The slash on his arm was just one of the many cuts and gouges he had sustained, plus more bruises and sore muscles than he wanted to think about. All of that he took in stride, but magic was not so easily dismissed. Lysander's mages had kept up a near constant barrage, requiring Blaine's mages to counterattack. Tormod Solvig had kept a low profile, but Blaine suspected that as the battle moved into the third day, Tormad would grow impatient with finesse. Rinko Solvig had already given up on restraint, leading her army in a headlong attack that almost broke the Lysander line. Almost, but not quite. Across the valley, Bergen Werner's troops fought valiantly, Perhaps the son had more aptitude for warfare than the father, Blaine thought, because Bergen's tactics were daring, unexpected, and sometimes damn fool crazy. In other words, exactly what we need. Blaine realized early in the fight that Lysander really fielded three separate armies. The first, his Tinger allies, had been routed along with their beasts. The second group made up of Merivan sellswords, swelled the ranks but fought without passion, as if they were counting the candle marks until they received their pay and were determined to live long enough to spend it. Blaine was sure that to Lysander the mercenaries were as disposable as the Tinger, just better armed and somewhat better trained. The third group were Lysander's own soldiers, his elite crack troops, highly skilled, but small enough in number that Lysander hoarded them like gold. Let me through! A wild-eyed man careened through the fighting, face pale as death. He wore the tattered uniform of one of the Solvig's men. I've got a message for Lord Macfadden. Piran and Kestel stepped between Blaine and the newcomer, in case the messenger was not what he appeared to be. More of Blaine's soldiers circled them, added protection, even in the midst of the battle. Get to the point, man. We've got a war going on, Pirin said. The messenger nodded, heaving for breath. Tormad Solvig sent me. The ghosts of Quintrell's dead majors have betrayed their master. They were sent to him by our allies on the inside, with word that Quintrell intends to call a divvy to use the necromancer's power against him. Can Tormod withstand that? Kestel asked, eyes widening in surprise. He doesn't know whether he can or not, but he's asked for the help of all mages, and those with magic, and he said to tell you that foreknowledge is the sharpest sword. Blaine and the others exchanged glances. Then Blaine nodded curtly in acknowledgement. Very well, you've done your duty. Now get behind the lines. It's suicide to try to return across the fighting. Traitors inside Quintrell's organization, Blaine thought. That has to be Carenza. And she got word to us the only way she could, by sending the dead to warn a necromancer. But how do we use what she's told us to block Quintrell's strike? The messenger had disappeared into the fray as the battle closed around them once more. Piran and Castle battled two more of Lysander's mercenaries, and Blaine willed himself back into the fight, lunging in with a roar. The collective use of magic was burning him up, draining his energy and his life force faster than normal. And with every bone-jarring sword strike and every weary step, Blaine felt that drain in his marrow, despite the deflecting amulet. Not long now, 
Kestrel said, with a glance at the orange gash of sunset. She saw an opening and went for it, finishing off her opponent with one strike that impaled his crotch, while the dirk in her other hand slit his belly. I'm so glad you're on our side, Pirin said, dealing a powerful series of hammering blows that drove his enemy to his knees, and then separated his head from his shoulders. Having fun, Kestel said with a grin that did not reach her eyes. They were all weary. Kestel was bleeding from half a dozen deep cuts, while Pirin looked to have taken even worse damage. What they needed was something to turn the tide. Lysander's mercenaries cursed in a language Blaine recognized as Merivan. He did not understand the words, but the intent was clear. Pirin shouted obscenities back in the same language. Whatever Pirin shouted brought three new mercenaries, faces red with rage, shouting and gesturing and swinging their swords to avenge their honor. Amid it all, Pirin almost seemed to be enjoying himself. What are you saying to them? Kestel asked, obliged to defend herself as Pirin's barbs drew attackers. I may have commented about their mothers, their wives, their whores, and their manly nobility, Pirin replied, grinning. Blaine was setting about himself in earnest, fighting off one particularly large man whose honor had been affronted. He apparently expected Blaine to understand the curses and imprecations he shouted, but the nuances were lost in translation. I've never actually heard anyone use that curse before, Pirin called, clashing with his opponent. It's forbidden by their priests. I must have really riled him. If anyone could make you lose your immortal soul from irritation, it would be you, Kestel replied, surprising her attacker with the skill and speed of her sword. Blaine got inside his opponent's guard, striking his sword arm and opening a gash to the bone. His second stroke took off the mercenary's head. Within minutes, Kestel and Pirin had also made short work of their attackers, and the three stood back to back, heaving for breath, awaiting the next attack. We need a sea change, Blaine muttered, something to shift the balance. Hundreds of torches flared to life as darkness fell, and in the shadows, dark shapes came ghosting out of the twilight. Blaine could just make out one of Lysander's generals astride a huge black warhorse. In the blink of an eye, the man was snatched from his saddle and carried up into the night sky. Simultaneously, more Chaliste, led by gear, descended out of the darkening skies like the warriors of the gods, snatching predetermined targets, the commanders, from among the soldiers. One after another, the black-clad executioners casually ripped the heads from the bodies, showering the soldiers beneath in their commander's still warm blood. They flung the bodies aside, dropping them into the midst of the panicking troops, then slung their heads with deadly aim and lethal force, shouting in triumph when they knocked another officer from his horse. Again and again they dove plucking the officers from their horses and making a show of discarding the bodies. Cast in torchlight, bathed in blood, Gear and his fellows embodied every nightmare vision Lysander's godforsaken soldiers had ever dreamt. In the air, Gear's Taliste forces battled the Taliste Pollard had supplied, men from Reese's brood who were willing to fight in order to enjoy the bloody spoils. Before Lysander's bowmen could collect their wits enough to shoot, or the remaining officers could rally their troops, a frigid wind rushed toward the enemy line. Tormad Solvik rode at the head of an army of vengeful spirits. Some rode skeletal steeds, no more than bone and rusted armor, yet armed with blade and will. Other evidence charged on foot, wielding maces, axes, and morning stars that looked quite real. Their battle cry was the moan of the wind and the answering howl of wolves in the forest. Rinko Solvig rode just behind the spectres, 
clad in her blood-red leather armor, bloodied up to her elbows and spattered with gore. Rinka had none of her brother's magic, but she was fearless and possibly crazy. She rode a massive white warhorse whose sides were streaked with blood, and the armor over the horse's head was designed to look like a skull. Rinka carried a sword in one hand and a chain flail in the other, making good use of both. Foreknowledge is the sharpest sword, Blaine repeated, as a daring plan came to him. Daring and quite likely suicidal. Kestel, we've got to get to Tormod. My battle foresight might predict Quintrell's move, and if we use our amulets right, we might be able to limit the Divi's power while Tormod strikes it down. Kestel gave him a wary look. Or our amulets totally close down Tormod's magic, and the Divi eats all of us. You've got a better idea. Kestel shot him a feral smile. Nope. Survival is overrated. Let's go for it. Pirin swore. Since you've both taken leave of your senses, I'll cover your asses while you do whatever you're going to do. Together, the three of them fought their way across the battlefield toward where Tormad Solvig's spectral forces advanced. What's in Raka are we going to do when a divvy shows up? Pirin asked, slashing a path through the soldiers who had the bad luck to get in his way. We'll see how much juice the amulets really have, Blaine said, fighting back a foot soldier who lunged at him. If Kestrel and I work together, then even the amulets can't hold back the divvy completely. Maybe we can weaken the spirit until Tormad obliterates it. So, you're going to throw yourself in front of the monster, hoping your fancy necklaces keep it from killing you, until the necromancer can hurl magic at the monster over your head to destroy it, and hope you don't die. Basically, you've got something better? Pidrin shrugged. I've got nothing. Let's hope you're smarter than your idea sounds. As Tormad Solvig's ghostly army closed in on where Blaine and the others stood, the air in front of Solvig ripped in two, like fabric rent down the middle, exposing fathomless darkness beyond. Out of the darkness stepped a fearsome shape. This was no magicked beast, like the Grips and Mestids and Rannin. Blaine was certain that the monster in front of Solvig was a creature of the unseen realm. Even at a distance, power radiated from the being. Dark magic as repugnant as putrefying flesh. Powerful limbs, talons like scimitars, and a maw filled with rows of razor-sharp pointed teeth made it clear that the creature existed to devour. The black rip in the daylight remained open behind the monster, and it rose up to its full height, standing in front of Solvig as tall as a man astride a warhorse. As Blaine watched the creature, it seemed both here and not here, as if its presence among the living wavered. Powerful dark magic swept out from the monster toward Tormod Solvig, and Blaine knew somehow that the monster strove to turn the spirits of the dead against the necromancer, and to use them to draw Solvig into the limitless darkness beyond the rift. Lane gasped from the powerful magic, but his amulet deflected the worst of it. Pirin stood guard, but their would-be attackers had run from the ghostly army and from Rinka's all-too-real assault. Go! Blaine shouted. He and Kestel ran for the divvy, one on each side, careful to keep a respectful distance. The divvy's power felt like a dark malaise, cold and stinking like an open grave. Blaine dodged closer, and the divvy's magic wavered, sliding aside, its strike against Tormod Solvig, deflected by Blaine's amulet. Blaine jumped back, and Kestel closed from the opposite side, careful not to get close to Tormod Solvig, lest her amulet blunt his powers. For a moment, the divvy's power dropped out, as if a curtain of steel had fallen between it and them. It lunged at Kestel, and she danced out of its reach, releasing it from the grip of her null amulet. 
The monster beckoned, and the ghosts wavered, torn between Solvig's call to them and the creature's infernal power. Again Blaine ran forward, deflecting the power of the divvy's call. When the monster came at him, Blaine scrambled backward as Kestel ran forward, and the null amulet broke the divvy's hold on the ghosts, which had the good sense to disappear. Kestel and Blaine both fell back as the divvy roared in rage. Solvik muttered under his breath, and his hands wove a complex pattern in the air. The monster took a step backward, then dove forward, and it was Solvik who was forced back to avoid the creature's deadly claws. All around Solvik, the ghosts faded in and out, as if torn between the mortal master who called them from slumber and the beast that demanded their allegiance. Blaine staggered from the flow of magic, but his amulet's protection deflected the worst of it. He felt the storm of magic surge toward them, power he was certain meant to kill. The magic was deflected when it came within range of his charm. Blaine steeled himself to feel the magic like a body blow, but his charm held, letting the wild power slide away from him and ricochet toward the monster. It was impossible to gauge surprise on the creature's inhuman features, but the thing fell back several steps, and its form wavered as if crippled by its own magic. Now, Blaine shouted to Solvik as he and Kestel threw themselves out of the way. Torment Solvik's power swelled, and the ghost tide rushed toward the creature, sweeping it back toward the darkness. Blaine took back his position so that the power echoed between him and the monster, magnifying the damage of Solvig's intent. The monster roared and shrieked as the ghosts pushed it into the darkness, and then the rift closed behind it, leaving only a patch of scorched ground in its wake. Blaine wavered on his feet, and the tide of spectral warriors drew back. Kestel grabbed his arm, steadying him, and extending the protection of her null amulet to shield him. Thank you, Tormat Solvik said. I could not have fought the Divi without help, or at least not without great cost. Don't let me stand in your way, Blaine said with a weary grin. Go get those bastards. He stepped aside, and Solvik and his ghostly army swept by. That's a Divi? Kestel asked, eyes wide. Quintrell controls that? Blaine nodded tiredly. More likely it controls Quintrell. I have the feeling that we haven't seen the last of it. Pirin ran up to them, anger and worry clear in his face. You all right, mate? Not exactly, Blaine replied. But there's no helping it. That was not entirely the truth. Blaine expected that being in the presence of magic would take its toll. He did not expect that he would be burning up with fever in a wind as cold as any on Edgeland. Nor did he think his head would swim and pound as if he had been dashed against the rocks, or that his blood would feel ready to boil while he labored for breath and struggled for the energy to move, let alone fight. It was growing rapidly clear that if he did not die in battle, magic itself would do the job. Blaine's soldiers, having been warned of the Taliste attack and the Solvig's likely offensive, saw their chance and took it. Roaring like madmen, the soldiers swarmed forward, setting about mercilessly with swords and axes and ascending on their panicked opponents like hornets. Borians, Desia, rode at the front, standing in their stirrups, howling like wolves. Boria's bow loosed arrow after arrow, firing into the fleeing Lysander ranks. Desia's bullwhip snapped from side to side, herding the enemy soldiers into retreat. The sharp metal tip set in Desia's whip dug deep into flesh when it struck, opening deep gashes and pulling strips of skin away with it when he cracked the leather free. Blaine grasped the magic-deflecting amulet that hung around his neck, wishing that he could do more, 
frightened to think about what a toll Tom had sorcery and the Divi's attack would have taken without the charm. He felt a sudden quiet descend on him, as if someone had covered him with a large glass box that shut out sound and magic. He knew the respite could not last long, but while it did, his strength was replenished. Beneath it all, he felt his Kruvgalda bond to Penhallo like a thin, strong cord, shoring up his strength. A few breaths later, the roar of battle returned, but by then, Blaine had regained his footing and enough stamina to rejoin the fight. All around him, soldiers cheered as they harried the enemy, excited that their fortunes had finally changed. What's in Raka's going on? Pirin asked, pointing. Amid the milling chaos of battle, half of Lysander's army appeared to be in full retreat. Archers fired sporadically at Taliste, who for the most part easily dodged their arrows, only to swoop down again like raptors and snatch an officer from his horse. Soldiers shouted curses and shook their fists at the sky. Oran, enraged at the enemy, while others made a hasty retreat toward the rear lines. Those officers who remained, mostly on foot, shouted in vain to regain control of their troops. They're running, Kestel said. Blaine shook his head. No, look. They're moving in an orderly retreat. Watch them. Kestel frowned. Whatever their commander's doing, no one else seemed to expect it. Blaine grinned. Maybe not, but it opens the door for us. Let's go, he shouted, rallying his troops to surge forward, giving chase to Lysander's retreating forces. Blaine lost track of the candle marks as they fought their way through the chaos. He was sticky with blood, covered in gore, but most of it was not his own. When the mercenaries retreated, they left a hole in the line between Lysander's army and Rostovan's troops. And before the mistake could be remedied, Blaine and Nicholas sent their armies into the breach to make the most of it. For the first time that day, Blaine let himself think about Carr. He had given clear orders that Quintrell was his to deal with, no matter what the mages had to do to shut down the man's magic. Carr would be avenged. After all they had endured, all that the battle had cost, Blaine intended to make Quintrell pay. Werner's army stormed in alongside with Blaine's soldiers, their energy renewed by the unexpected stroke of luck. Blaine's troops rallied, despite being weary and wounded from days on the field. In the forefront, Blinka and Tormad Solvig cut a swath through the attackers as they ushered wave upon wave of the angry dead into the fight, enabling them to get their vengeance at last. All the while, Blaine had searched the throng of soldiers for Lysander. This morning, Lysander might have expected an easy victory. Now, with his mercenaries in retreat and his army in disarray, hounded by the living, dead, and undead, Lysander would be lucky to secure a quick death. It would be relatively easy for Gear, or one of the Talisde, to snatch Lysander into the air and behead him. But that would make Lysander into a martyr, potentially a rallying point against those who would destroy the Talisde. Blaine knew that his undead allies had endured enough at the hands of mortals without adding more to the legends to feed the fire. Still, he was taken aback when Gear dropped down suddenly in front of him, Carsten Lysander firmly in his grip. Gear threw the black-clad warlord down so that Lysander landed on his hands and knees in front of Blaine. Kestel and Pirin came to stand behind him, and Gear made no move to leave. Lysander was weaponless and battered. Blood spattered and bearing the gashes and bruises of battle, he nonetheless drew himself up to kneel with a straight back, head held high. We all have parts to play, Blaine thought, and play them we must. He withdrew his sword and moved to stand in front of Lysander. Unlike Quintrell, Blaine had no personal grievance against Lysander. His soldiers had fought admirably, and his strategies had been sound. Do you yield? Blaine asked, his sword visible but not yet threatening. 
Lysander regarded him with a baleful gaze. What choice do I have? He spat to the side. I yield. Will you swear fealty, pledging your sword and loyalty to the House of Glenreath? Blaine asked. He expected Lysander's answer, but his own sense of honor required him to ask. Go to Raka. I'm no man's liegeman, Lysander replied. Isn't it worth your life to swear fealty, man? Piran asked. Lysander glared at them both. Torven, take your souls. I'd rather die now than pledge my allegiance to any man. As you wish, Blaine replied. With one swift stroke, his sword parted Lysander's head from his body. When the body fell, a glass orb on a leather strap slipped from around his neck. The orb gave a faint, stuttering flicker, and Blaine ground it under the heel of his boot into dust. Perrin snatched up the fallen head and held it aloft by its hair. Unless you want the fate of your dead lord, best you fall on your knees and confess allegiance, he shouted. Only a remnant was left of Lysander's crack troops. Blaine estimated that a few hundred enemy soldiers remained, perhaps fewer. Almost to a man, Lysander's troops knelt. Some fell to their knees, and others bent grudgingly, but to Blaine's relief, only a small fraction preferred death to fealty. Rickard and Leif caught up to Blaine. Trying to minimize the impact of their magic on him, they had kept their distance during the battle. Both were red in the face from running, and despite the cold, Rickard mopped the sweat from his forehead with the sleeve of his robe. Can you bewitch the captives, make sure there are no surprises? Blaine asked. Rickard nodded. That shouldn't be a problem. He glanced at the kneeling men. I assume your soldiers will take precautions. Blaine motioned to a nearby captain. March the captives behind the lines. Build a stockade and lock them up, he ordered. Mage Ricard and Mage Leave will keep them from causing trouble. We'll deal with them later. The captain eyed the majors with suspicion, but nodded. Aye, sir. He shouted for his men to surround the captives and begin tying their hands with their belts. Ricard turned back to Blaine. I'll magic them once we're clear of you, just in case. Blaine nodded his assent and returned his attention to the battle. The Solvigs had gone into a full assault on what remained of Rostovan's line as Werner's troops chased down strays from Lysander's army. Blaine's gaze sought the horizon, and Kestel moved up next to him. It's Quintrell you want, she said, watching his face. Blaine nodded. I can't bring Carr back, but I can avenge him. Gear slipped up beside him. I don't think you'll have long to wait, he said, a nod of his head indicating the direction of Rostovan's army. They seem to be collapsing. He grinned, exposing the tips of his eye teeth. Nidhud spared me a few of his men, the knights were mage warriors, after all, and they hosted Quintrell's group in Valshoa long enough to get to know them. They'll help contain whatever Quintrell's mages throw at them, and tamp down the worst of it. Blaine glanced at Gear. Is everything ready at Myrdalor? he asked. Gear nodded. Waiting for you. He shrugged. Not that there haven't been a few bumps in the road, but we've gotten past them. From the way Gear said it, Blaine was certain that the obstacles had been far greater than bumps, but he let it go. Like? Kestel asked. Gear shrugged. Some of Reese's brood decided to take this personally. Seems they've thrown their lot in with the other side. Not a surprise, but hardly a welcome addition. You held them off? Yes, but we could have done without the aggravation. Gear paused. When you're finished here, I'm to bring you directly to Myrdalur. My orders from Penhallow and Dolan. Blaine managed a quiet chuckle. Good enough. We wouldn't want to keep them waiting. 
The battle shifted, and Blaine followed Gear's gaze. The Solvik's army drove straight to the heart of Rostovan's forces. Nicholas and Treya Voss followed with their troops, offering no quarter as they slashed a path through the broken line. Let's go. I want to be there when it falls apart, he said. Blaine sent runners to Nicholas with an update of what had happened, modifying the battle plan and providing new orders for the altered situation. He rallied his men, and they headed at a run for the action. Kestel, Piran, and Gear stuck close to Blaine, and he suspected that they could see the toll the battle had taken on him. He felt worn and hard used. Tormad's magic, even at a distance, was a persistent drain. His fever had returned, and Blaine knew that nothing the healers could do would remedy it. Yet beneath the fatigue, Blaine could feel another presence, a silent strength, helping to shore up his defenses. Penhallow, the Kruvgaldor. Very well, I'll take help wherever I can get it, he thought, with a silent word of thanks for the bond that connected him to the Teliste's distant thoughts and immortal strength. Stubbornness and rage drove him on over his body's protests. Carr's savaged face and battered body haunted his dreams, and now that Quintrell was nearly within his grasp, Blaine intended to have his revenge. Neither Rostovan nor Quintrell was going to give in easily. Blaine's soldiers came pouring in behind Nicholas's troops, joining their comrades with an ear-splitting battle cry. With fresh soldiers swelling their ranks, Nicholas's soldiers and Voss's mercenaries fought with new energy, leaving Rostovan's men no hope of reversing their fate and nowhere to run. A soldier launched himself at Blaine, eyes narrowed with resolve. We won't die easily, he muttered, coming at Blaine with a wild series of strikes and thrusts born of desperation. Blaine was certain that it was his battle magic that saved him, enabling him to anticipate the enemy's blows just an instant before the motion was made. He gave himself over to it, knowing the price, too weary to turn any boon away. After a few rounds, the soldier's frantic press slowed, and Blaine held back, awaiting the next salvo, attuned to the heightened sense that saw the strike before it came. A heartbeat before the attacker lunged to the left, Blaine thrust forward inside the man's guard, a blow that ripped his gut from side to side and spilled his entrails onto the ground. The soldier dropped his sword, pressing the edges of his opened belly together in vain, and as he sank to the ground, Blaine's sword swung again, severing the man's head from his neck. Kestel and Pirin had made short work of their attackers, while Gear had returned to the night sky, swooping down time and again to claw the throat from an unsuspecting soldier or snap a brittle neck. Shouts of panic echoed in the darkness, and Rostovan's terrified men ran, duty forgotten. A victory cry rose from the direction of Rinka Solvig's troops, Blaine turned toward the commotion in time to see Rinka lift Torrenth Rostovan's head on a pike, holding it over her head while fresh blood streamed down the wooden pole and a spray of crimson showered her in gore. Blaine and Kestel pressed forward toward a small redoubt in the rear made of hastily dug dirt mounds. That's the majors, he said to the others. I'm certain. If Quintrell's to be found, he'll be there. Then let's get the bastard, Kestel said, brandishing her swords. They fought their way toward the Major's shelter, defending themselves against panicked soldiers already resigned to losing the battle. Blaine searched the fray for Nicholas, finally spotting him surrounded by soldiers who stepped aside when he and Kestel and Pirin shouldered their way to the group. Nicholas managed a tired, lopsided grin. Glad you could join us, he said. Three Talishte stood with Nicholas, clad in the uniform of the Knights of Estrain. You've got good timing. We're just about to storm the majors. I'm glad I didn't miss the party, Blaine said. Kestel gave him a worried look, but did not comment. He could guess what she wanted to say, and shared her concern. There was a very real chance that putting himself in the thick of the magic 
could kill him, despite the amulet's protection. But he knew that he could not live with himself if he did not make the attempt. What's the plan? he asked. Nicholas nodded toward the earthworks redoubt. Jasha and Serge have been holding a damper on Quintrell's magic, while Gav strikes randomly, poking through with his magic to see where the weak points are. He shrugged. From time to time, they switch roles. How's it working? Piran asked, eyeing the redoubt with suspicion. We haven't been incinerated, Nicholas replied blandly. So I'd say offhand pretty well. He grimaced. On the other hand, we haven't broken them either. Quintrell is sending most of the magic himself, Gav said, never taking his gaze from the redoubt. I recognize the signature of his power. Is he alone? Surely he had other mages with him, Kestel asked, peering through the darkness for a glimpse. Gav frowned. There are others present, but not active. What I can read is limited by the shielding, but I'd say they were injured. Blaine narrowed his gaze, squinting to see. In the torchlight, it looked as if the dirt mounds had been scorched with fire and pockmarked with the impact of large, heavy objects. Yet the entire area seemed to be wreathed in a light mist, and Blaine could feel the magic of Quintrell's protections, like a buzzing in his ears. One man can't be impossible to beat, he muttered. One man wouldn't be, Gav replied, but Quintrell is no longer exactly human. The Divi. Blaine remembered the creature that had confronted Tormad Solvig on the battlefield, the monster that had stepped through a rift in the sky as if it were opening a door. Thank the gods I didn't know what it was really like, or I might not have had the balls to throw myself in front of it. Gav nodded. Quintrell's drawing on its magic, because no mortal should have been able to hold out against us this long. Won't it consume him, using that kind of power for so long? Kestel asked. Gav's expression was grave. Oh, yes, eventually. But Quintrell's already past the point of no return. Once a man commits himself to a divvy, there's no turning back, even if he wanted to. The divvy controls him, and for as long as he serves the divvy's needs, he'll continue to survive as a useful tool. Gav met Blaine's gaze. It's the divvy we're really fighting. Quintrell, as a mortal man stopped existing quite a while ago, I would guess. Blaine remembered the mages who had trusted Quintrell to protect them from the great fire, and Carenza, who had looked to Quintrell as a mentor and savior. He's betrayed all of them, Blaine thought, his anger flaring. They depended on him, believed in him, and he sold them out to the divvy. What about the other mages? Blaine asked. Can you tell what injured or killed them? Anger glinted in Gav's eyes. We haven't broken through his warding, so my guess is that whatever happened, Quintrell did it himself. Why? Kestel demanded. Because someone betrayed him, Nicholas replied. I don't think the Lysander mercs ran for the hills on their own accord. I don't think the ghosts brought their message about the divvy to Tormund without being sent by someone. Someone Quintrell trusted didn't trust him back. One possibility presented itself in Blaine's mind, and he shied away from it, unwilling to even consider the thought. There's no way Carenza would have agreed to be a battle mage, he thought. But he knew, even as he framed the thought, that she might have had no say in the matter. The likelihood made Gav's suspicions about the mage's fate all the more chilling. So how do we get in? Piran asked, clearly tired of waiting. That's where I come in. Tormod Solvig looked like the Soul Reaper. His black leather armor was spattered with gore. His face was haggard, but his eyes blazed with purpose. Here and there on his armor, Blaine thought he saw the faint glow of runes and sigils pulsing with inner fire, and then going dark, only to appear elsewhere on the smooth black surface of the hardened leather. 
The Inca and Voss have the fighting well in hand, he reported. I figured I'd be the most help here. He turned his attention towards the dirt mound and its warding. Interesting, he murmured. That's divvy magic. Which is why Quintrell's still in there, and we're out here, Nicholas replied ill-humouredly. Tomad looked thoughtful. Difficult, but not impossible. He looked to the others. I think I know how to beat this, he said, a cold smile touching the corners of his lips. But it's going to take all of us working together. Half a candle mark later, everything was ready. Despite Tormund's warning and Nicholas's urging, Blaine refused to leave, regardless of the effect the magic might have on him. Kestel had not tried to persuade him to retreat, but he could see the worry in her eyes. Pirin looked ready for a fight. Never did like Quintrell from the time we laid eyes on him, he muttered. Tormund Solvik, Gav and the Majors, and the three knights of Estrain took up positions at the four quarters around the redoubt. Nicholas and twenty of his best soldiers formed a circle behind the majors, and Blaine, Pirin, and Kestel stood back, watching and waiting. Blaine gripped his protective amulet, and Kestel laid a hand on his arm, supporting him with the null magic charm she wore. No! Gav cried. The air within the circle felt thick and heavy, like just before a storm. Blaine felt power coalescing around them, coursing through them, as if it descended from the sky and flowed upward from the depths. The magic-diverting amulet was protecting him, but even it had its limits, and fighting Quintrell might push it past its abilities. He gasped, but waved off any assistance from Pirin. Kestel kept her distance from the majors, careful of her null charm. The glowing thread that was Blaine's Kruvgaldor link to Penhallow grew brighter, a supernatural lifeline linked to his blood. Blaine clung to the Kruvgaldor bond, holding tight to ride out the magic that was brewing around him. Power crackled from the upraised hands of the four majors, meeting with a sickly greenish glow as the magic and Quintrell's wardings collided. Tormod was chanting quietly, but although Blaine could not make out the words, the incantation sent a chill down his spine. The fog. It's back. Kestel's uneasiness was clear in her voice. Blaine glanced down and saw that the white mist was rolling around them, sweeping toward Tormod as if called to its master. The mist murmured like distant voices, and where it skimmed past Blaine's bare skin, it felt as if he was touched by grave, cold flesh. The fog rushed toward Tormod until it enveloped him, swallowing him up in its cloud. Then it rolled left and right, encircling the redoubt, a wall of fog as high as a man's shoulders, gradually taking the ghostly shape of men. Blaine felt a shift in the magic, and he had to struggle for a moment to catch his breath. Surrounded by the mist figures, Tormod's power, and the power of the Knights of Estrain, had grown stronger. The blue-white energy that assaulted the redoubt's wardings, and the green glow that countered it, vied with growing tension, crackling and sparkling like a lightning storm. Tormod gave a sudden cry in a strange language, and the major sent a pulse of blinding golden light at the green warding. Gav and the knights added their power to his, and at the same time the fog surged forward, straining against the green warding, unaffected by its snapping and spitting energy. The green warding burst, shooting a spire of light upward, lighting the area bright as day. It struck Quintrell's redoubt, throwing dirt high into the air and collapsing one side of the earthen structure which opened part of its roof to the sky. Tormod threw open his arms and shouted a declaration, and the light vanished. Blaine felt the magic strain against his deflection amulet, and he clenched his teeth to keep from crying out or staggering. A lone figure climbed to the top of the earthen wall. 
it was Vigus Quintrell. But his appearance was so altered that, at first, Blaine did not recognize him. Just in the months since Blaine and his friends had left Valshoa, Quintrell looked as if he had aged decades. His clothing was ripped and blood-stained, and his eyes were bright with madness. Quintrell's features twisted in a snarl. Around his neck, gleaming brilliantly against the darkness, was a small glass orb on a strap that pulsed with the rhythm of a heartbeat, his link with the divvy. Clutched in one hand was a larger, more brightly glowing orb with a mummified, withered hand, the divvy's anchor relic. I will not surrender, Quintrell shouted and he sent a barrage of lightning against all those gathered below. A circle of light flared from where Gav and the mages stood, strengthened by the spirits who had come to join them. The circle trapped the burst of power, and its energy sizzled and snapped as the two opposing magics warred against each other. Blaine's head throbbed, but the deflection amulet held. Quintrell gave a howl of rage, descending closer, close enough that Blaine knew he could reach Quintrell in a few running steps. Not yet, he told himself, itching for the opportunity. Not until the magic settles, or I'll never make it to Quintrell, but soon. Quintrell snapped his right arm forward, palm out, blasting energy toward the Knights of Estrain. The warding wavered rippling in a translucent curtain of light that reminded Blaine of the spirit lights of Edgeland. Blaine feared the warding would break, but the protective curtain surged back to its former strength. Look at his orb, Kestel hissed. She and Pirin had followed Blaine and stood just behind him. Blaine stared at the rapidly pulsing light trapped in the large crystal globe. Just staring at the crimson light made the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. Even the magic-diverting amulet could not completely shield him from the power the divi exuded, energy that triggered every primal warning deep in his brain, screaming for him to flee. Vigus Quintrell, you have lost. Surrender, Nicholas shouted. Quintrell loosed a wave of fire in response, but the warding held dissipating the wild energy as soon as it struck the shielding. Quintrell staggered, stumbling a few more steps down the wall of the embankment, stopping just beyond the ghost mist. His entire form trembled, and his face twisted in excruciating pain and unrelenting rage. Quintrell raised his hands for one final salvo, and his entire body glowed, suffused with the divvy's energy. He sent a new, fiery torrent, even stronger than the last, drawing on the divvy's magic along with his own. The fire burned blue-white, hot enough that it broke through the shielding of the mages at the forefront of Solvig's line, incinerating them where they stood. Both the larger orb and the small orb glowed with a blinding blood-red light. Blaine glimpsed a visage in the light, something that was not human, and never had been. Tormad, the knights, and the remaining mages held their position. Strain was clear in their faces, and sweat ran down Tormad's brow. Quintrell alone would have been no match for the power arrayed against him, but the divvy made it an unequal fight. If we could just break Quintrell's concentration, I think Tormad and the other mages could take him, Kestel said. Between her amulet and Blaine's, they held off enough of the power to keep Blaine conscious and functioning, although his head ached enough to blur his vision. They edged as close as they dared, nearing the front line off to one side, away from the full blast of the magical onslaught. Not if something doesn't change soon. Our majors are weakening, and Quintrell has the divvy to draw from. All Quintrell has to do is outlast them, and he wins, Blaine replied. Quintrell's magic punched through the mage's protective warding again, cutting down the soldiers in the front lines and slamming into Tormund's shielding so hard it knocked him from his saddle and felled his horse. The knights of Estrain rushed forward to meet the onslaught, along with Gav and what remained of his mages. But Gav's contingent had taken losses, and even the knights of Estrain were showing the strain. Tormund was pale and haggard, 
as if the level of magic on which he drew was pulling from his own life energy. Without warning, a streak of green fire flared behind Quintrell, looping and curling like a serpent around his body, snatching at the orb on the strap around his neck. An instant later, an arc of blue light struck Quintrell, too bright to look at for more than an instant. Look, Quintrell pointed. Two battered and bloodied figures had crawled from the ruins of the redoubt behind Quintrell. One held a bone as an athame, sending the blue flame against Quintrell, while the other loosed the green flame serpent from a relic clutched in her hand. Sweeter strain, Blaine thought. One of those mages is Carenza. Give me your amulet, Blaine said, his gaze fixed on Quintrell. If I hit Quintrell while he's weak, I might be able to take him. Ah, oh, we'll roast like chestnuts, Kestel replied. Let you charge him alone? Forget it. We go together. Quintrell's power wavered, and Blaine saw his chance. Now, he said. He and Kestel took off running. Quintrell howled in anger and wheeled to strike at the mages who had betrayed him. He made a slashing movement, and the maids with the bone athame screamed as deep gashes opened up his body from shoulder to hip. Just like he did to Carr, Blaine thought, intent on reaching the redoubt before Quintrell could react, praying to the gods for a miracle, that their two amulets might break Quintrell's power long enough for Tormod to finish the fight. Even if it kills me and takes the magic with me to the Sea of Souls, Quintrell snapped his left hand toward Carenza, and the divvy orb flared. Carenza did not lower her arm, and the serpentine power continued to strike at Quintrell, but smoke-like wisps began to unravel from her form, pulled toward the power of the divvy orb, and the orb pulsed brighter with every bit of smoke that entered it, while the green fire snake dimmed with every breath. The divvy orb absorbed the smoke wisps, drawing more and more of them from around Carenza and swallowing the smoke into the orb. Carenza staggered, clearly damaged by the loss of whatever energy was being drained from her. But she never let the green fire waver, and her gaze was fixed on Quintrell with a look of pure hatred. Then her whole body trembled, ashen as a corpse, and as Quintrell's orb swallowed the last of the smoke wisps, the green serpent light flickered and died. Carenza fell to the ground and did not move again. Blaine ran for Quintrell, sword in hand. At the last second, Quintrell turned and slashed with his hand, meaning to strike with the same invisible claws that he had used against Carenza. The deflection amulet held, and Blaine felt the power of the attack slide away without damage, though his head ached and pounded. Quintrell held up the divvy orb, and Blaine felt its power straining the amulet's protection, then sliding away before it could drain his soul, as it had Carenza's. From the look on her face, he was certain Kestel felt the attack against her null amulet, but she kept moving forward as if buffeted by a headwind. Blaine came at Quintrell with a sword in one hand and a knife in the other, Quintrell dodged at the last second, so the strike meant to cleave shoulder to hip only managed to sever Quintrell's right arm. Kestel tackled the mage from behind, jamming the null amulet against Quintrell's back as she grabbed the leather thong of the divvy orb and used it as a garrote. Our amulets were never meant to take on a divvy, Blaine thought. But if they can buy us just a few seconds more, we might destroy him or damage him enough that Tormod and the others can finish the job. Quintrell bucked against Kestel's grip on his throat as Blaine buried his knife in the Major's heart. Go to Raka, Blaine growled. Torven, take your soul. He twisted the blade, then yanked it free. Blood bubbled at Quintrell's mouth, and his body convulsed. Quintrell struggled to mouth the curse, but all that came was a wheezing gasp. In one savage sweep, Blaine severed Quintrell's head from his body. 
That's for Carr and Carenza, he muttered. The small orb burst into fragments, but the larger orb began to flicker wildly. We've got trouble, Kestel said, grabbing Blaine and rolling with him over the lip of the redoubt as the large orb flared searingly bright, then exploded into a rain of glass, and the spirit of the divvy burst forth. Blaine clawed his way to the top of the embankment and stared at the fire-red spirit, but it was too bright to see clearly, save for the indelible impression of grasping tendrils and an open, hungry maw. The knights of Estrain joined forces with Tormod's magic. So did Gav, the last of the regular mages still standing. Together they sent a single, massive lance of power that struck the divvy in its core. Silvery light suffused the divvy's form, driving out the crimson fire, and behind the trapped spirit, Blaine swore he saw a rift in the darkness that was blacker than the night. Pain lanced through Blaine's head, threatening to black him out, as the massive outpouring of magic overwhelmed the protections of his deflecting amulet. Even the support of the Krufgaldor and Kestel's null amulet seemed tenuous, strained by the maelstrom of power. Blaine clung to consciousness, watching through slitted eyes as blinding silver light pushed the divvy back into the unnatural darkness. Perhaps because he was so near to death himself, Blaine saw the ghost mist rise from Quintrell's corpse, struggling to uncoil itself from his body, twisting free, only to be pulled into the divvy's grasp. Blaine heard a scream of utter terror, an ear-splitting shriek from the divvy that rent the night. And then both the divvy and the rift were gone. Blaine dragged himself over the edge of the embankment and crawled to where the two renegade mages lay. One was a man he did not recognize. Carenza's body lay next to the dead mage, Blaine turned her over gently, calling her name. Deep, bloody slashes savaged her chest and belly. Her skin was grey, and she looked as drawn and gaunt as if she had been fasting, drained of her life by the divvy. Carenza's head lolled, and her eyes were wide and staring. Thank you, Blaine murmured to Carenza and the other maid as Kestel moved up beside him. The world reeled around Blaine. Blaine's heart pounded erratically, and his head felt ready to explode. Even his Krufgaldor bond could not sustain him any longer. Exhausted, grief-stricken, and utterly spent, Blaine fell face forward onto the ground, giving himself up to the darkness. Chapter 34 Six days after the victory against Quintrell and the warlords, thanks to the healers and Penhallow, Blaine was ready to fight another kind of battle. The new Lords of the Blood gathered at Myrdalor for one more attempt to anchor the magic securely. Now, after all the preparation, it was finally time. Before you enter, the working demands blood. Blaine looked up to see Dagger holding a silver chalice and a bowl and knife. Rickard stood beside him, the sigil-carved wood held in his grip. Blaine slid back the sleeve of his shirt, bearing his left forearm. Take it, he said. Dagger drew the ritual knife across Blaine's skin, scoring deep enough to raise a thin stream of blood. He harvested it carefully into the chalice, and one by one the others offered an arm for the bloodletting. When each of the thirteen had been bled, Dagger and Rickard moved to the opening of the labyrinth. Dagger murmured something, and ruins appeared in the stone walkway, marking the first step of the maze. Rickard held the sigil-carved wood over the marked stone. Dagger raised the chalice to each of the four quarters in turn, and then poured out the blood over the sigils. 
His chant grew louder as the blood spilled over the carved wood, and there was a rush of power spreading from the first stepping stone all along the pathway of the labyrinth as power called to power. When the cup was dry, Rickard fit the carved wooden piece into a depression beside the opening to the labyrinth. He was bloody to the wrists, and the floor was stained crimson. Enter, Rickard said to the thirteen. Carry the mingled blood on the soles of your feet. The chamber is ready for the ritual. As Blaine and his companions wound their way into the labyrinth, Nidhud, Dagger, and the other mages began to chant. The chant was mellifluous, with a second and then a third group of chanters joining in the repetitive phrases like a round until the chamber seemed to swell with plain chant. Blaine felt the magic rising with the chant, winding around them as they coiled their way into the heart of the labyrinth. The crystals, which had pulsed lazily before, now glowed brightly with amber light. Perhaps it was a trick of the torchlight, but to Blaine's eyes the crystals seemed to be pulsing along with the chant. The obsidian disc hung on a strap around Blaine's neck, over his heart. It had been cold to the touch when Blaine entered the labyrinth, but it grew warmer the farther along the path he went. Now the disc felt fevered, warmer than Blaine's skin, and the runes and markings etched into its glossy surface were pulsing with a golden glow from deep inside. The last time Blaine had worked the ritual at Myrdalore, he had been alone inside the maze. Then it felt as if the labyrinth was fighting him at every step, turning its magic against him. Perhaps it had been, trying to protect him from what was to come, from nearly being killed by magic too wild to be completely bound. This time, among twelve compatriots, the magic of the labyrinth felt completely different. Instead of fighting him, the magic drew him forward, quickening his step so that, if he had not been mindful of it, he might have ended up running. From the looks on the faces of his companions, Blaine was certain that at least a few of them could feel the pull of the magic themselves. Of those he had chosen to become the new lords of the blood, most had some level of magic. Blaine's own magic, before the great fire, gave him an edge in battle, augmenting his natural agility and training, and since the ritual at Valshoa, he had felt the battle magic enhance his speed and strength. Since he had made the first anchoring, he had also gained a few seconds of precognition, knowing where the enemy would move, and making it easier for Blaine to anticipate and block the strike. His crew of Galdor with Penhallo strengthened his endurance and made him harder to kill, and, as Kestel had pointed out, Awareness of where magic was being worked was a valuable early warning signal. Blaine had no idea whether this night's working would allow him to keep those skills, strip him of his limited magic entirely, or change him in some new and unexpected way. The last time the magic was successfully bound, the Lords of the Blood gained new abilities, though it did not make mages of those who had not been mages before, nor had it turned the mages into gods. Blaine thought that he would be content to just live through the working and have it succeed. Connor was a medium, and the wraith lord who possessed him qualified, to Blaine's thinking, as a magical creature in his wraith state, certainly supernatural. Borea's magic added to his acrobatic ability, while Dolan, a knight of Estrain, was a mage as well as a warrior and Talishte. Nicholas had no magic. Neither did Pirin, who made it clear that he thought that lack was a good thing. Varen's magic enabled him to pick locks and gain people's trust. Dor's ability enhanced his talent for metalworking. Penhallow was Talishte, supernatural in his essence, and, to Blaine's thinking, the Krufgaldor counted as magic, though Penhallow was vague on the matter. Blaine had no idea what magic, if any, Folville, Voss, and Werner possessed, though Tormod Salvig had clearly demonstrated just how powerful his necromancy was. Look at the walls. 
Nicholas murmured. The paintings of the constellations on the walls had begun to glow. Instead of the flat paintings that had been there a few moments before, the murals now seemed to be windows into the heavens, as if Blaine could reach his arm through the rock and into the cosmos. The air itself was astir with magic. Perhaps it was a trick of the torchlight, but to Blaine's eyes the air shimmered, as if someone had loosed gold dust on the wind. Overhead, Perrin said in a low, warning voice. Blaine glanced up, and the dark ceiling of the underground chamber had been replaced by the coruscating colors and brilliance of the spirit lights of Edgeland. One of the mages had begun a steady rhythm on a hand drum. The beat reverberated in the chamber. Sensors set around the exterior of the labyrinth burned sage in smoky bundles, adding the candle smoke. Candles glimmered at intervals along the labyrinth, one at each circle reserved for a lord of the blood. Blaine felt disoriented, as if, with the chanting and the drumming, the glimmering lights and the glittering air, power rose and fell with every breath. His head was swimming, his knees felt weak, and it was difficult for him to keep his focus, though he clung to the urgency of his mission. Blaine inhaled the sweet sage smoke that hung in the air, breathing deeply, letting it fill his head and lungs, clearing his thoughts. His body felt light, as if he were not completely grounded in the world. He dared not turn to see if the others felt the same. Though the chamber was bounded by stone walls, and the labyrinth was clearly marked in the rock floor, Blaine knew that if he took his eyes off the place where he must stand, he might lose his way. Time within the labyrinth seemed to move at a different pace. After what seemed like forever, Blaine reached the spot where he had stood the last time, when the magic nearly killed him. In the paintings of the constellations, he could see the stars moving in their courses, like looking up into the night sky. A rain of falling stars glimmered across one of the portals. Perhaps the boundaries between land and sky have been weakened by the magic, Blaine thought. Or maybe to magic, the boundaries are only in our imagination. Blaine glanced toward the others outside the labyrinth. Though the labyrinth was only a few strides across from where he stood, it seemed as if Kestel, Zarie, and the mages stood on the far side of a great chasm farther away than the rock-bound room made possible. Or else magic alters the space, once the power is invoked, and we are in a place that's not quite where we set out to go, he thought. Step into your circle, Dolan said. Glancing at the others, assuring himself that they were all moving into place, Blaine drew a breath to steady himself, and stepped into the circle appointed for him. At once, all of their presence crystals flared with a deep orange light. The golden runes on his onyx disc glowed brilliantly. From the ceiling of the chamber, the coruscating light spread, dropping around them like a curtain to separate those within the labyrinth from those on the outside of the circle. Blaine caught a glimpse of Kestel's face and saw the fear in her eyes, but there was no turning back. Dolan had divined a word of power for each of the participants, an ancient word to speak aloud and activate the magic. Once spoken together, the words of power would bind the magic, tethering its wildness with stronger bonds than one man alone could forge. Through the ritual, the magic would be grounded and bound to each of them and through each of them altering them and placing a sacred bond and duty upon their eldest sons for all the future. For the Talishte, the working bound them personally as guardians of the magic. For a moment, the silence was unbearable. It was as if the cosmos, and not just those within and outside the circle, waited for the words to be spoken. The constellations bore witness, and the shimmering light, the runes, and the crystals all connected in the massing power that Blaine could feel crackling in the air, 
waiting. A hunty, Blaine said in a loud, clear voice. The others spoke their words just a breath after Blaine, each a different word, echoing through the chamber. Together, the syllables rolled like thunder, as if they were not meant to be spoken by mortals. The many-colored lights curtaining off the circle flared so brightly that Blaine shielded his eyes with his arm. In addition to the sound of the major's plain chant and drumming, Blaine swore he could hear the shimmer of bells and hundreds, perhaps thousands of voices, an unseen choir of all those who had come before them. The constellations whirled and spun, dancing in the cosmos, their colors brilliant and fantastic. The air smelt like the tang after a lightning storm, beautiful, hypnotic, and utterly terrifying. The sounds, smells, and images were intoxicating. Blaine stood transfixed, waiting for what would happen next. Blue-white bolts of energy rained from the top of the light dome. Some of the bolts struck along the pathway, but thirteen of the bolts found their targets, striking each of the new lords of the blood in the crown of their heads and racing down through their bodies into the rock beneath their feet. Blaine's body was frozen in the arc of light. He expected to smell burning hair and searing flesh, to feel the energy burn him alive, and he readied himself to die. In that instant, Blaine saw the others transfixed by the brilliant light, held immobile in its glare, eyes wide. Some looked frightened, others angry, some ready to flee if they could. Blaine wondered what they saw when they looked at him. If the Wraith Lord expected this and didn't tell me, we're going to have a chat about this if we all survive, Blaine thought. Blaine felt a wordless reassurance deep in his mind, something he had come to recognize as his Kruvgaldo bond with Penhalo. He had a sense of Penhalo's presence, an infusion of resilience, and an unspoken certainty that he would be strong enough to endure. Is that why Connor seems so at ease with all of this? Blaine wondered. His bond must be many times stronger than mine, and he's channeling the Wraith Lord spirit. It's nice to be able to draw on Penhallow's strength, but will it be enough? What if it isn't? The chamber faded from Blaine's sight, replaced by a vision of Glen Reith. This was the manner as he knew it, before his exile, before the great fire, when the lands had been prosperous and the great house in good repair. Ian Macfadden was beneath one of the trees in the orchard, and though his back was turned, from the way his fist rose and fell, it was clear, even at a distance, that something had drawn his wrath. Blaine saw himself, a half-grown youth, come running down the manor stairs, shouting at his father. Ian did not pause or turn, and Blaine caught a glimpse of the victim of his father's wrath. Ian held Carr by one arm in an unbreakable grip, while the other large fist landed blow after blow. There was no sound in Blaine's vision, though the figures were speaking. Blaine did not need to hear them. He remembered. In the vision, Blaine came running at Ian's back, roaring like a bull, and caught his father between the shoulder blades with his own shoulder, shoving him hard enough that Ian stumbled and let go of Carr's arm. Carr scrambled to his feet and ran off as Ian rounded on Blaine. Blaine had grabbed the nearest weapon he could find, a long, forked branch from a nearby tree, and he used it to keep Ian at a distance. Both exchanged shouts, red in the face with anger, as Ian attempted to dodge around Blaine's guard. And Blaine kept his father far enough away to postpone the beating that was certain to follow. Time in the vision slowed, freezing like the inlaid images in a mosaic. And in that moment, 
Blaine saw something in Ian's face he did not remember from the encounter long ago. Rage twisted Ian's facial expression, but in his eyes was naked fear. He knew, Blaine thought. Somehow, even then, he knew I would kill him. Before I knew, before it had even crossed my mind, he saw his fate. The vision shifted, as if someone had stirred the placid surface of still water. Blaine saw an unbroken expanse of white that stretched into the grey horizon, and more snow falling from slate-coloured skies. He shivered as the snow fell on bare skin, where his ragged prison uniform had been shredded by Prokeev's beating. A soldier on either side dragged him, one on each arm, with Blaine between them as a dead weight, too injured to stand. It was Velland, one of the many times Blaine had gotten on the wrong side of the prison colony's violent commander. Blood dripped from Blaine's mouth into the snow, leaving a crimson path of droplets. Red stains trailed behind him from his injuries as the guards dragged him across the snow. The gritty ice burned against his raw wounds until his skin grew numb from cold. Blaine knew where the figures and the vision were going, to the hole Prokeef's oubliettes cut into the ice. One guard removed the lid from the hole. Then the two guards heaved Blaine into the darkness. Blaine tumbled down, deep into the ice, as they replaced the lid and left him in blackness. He landed hard. Prokeef might have the soldiers haul Blaine out after a day or two, but he might leave him to die of cold. Blaine expected nothing. Then, as now, when he was dying, the visions had come to him, Voices and bells and coruscating power, visions he did not remember until now, when he saw them anew. I barely realized I had any magic at all, Blaine thought. Not then, but the magic knew me. Meridians ran beneath Edgeland, perhaps beneath Velland. Perhaps that's why I survived. Could the power have recognized the bond in my blood, even then, and sustained me? As abruptly as the visions came, they vanished, and with them went the blinding light. Blaine fell to the ground, as if even breathing required more energy than remained. He was bleeding afresh from the cut on his arm and from his battle wounds, and every muscle and sinew ached. From what he could glimpse, the other twelve, even the Taliste, had collapsed. Their bodies twitched, reassuring Blaine that they were alive. The candles had gutted out. Gone also was the coruscating light curtain separating the labyrinth from the chamber. Blaine's presence crystal lay where he had dropped it, but now it was nothing more than a carved piece of charred stone. The obsidian disc hung on its lanyard, flipped face up against his shirt dark. As the shock of being alive receded, Blaine realized that the chant and drumming continued. Magic flowed around and through the chamber, through him and through the others, a silent, roaring river, and for the first time since the cataclysm, that torrent felt clean and unimpeded. We did it, Blaine thought wearily. I don't know if it'll work the same as it used to, but the magic is back. We did it. He made it to his knees before the chambers swam in his vision, and he fell onto all fours, retching violently. Every muscle in his body tightened painfully, sending tremors that cramped his arms and legs and clenched his gut. His heartbeat stuttered, and he labored for breath. Blaine fell forward onto the cold stone of the labyrinth and fought to remain conscious. 
Going into the labyrinth winds the magic up, Plain thought. We have to walk the rest of the maze to release the power, or we'll die here. Get up! His voice was a harsh rasp. He managed to reach his knees and then stood, swaying. We've got to get out or the magic will eat us alive. One by one, the others stirred. Penhallow and Dolan were the first to regain their footing, followed by Connor. When Blaine was certain the thirteen men were conscious and able to move, they began the careful trek back to the outside of the labyrinth. When they had gone in, the power had not fought them. But the return journey felt to Blaine as if they struggled against a headwind. He was utterly exhausted, and the half-healed battle wounds ached anew from the strain of the magic. Sheer willpower kept him moving, careful to stay inside the labyrinth path, one foot in front of the other. Yet with each step, the power captured in the maze dissipated, and Blaine felt the oppressive weight lift. Outside the maze, the mages kept up the chant and drumbeat as Blaine staggered from the warded circle. Kestel was waiting for him, and he leaned hard on her as he stumbled. Mages and guards cleared out of their way as Blaine made his way to the rock wall, unwilling to collapse until he was certain the others made it out. When the power struck you, I thought you were going to die, Kestel admitted. Although Blaine leaned back against the wall, she stayed under his arm to keep him on his feet. The new Lords of the Blood looked as hard-used as Blaine felt, even the Taliste. So did I, Blaine replied. But not this time. Not tonight, he smiled. Tonight, we won. Chapter 35 I can't believe we're not all either dead or barking mad, Pirin said. Who says we're not? Connor replied. A small group gathered in one of the underground rooms beneath Myrdalore after the ritual was over. The knights had provided food and drink for the mortals and flagons of fresh deer blood for the Taliste, as well as pallets where the participants in the night's working could rest. Blaine agreed with Connor, though at the moment he was too utterly spent to make a flippant remark. Here, eat this. You'll feel better, Kestel said, bringing bread, smoked meat, and cheese to Blaine and Pirin, along with hot cups of fat. Blaine shook his head to clear it, and immediately regretted the action. I really don't remember much after the lightning, he said. His voice was raspy, and his entire body ached. Still, he eyed the food hungrily, feeling as if he had fasted for days. Zarye looked after Borja, Varen, and Dor, and across the cramped room, the other mages brought food, drink, or blood to the rest of the weary participants. It was a lot like the last time, Kestel said, trying to keep her tone light. Blaine could hear the concern she'd tried to hide. We were all on the outside of that curtain of power, totally helpless, and there was nothing even the mages could do except watch you twist and scream in pain. Her voice was steady, but Blaine saw the worry in her eyes. We had no idea whether, when it was all done, you'd all survive, or whether there would be nothing left but ashes, she added brushing a strand of red hair out of her eyes. Damn it, Plain. Don't you ever do that to me again. And did I worry you awfully, Kestel? Piran asked with exaggerated concern. Kestel rolled her eyes and punched him in the shoulder. You? Not really, Kestel said with a forced chuckle. She sighed. Honestly, it was awful. I didn't see how anyone could live through that. Neither did I, Blaine admitted, sipping his hot cup of fat. Good to see you awake, if not exactly up and around, Nidhood said, walking among the pallets to get to Blaine. Did it work? Blaine asked, looking up. Mostly, 
Nidhud replied. Dagger Rickard and the others are testing that now. What do you mean, mostly? Piran asked, with a dangerous note in his voice. Nidhud shrugged. The magic appears to be stable. We'll have to test to see if that's really the case, and whether it's temporary or permanent. Is the magic what it used to be? Probably not, Nidhud said, and held up his hands to forestall argument. Hear me out. You intend to rebuild much of what was destroyed in the cataclysm, right? He asked, and the others nodded. But no one would claim that what is rebuilt would be exactly as it was before. For a lot of reasons, it can never be exactly as before, but it might be just as good, perhaps even better. Blaine was silent for a few moments, thinking as he ate. To no one's surprise, Penhallow and Dolan were back on their feet the quickest. They were followed by Connor, the first of the mortals to recover. Blaine watched Connor with worried interest, wondering just how much his bond with Penhallow had changed him. And how has it changed me, really? Blaine wondered. Even now he could feel a hint of the Grufgaldo bond active in the back of his mind. He was too tired to argue about it, fearing that without Penhallow's assistance he might collapse. Bits and pieces of memories came back to him from the ritual, of visions and nightmares, and of the underlying bond that held fast beneath them, like a lifeline. Later, I'm really going to have to have a long talk with both Penhallow and Connor he promised himself. What about the others? Blaine asked, glancing around the crowded room. He had expected Pirin and Nicholas to recover rapidly, since they did not have magic, and he guessed that the same might be true of Folville, Boss, and Bergen Werner. None of those men looked to have rebounded yet. Dolan and Penhallow walked over to join them, as did Connor. Do you remember the Wraith Lord telling you that the last time magic was anchored successfully at Myrdalor, the Lords of the Blood found themselves changed? Dolan asked, having heard Blaine's question. Blaine nodded, uneasily. Yes. Well, we think something similar happened today as well, but we're not sure just what. Dolan replied. Pirin looked at him as if daring him to make a response. You're trying to tell me that because I got hit by lightning, now I can throw fire from my fingertips? Dolan chuckled. Probably not. I think you're safe from that, he said. But if the anchoring works as it did in the past, each of you now has some new magically enhanced ability, or a previous ability has been strengthened. It may take you each a while to figure out what that ability is, and how to use it. He shrugged. Perhaps it's magic's way of assuring your survival, making you harder to kill. Piran snorted. After it did its best to kill us itself, he countered. The last time, how did the ritual change you? Kestel asked Connor, addressing the Wraith Lord. He hesitated, and they could see a change come over his manner as the Wraith Lord took possession. Vantold looked thoughtful. It was quite a long time ago, he said. I have been trying to remember. He looked at Pirin. One thing I am certain of, it did not change the participants into mages. King Merrill could truth sense, though he tried to keep that a secret. Kestel mused. Were the abilities gained or enhanced on that level of magic? Vantold nodded. I agree with Dolan that the alterations were protective, but not of full mage strength. He frowned, thinking. Foresight, touch magic to read the history of an object the ability to talk with spirits, but not to summon them, divination with fire and water, an ability to see magic 
and supernatural power and thus evade traps. Being able to read another person's thoughts, heightened intuition, and in one case, as I recall, dreaming that enabled the person's spirit to travel the astral paths without his body. All abilities that were valuable for rulers. And all of the mortals gained an extended lifespan, not unlike the effect of the Kruvgaldor. I don't feel any different, Blaine said. But upon reflection, he realized that was not entirely true. His senses seemed sharper and his awareness keener than normal. Colors looked brighter, sounds carried farther, and his eyesight seemed to note details he might not have been aware of before the ritual. Perhaps that's also why I'm now so aware of the Kruvgaldo with Penhalo, he thought. Usually it's forgotten unless it's needed. What about Solvig? Blaine asked. Noticing that of all of them, Tormad Solvig seemed to be taking the longest to rally. The Wraith Lord, Dolan, and Tormad were the only true mages among those within the circle, Penhallow replied, and Dolan had his Talishte strength to rely on. Solvig's magic is quite powerful, so I suspect that the ritual took a greater toll on him than on the rest of you. Will he retain his magic? Kestel asked, frowning in concern. With luck, Nidhud replied. The thing is, we don't know whether the changes from the ritual happen immediately or manifest over time. It could be days, even months, before all of you truly realize how the ritual has changed you. If it's all the same to you, I'd rather not get into a battle to test the theory, Blaine said with a tired half-smile. He fell silent, searching his thoughts. And yet... Oh, Kestel said. Blaine concentrated, listening for the magic he had learned to sense when he was its sole anchor. I think the ritual changed my ability to know when magic is being worked nearby, from a problem to a benefit. It doesn't drain me anymore. But I still know where magic's being used. A handy thing, especially in battle, he said finally, meeting Nidhud's gaze. Nidhud nodded. A change that might have some protective benefits if it becomes permanent, he replied. What about the storms? If the magic's anchored, will the storms lessen? Gestel asked. The Wraith Lord, speaking through Connor, grimaced. Not sure. That's one of the things it will take us some time to figure out. In fact, magic itself is going to require some refiguring to see exactly what has changed with this new binding, he said. This upends everything, just as the cataclysm did originally, the Wraith Lord continued. We know we can't go back to what we had before, but what we have now remains to be seen. He gave an enigmatic smile that belonged to Kirk and Vandhold, not to Bev and Connor. These next few months are going to be very interesting. Their speculation ended as Nidhud was called away by one of the mages, while a Taliste guard beckoned to Penhallow and Connor. Should we be worried? Kestel murmured, watching Penhallow and Connor in close conference with the guard. Probably, Blaine replied. But right now, I want to go outside, he added, feeling suddenly claustrophobic. I need some air. Blaine and Kestel wound their way through the tunnels beneath Myrdalur until a set of stone stairs led upward into the night. Outside, the cold air was fresh and bracing, and for once the sky was clear, filled with bright stars. How many days were we in there? Blaine asked, leaning against one of the ruined stone walls. Three, Kestel replied. 
you were all either unconscious or barely able to move for a long time, she said tiredly. She let out a long breath. It seemed to take forever. Soldiers patrolled the ruined grounds of the old manor. Beyond the tumble-down stone walls, troops from each of the victorious warlords' armies stood guard to assure they would not be ambushed. Blaine's own men, along with those loyal to Treovos, the Solvigs, and Verna, presented a large, united force against anyone who might seek to interfere. Add to that, Taliste, belonging to Penhallow and the Wraith Lord, and Blaine felt like he could rest easy, at least for a night. Rinka Solvig spotted him as she gave orders to one of her commanders. When the soldiers were dismissed, she strode over with an expression of worry and anger. There you are, she said, looking him up and down. You survived? Good. What of my brother? Blaine told her what he knew, watched her dark eyes narrow as she considered his report. But he still sleeps? she questioned. Blaine nodded. Yes, those with strong magic are taking longer to recover, and he may come away from the ritual with even more magic than he had before. Maybe a good thing, she replied, her face unreadable. Maybe not. What happened up here during the ritual? Kestel asked. Any problems? Rinka gave a cold chuckle. Nothing we couldn't handle. Her red armor showed cuts and gashes from the battle on the northern plains, dark stains and splatter that did not beg close examination. Her skin was streaked with dirt and blood, and her hair was wet with sweat despite the cold. It was obvious that she and the soldiers had fought a battle while the others were in the underground chamber. Rinka looked more haggard and gaunt than Blaine remembered, and he wondered if the twins shared a bond of their own, magical or not, that connected her to her brother's distress. What happened? Blaine asked. Rinka's smile was the expression of a predator. Henock made an attempt to disrupt what we were doing. We did not permit that. Did he survive? Kestel's interest matched Rinka's for deadly focus. Rinka gave a contemptuous look. That depends on how much blood he loses on his way home, she said. We sent his troops running with their tails between their legs like curs. I stopped the commanders from pursuing them because they weren't our priority, and I had no desire to be led into a trap. Lysander survivors have scattered, and so have Rostovans, Blaine replied. They know they won't be welcome among our allies, which leaves Hanok and Pollard, unless another warlord comes to the fore. Rinka made a dismissive gesture. There will always be men happy to snap up the scraps and cobble them back together. She shrugged. No matter to us. If another power arises, it'll have to challenge us. She smiled, baring her teeth. And we will kill them, like we've killed the others. They might have asked her more questions, but a captain called for her, and with a nod she returned to her troops. Could it be that simple? Kestel murmured, as Blaine slipped an arm around her shoulders, partly in affection and partly because he was feeling the strain of standing. Blaine sighed. Probably not, he admitted, watching as the soldiers bustled around the courtyard and the perimeter. Pollard's the power behind Henock, and Pollard won't give up until one of us is dead. He let his gaze rise to the black night sky and the stars, which seemed even brighter and closer than usual. Pantreath Reese was bound, but not destroyed. Until he's dust, I'm not counting him out. I don't think Penhallow and the Wraith Lord have forgotten about him either. Kestel leaned into him. True, and if the survivors from Lysander and Rostovan join up with Henock, he might be ready to field an army a lot sooner than we'd like to think. 
Blaine nodded wearily. That's certainly possible. Probable, even. And we'll face the threat when it comes. Dondereth's harrowing was not over. Not yet, but perhaps soon. And during it all, there were crops to plant and harvest, walls to rebuild, ale to brew, and a continent to reclaim. It's time to be a lord for a while, instead of a warlord, Blaine said, pulling Kestel close, enjoying her nearness. I'm ready to go home to Glenreath. There's work to be done. Epilogue. Two weeks later. If Reese is still imprisoned, why do we need to see the elders again? Connor was seated across the table from Penhallow, and he was aware that the Wraith Lord's spirit hovered nearby. It was just a fortnight after the ritual at Myrdalore, and even though Connor knew that his strengthened bond with Penhallow would change him, he was amazed at how quickly his body had healed. From having been a breath away from the Sea of Souls, Connor now felt healthy and strong. Even the memory of the horror of that night seemed to have dimmed. Connor fought to remember, unwilling to allow the event to recede in his mind. Because matters are not yet settled. The Wraith Lord's voice was a rough whisper, and Connor knew that Van Holt was doing him a kindness by refraining from possessing him until absolutely necessary. Reese's maker has returned. Connor could not repress a shiver. Reese's maker still exists? Penhallow nodded soberly. Thrain is as old as I am, perhaps a bit older. He was a ruthless and violent man when he was alive, and centuries of undeath haven't improved him. Is Thrain an elder or a lord? Connor searched his memory, but he could not remember ever having heard that name at court. Perhaps you know him by his war name, Hemlock, the Wraith Lord replied. Connor's eyes widened. I thought Hemlock was a superstition, like Red Mariah, the witch who appears in mirrors if called thrice and steals souls. A look passed between Penhallow and the Wraith Lord, and Connor drew back. Oh, no, don't do it. You're going to tell me that Red Mariah isn't entirely a superstition either, aren't you? I don't want to hear it. Red Mariah was an insane and bloodthirsty conjurer who was cursed to wander the unseen realm for her crimes. Van Holt replied, And as you recall, I too inhabit the unseen realm. I have seen her, unfortunately. She is no myth. Red Mariah is the least of our worries, Penhallow said. But Thrain, Hemlock, is another matter. The fact that there are rumours that he's returned are worrisome, especially given how fragile the consensus of the elders is right now. Return from where? Connor leaned forward. We don't know. That's the problem. Thrain disappeared nearly seventy years ago, without a trace. Penhallow replied. He was not the type to avoid attention, so his absence, while not minded, was frequently remarked upon. And now he's back. Why? Connor asked. That, my lad, is the problem, the Wraith Lord said. There have been rumours that Thrain has stepped in to take advantage of the opportunities now that Lysander, Quintrell, and Rostovan have been killed. He paused. It's also likely that he'll try to enable Rhys to escape. Rhys has been a valuable servant. Can he do that? Rhys, I mean. Can he get loose? Penhallo shrugged. You are in the oubliette with Lawrence. 
Despite the most stringent mortal precautions, Lawrence managed to slip his bonds. Few of our kind supported Lawrence. I suspect that Rhesus' support is somewhat broader, though many would hesitate to speak of it aloud. What does Thrain want from the elders? Connor asked. Knowing Thrain, he's got a long list of demands, Van Hallow observed dryly. But I'm sure he will insist that Rhys be released. He'll try to get sanctions against the Wraith Lord and me for having brought Rhys to the Elder's attention. Would the Elder support him? Doubtful, the Wraith Lord replied. But if you recall, in the last vote among the Elders, they were hardly united. Out of the thirteen elders, five voted to merely punish Rhys and not require the final death, while three would have freed him without sanction and punished Penhallow and me for having brought the matter up. His spectral figure shook its head. That's a thin margin. Are any of the elders on our side? Connor asked. Penhallow chuckled. On our side? Only Kirken here that we're sure of, he replied. The others vote primarily for their own self-interest. But aren't the elders supposed to rule for what's best for Taliste as a group? Connor asked. Yet he remembered the often contentious debates within the king's council when nobles fought over petty issues when they, too, were supposed to be responsible for the welfare of the kingdom as a whole. Penhallow looked resigned. When the kings of Dondreth ruled, the elders had a purpose. Under mortal rule, we needed a governing body of our own to enforce a code of conduct designed to avoid the kind of slaughter that happened when the knights of Estrain were banished, or when Lawrence went on a rampage. He shook his head. Now there's no single mortal ruler, no recognized authority, the threat of organized extermination is not imminent, and some among our kind are thinking that it would be good if that situation remained permanent. It can't, the Wraith Lord replied. Mortals outnumber us by too large a number. We will always be vulnerable, but there are fools who forget those constraints and dream of a world without rules. Penhallow raised an eyebrow. Any man who rails against the need for government bears watching very closely. Honest men appreciate the constables. Only those who wish to do something they should not be doing fear and hate the rule of law. So why are we going before the elders again? Connor asked. We are going before the elders because someone has to stand against Thrain. Penhallow replied. We do have allies, the Wraith Lord said. Silver, onyx, and gold all voted for death. They're the least likely to change their vote. It's the ones who voted for punishment we need to watch, Penhallow added. Had Merrill still been on the throne and the kingdom been as it was, I am certain that several, maybe all, of those votes would have changed to death. And if Thrain gets his way, he'll try to change enough of those votes to get Rhys released, Connor said. Won't he? Penhallow and the Wraith Lord nodded. And if he does, that means Rhys will be out for revenge, Penhallow said. Lundmire, the estate of the Wraith Lord, was a two-candlemark ride from Westbane. Connor rode alongside Penhallow, too preoccupied with his thoughts for conversation. Several Taliste bodyguards followed them. The Wraith Lord had gone on ahead, unencumbered by the need for transportation. I'm tired of nearly dying or being killed every other day. Connor grumbled to himself. I just came back from battle, and then the ritual at Myrdalor, and here we go, riding into a confrontation with ancient Taliste, who could squash me like a bug. The Wraith Lord's men were waiting for them when they reached Lundmire's boundaries. My soldiers and I will wait for you here, Penhallow said. 
and if we're needed, Kirkin will be able to summon us. The Wraith Lord materialized next to them. The others will be here in a few moments, he said. Connor, I fear this may go badly. That's why Lanyon has his soldiers present, and why I need your help. Connor nodded. If it keeps Reese locked up, count me in. Connor gave his reins over to the Talishto soldiers. He opened himself to the Wraith Lord's spirit, no longer surprised that the possession did not tax his energy as quickly as before his strengthened bond with Penhallow. How will they know I'm you? Connor fretted as he walked on foot along the narrow path to the circle of standing stones where the elders would convene their session. Kirk and Van Holtz chuckled. Ask your friends sometime whether they can tell the difference between us. I may share your body, but our mannerisms are quite different. The standing stones were large, hand-hewn monoliths that had been raised in their circle in a time long forgotten, even by Taliste. Their builders were a matter of legend and argument. Majors, astronomers, and scholars debated their origin, but the common folk went out of their way to avoid the circles. One by one, the elders assembled, each masked and robed figure standing in front of one of the thirteen standing stones. Connor watched as they took their places. Behind their jewel-toned masks, it was impossible to see the faces or expressions. Their masks made them even more intimidating and far less human. Who summoned us? Emerald was the first to speak. I did. A broad-shouldered man Connor had never seen before strode into the circle. He had dark hair and coarse features with black eyes that missed no advantage. The man had a powerful chest and muscular arms, but he looked more like one of the ruffians hired to keep the peace in a disreputable tavern. I am Thrain, but perhaps you know me better as Hemlock. None of the masked figures spoke, but from their stance, Connor could see that the names were known to them. Some turned toward Thrain, eager to hear what he might say. Others leaned back, wary. Still more crossed their arms or turned away. Why have you asked for this convocation? The Wraith Lord asked. Thrain eyed Connor, as if trying to figure out what to make of him. What right does a mortal have to be here, let alone know my reasons? Thrain retorted. He is my servant, my spirit bearer, and it is my right to know. The Wraith Lord replied in a tone that made his anger at Thrain's lack of respect clear. Thrain had the good sense to make a low bow in concession. My apologies, Lord Van Holt. I did not recognize you. You have not answered my question, the Wraith Lord replied, sweeping aside the apology. Thrain stood to his full height, and his chin rose. You've imprisoned my blood son, Pentreath Rees, Thrain said, turning to take in the masked figures who encircled him. I ask you to reconsider and free him. Are you aware that it is a penalty worthy of death to convene the elders without cause? Onyx asked. Thrain made a low bow. Yes, my lords, and I am quite fond of my neck. I do not risk it lightly. Yet here I am. We have already considered the evidence against Pentry Threes and determined his fate. This time it was Silver who spoke. We do not reconsider our judgments lightly, Gold added, and we have rarely reversed our rulings. Why should we now? For someone whose fate hung on the forbearance of a group of immortal Taliste, Thrain looked very much at ease. Connor watched Thrain, sizing him up as he paced back and forth in the center of the circle. 
The arrogance and Thrain's mannerisms reminded Connor of many nobles he had met when he was in Lord Garnock's employ. Because times have changed, my lords, Thrain said. The elders were gathered to protect Taliste against powerful mortals. He turned in a circle, one hand out, palm up, as if to gesture toward the world itself. Behold, there are no more powerful mortals. The kings of the continent are dead, and there are no heirs. Much of the nobility is dead, and what remains is impoverished and disorganized. If the threat for which the elders were gathered no longer exists, why are we bound by rules from a time that is no more and never will be again? As much as Connor disliked Thrain, he had to admit that the man's natural charisma made it impossible to ignore him. He wondered if Thrain's charm might be a form of magic. Rhys attacked me on my lands, and Penhallo in his crypt, the Wraith Lord counted. Those actions alone are punishable by death. Yet we are so few now, aren't we? Thrain asked, hands clasped in front of him like a barrister making a plea to the court. So many of our number lost in the great fire, and before that, to mortals who hated and feared us. So many of our broods unable to sustain themselves after the cataclysm. We're not as numerous as we once were, and we were never many. Can we afford to destroy our own kind? Thrain was eloquent, and his arguments came across as reasoned and sincere, yet Connor's intuition told a warning that grew more frantic with every word Thrain spoke. We have not ruled to destroy Rhys, although many of our number believed he earned such a penalty, Silver replied. If all is forgiven when centuries have passed, then what is a few decades' imprisonment? Merely a chance to reflect upon one's missteps and find resolve to do better, is it not? Connor could not see Silver's expression, but from the elder's tone, he could have sworn Silver was enjoying baiting Thrain. Is it possible that some of the elders know Thrain? Connor asked the Wraith Lord silently. Almost certain, the Wraith Lord replied. Does Thrain know, or guess, that he has allies among the elders? Aren't their identities supposed to be secret? Connor heard the Wraith Lord's silent chuckle. Immortality doesn't change human nature. All of the games, the intrigue. The petty competition that went on at court go on among Talishle. Only they play out over centuries, and at a much higher cost. I did not vote for punishment or death, Aubergine spoke up. There was a tone in the elder's voice that presumed vindication. Nor did I, Sapphire added. Rhys was impertinent, and he has been censured. As for his crimes, this is a new era. New rules apply. I don't think we went far enough by half, Gray replied. This isn't the first time Rhys has overstepped his boundaries. He serves no one but himself, and his dealings will cause grief for all of us. I'd like nothing better than to see him turn to ashes. Kings are not the only ones who can wield power, Jade said with apparent indifference. The knights of Estrain have returned, and while their numbers are small, they are a powerful force to return the kingdom to stability. Lord Blaine Macfadden, Lanyon Penhallow, and I have already made an alliance with General Dolan and his knights, the Wraith Lord argued. Together with Macfadden's allied warlords, more than half of the kingdom is being returned to the rule of law, including Castle Reach. Rhys has tried, and failed, to prevent that from happening. If you desire stability, there is no benefit to freeing Rhys. Their situation is still fluid, Thrain argued. Why not allow Rhys and his allies to fight for their vision of the future of Dondereth and let the decisions about the future fall to the victor? 
You mean winner take all. The Wraith Lord's voice was cold. Much like the decisions that brought the kingdom to its knees in the Merivan War. Thrain wheeled to face the Wraith Lord, and for an instant Connor could see his geniality slip, revealing a canny predator beneath. Yes, if that's the way you wish to put it. Let the strongest survive. Remove the most dangerous predator, and you have a war among the weak. That proves nothing. If the others wish to fashion the kingdom in their own mold, then let them emerge victorious. If the elders had followed your logic, Rhys would have been destroyed, not imprisoned, Silver replied disdainfully. Rhys's forces lost decisively at the Battle of Valshoa to Macfadden and the Knights. By our own law, Taliste law, Rhys compromised himself when he sent his men to attack the Wraith Lord. Connor felt the elder's anger and contempt for Thrain. We have been merciful in our judgment. You are not wise to press for more. I agree with Thrain, Saffron said. Her voice was cold with anger and impatience. The time of the elders has ended. Taliste will find their place in this remade world, and we will not need to have a ruling body to keep our people from offending mortals. This time, we claim a seat at the table, instead of being the lackeys of the king. The last time magic failed, there was a century of bloodshed until the kingdom became stable once more. Brown replied, I have no desire to return to constant warfare. I like being civilized, and civilization requires stability. The sooner Dondrath's forces find balance, the better our existence becomes. If you recall, we existed on the edges of that civilization, snapped Amber. Sometimes tolerated, often hunted, and our lands confiscated, our homes and resting places burned. I'm tired of looking to mortals for permission to exist. I welcome a change. As do I, Aubergine replied. I see no further reason for the Council of Elders to exist. Then dissolve, Thrain challenged. Your purpose was to protect Taliste by making them invisible and harmless to mortals. We have no king left to fear. How can we emerge to own the future unless we seize our opportunity? Connor could feel the Wraith Lord's anger. Thrain's arguments were having an effect. Those among the elders who had been unwilling to put Rhys to death were clearly in support of Thrain's vision for the future. Even those who had voted to punish Rhys seemed to be giving serious consideration to what Thrain said. It was equally clear that others were growing increasingly angry with Thrain. Enough, said Onyx. You petitioned to speak to the elders. You have made your argument, but we are not obliged to reconsider our decision. As for the role of the Council of Elders, that is not your concern. Maybe not, argued Emerald, but he's only said aloud what we have each wondered privately. Without a king to persecute us, there is no central authority to fear. We need not dread the judgment of mortals. They are not strong enough to threaten us. That makes the elders unnecessary. Let circumstances sort themselves out, and if there is need of us, then we can reconvene. I move to disband the council. Can they do that? Connor asked the Wraith Lord silently. Technically, yes, the Wraith Lord replied. Any member of the council can bring up a matter for a vote. I agree. Disband the council. The second vote came from Aubergine. Our role in this new landscape may be different, but we are still a force for order, which is necessary even for Taliste if we are not to become savages. Onyx crossed his arms across his chest. I rather like savages, Saffron replied. They're tasty. I welcome the chance to operate openly, making no secret of who we are, using our abilities to carve out a peace for ourselves. 
I vote to disband. You are voting for your own downfall, Silver argued. Even Taliste need rules. No one is honest enough to remain civilized without some kind of sheriff waiting to punish wrongdoers. Who's to say what we do is wrong? Red challenged. Is the wildcat wrong because it kills a deer? We are the superior beings. We determine what is right and what is wrong. I vote to disband. We are not gods, Grey countered. And whenever we have forgotten that, we have paid dearly. The council keeps the actions of a few from jeopardizing the rest of us. I oppose the spending. The council exists because we will it to exist, and it ceases to exist if we declare it so, Sapphire said. And I declare the council disbanded. With that, Sapphire left the circle. Agreed, Red said, and walked off. Saffron, Amber, and Emerald followed them without a word. Thrain glanced around at the empty places by the standing stones and walked away, chuckling as he went. Aubergine remained behind to savor the broken circle. What becomes of your rule of law now? he taunted. You are no longer needed. With that, he headed into the darkness beyond the standing stones. Jade lingered a moment and then followed. Six of the original thirteen remained in their places. Connor did not need to see their faces to read the shock and confusion in their posture. What now? Silver asked. Her voice was carefully neutral, but Connor could see the uncertainty in her stance. We could do exactly what Aubergine dared. We who remain are the council. No one legitimized the council's formation. We need no one to validate our continuance, Gray replied. It was clear to Connor that several of the remaining elders were angry and ready for a fight. Even if we remain a body, our influence is diminished, Brown said. We became elders because we were the oldest of the Talishte, Bran continued, and because we had the largest broods and controlled the most Talishte. What we banned or what we permitted became the law to our own get. That accounted for the majority of Talishte in the kingdom, and it still does. We can still exert influence, and that may be enough to change the tide, Onyx replied. Onyx was angry, as was the Wraith Lord. Without the full council, it would be a shadow of our former control, Gold replied. Perhaps too little to matter amid such chaos? Maybe not, Silver challenged. A boulder can change the course of a mighty river. Onyx still holds Reese prisoner, which alone could change the outcome. I agree with Brown, the Wraith Lord said. We are not many, but our edicts control the allegiance and actions of hundreds of Talishte. Just a handful of Talishte can affect the course of a battle. We can still present an impact out of proportion to the size of our forces. It could well be enough to determine who becomes the next mortal king of Dondoroth. The remaking of the continent will be like weighing beans on a scale, Onyx said. At some point, one more bean throws the scales out of balance, but no one knows until it happens which bean will make the difference. Our small factions are like those beans, and sooner or later one of us will tip the balance. Then we are agreed, the Wraith Lord said. We may not be the Council of Elders, but we will remain a Council of Equals. And where we can lend our influence to restore a stable kingdom, we will seek alliance to do so. Agreed, replied Onyx, and I shall do everything in my power to keep Rhys imprisoned according to his sentence. Yes, Silver said, but more than that, we've let Penhallow's brood bear the brunt of the fighting thus far. If we expect to restrain Rhys and Thrain, we'd best be willing to bring our own soldiers to the fray. 
We are agreed, replied Brown, after a murmured consultation with Gold. Both against Thrain and with stepping into the fight with our own broods. We have remained on the sidelines too long. I don't know what game Thrain is playing, but I'm happy to be on the other side, Gray said. Agreed to both propositions. The Wraith Lord nodded. Very well. Your broods become a thousand spies. If you have something of significance to report, summon the rest of us. Do you think Thrain will raise Reese's get to come against us? Brown asked. The Wraith Lord and Onyx both nodded. I think it's entirely likely, Onyx replied. Onyx gave the Wraith Lord an appraising look. This Macfadden you've allied with, he brought back the magic and anchored it, but can he lead an army? His forces did just fine at Valshoa and again at the Battle of the North, the Wraith Lord replied. If there's anyone who can unite a shattered kingdom, Blaine Macfadden is our best chance. I never would have figured you for a kingmaker, Kirken, Onyx replied. I don't like the other options, the Wraith Lord replied with a shrug. Penhallo and I have seen this kind of thing happen too often before, done nothing, and we found that we didn't care for the results. So this time I'm not leaving it up to chance. That's a dangerous game. Gold warned. I don't think there are any other kinds left in Dondreth, the Wraith Lord replied. But I am quite certain that our fates hang on the outcome. Later that evening, at Solsidon, Vedran Pollard looked up in annoyance as Kerr stood in the doorway to the study, a look of fear and chagrin on his face. My lord, he said, you have a guest. Who in Raqqa would be out on a night like this? Pollard demanded. He rose to his feet, sword drawn. A dark-haired man with shrewd black eyes strode into the room. He had the powerful build of a brawler and the pallor of a Taliste. Who in Raqqa indeed? The stranger said. I'm Lord Thrain, your new master. Most call me Hemlock, like the poison. Thrain peeled off his still-dripping cloak and handed it without a backward glance to Kerr. The doors closed behind Kerr, leaving Pollard alone with Thrain, who had already taken a seat in the best wing chair and stretched out, looking deceptively vulnerable. Pollard did not rise to the bait. There are a couple of dead men you'll need to bury when the storm is over, Thrain added. The others obligingly got out of my way. We had to least stay at the doors, Pollard snapped. They were supposed to stop unwanted guests. Unwanted? Thrain mused with a dangerous casualness. You don't even know why I'm here. I'm not in need of a new master, Pollard replied. I serve Lord Rees. Thrain gave an eloquent shrug. Ah, oh, well, there's been a problem with that. He's indisposed. But as the stake pierced his heart, I heard him scream through the Kruf Galdor, and I came. Pollard felt a cold dread that had nothing to do with the storm that howled outside. That's impossible, he snapped. An unpleasant, mocking smile touched the corners of Thrain's lips. Oh, I assure you, it happened just that way. He eyed Pollard like a predator sizing up its prey. I'm his maker, and I'm here to clean up his mistakes. Thrain added as the charm in his voice turned to steel. Can you prove it? Thrain gave an icy chuckle. I could, but you would not appreciate it. He met Pollard's gaze. You know what I'm saying to be true. You can feel it 
through the bond. Rhys told me about you, Pollard said, remaining where he stood. He sheathed his sword, knowing that it would be of little use against a Talishti of Thrain's age and strength. If you're who you claim to be. Thrain gave him a leisurely glance that held an undertone of malice. You know who I am. Rhys was my get, and through him you are mine. Much as Pollard wished he could deny it, Thrain was right. The Kruf Galdor conveyed a sense of knowing. The proof was indeed in the blood. Rhys told me he hadn't heard from you, hadn't seen you in nearly a century. Pollard challenged. Why come back now? Thrain chuckled. Because now is the perfect time. The continent is ripe for the taking, even if Rhys couldn't quite handle the task. He shrugged. Never send a soldier to do a general's job. The End This is Tim Gerard Reynolds. We hope you have enjoyed this production of War of Shadows by Gail Z. Martin. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, classics, histories, and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. <laughs>